You are now listening to the Save Cast, the number one old school RuneScape podcast featuring guests from all across Galenor. To support this podcast, visit the Patreon link in the description. Thank you for tuning in to the 73rd episode of the Sebe Cast. I am honored to have had this opportunity to talk with arguably the most famous RuneScape content creator of all time. Bodhi has shown his true colors over a decade of content creation. His combination of being naturally entertaining and genuinely loving the game has put him at the top. He has given back so much to up-and-coming creators and various charities over the years. His generosity and kindness to those around him is admirable, and it was a real treat for me to pick his brain the entire afternoon. If you love these long-form conversations with players and creators in the old school community, consider becoming a patron. For $2 a month, your name will be on future cast intros, and you'll be directly supporting the cast and me. Thank you. Now I present to you, Bodhi. All right, welcome to the Sebe cast number 73 with Bodhi. Bodhi, how are you doing this fine afternoon for you, morning for me? I'm doing I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's honestly my pleasure. This is just absolutely... I'm ecstatic because I've been watching you for years, years and years. I mean, I think since 2015, you were one of the first, pe- one of the first people I ever followed on Twitch. Randalicious actually had you beat. He was... Uh, his title was a little bit more clickbaity. He rank two in his title at the time but ah uh, yeah did you watch much of um jace at all <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i started watching jace around the time i started ro- watching rig it seemed like rig jace and zulu all started like the exact same month oh no so i like that like when it comes to twitch and growth you know it's like when they actually were all starting their streams jace rig and zulu they used to all raid each other and their viewers were kind of moving like a triangle like between them all so they constantly were floating i'll have to make a number up about like i don't know 200 to 500 viewers at the time maybe but the runescape category in 2015 or 2016 might have been a touch bigger than it is now because of all the new games that have come out everyone's like kind of filing out plus some people may have quit Mm-hmm. But no, their their growth was one of my favorite things to watch. A uh, bit repetitive nowadays, like obviously we keep reading the same people, but just seeing how they managed to do it by supporting each other and keeping everyone there, I thought it was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed watching those three grow their channels. Jay still streams today, Rig still streams, Zuli still streams. They're all still here, so yeah. it's good to see. Yeah, I uh, I really loved the old Rig streams when he would just do Abyss Room Crafting and then even sitting at the GE doing Herb Lord, like, Honestly, those are my favorite. He had such a unique vibe that was just so different than anyone else. And he felt, he appeared to be like very liberated. It just seemed like he just lived his life. And it was refreshing to me and my perspective at the time. I was like, wow, this guy just streams RuneScape. And he he seems careless almost about like other responsibilities and stuff in a good way. Not like neglecting, but like it was refreshing to see. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy for all three of them, honestly. That rig, rig you're speaking about, huh? Yeah. Yeah, Rig's a rig. I, I mean, if I was to use the term comfort streamer, I, whenever he's live, it's the music he plays. He plays an artist called like, because like the music I listen to is like some hard, heavy techno a lot of the time, mm-hmm. trance and all that stuff. He plays an artist called Talamansa. I don't know the style, but it's like all it makes me think of is being on holiday it's really like relaxing but it has energy in the track still so it's yeah. not boring to listen to but just rig streams alone like he put me onto this vibe of talamansa if anyone's watching the podcast go check out talamansa it's not my usual music if you watch my stream it is something that i don't really know if you can dislike it it's just it's just fantastic it's really really good music but no rig for that reason Whenever I want to just go and chill there and play in the game, I don't want to type much. Maybe I'm training a skill. I want to keep my experience rates high. Like if I watch skill specs, my XP rates are low because I'm constantly typing <laughs> in the chat, like, joining his channel. You know, I'm in there, I'm typing emotes. You know, whenever he dies, I might have to type something. Whenever he gets a kill, I might have to type something. When it comes to rig, a lot of the time, like all some other streamers, I can just chill and just listen to them for hours and I just play RuneScape, listening to their music, listening to their conversations true comfort just relaxed i really really enjoy it rig rig's probably one of my top five streamers right now oh yeah he kills it every time and he's taking his breaks but every time he comes back it's just like it's like he never left and it's just awesome 
I mean, yeah. So like, he took the break recently because I was actually with a meal with him about two weeks ago. No, probably no, but literally last week I was with a meal with him. Um, but he took a break, and it's kind of like his life. Um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of him. I'll be careful what I say here because, again, if I say something wrong, he's not really here to like kind of like mm. correct me. But his life, he's he's kind of like not really turned it around, but he's turned it to a point where, like in his own words, he's he's completely content, completely happy in his life with what he's managed to achieve over the past like few months i guess since 2022 started and i could just see that like it radiated off him like at the meal as well he just seemed i mean he's always happy when i see him but it just feels a hundred percent genuine he's not hiding something you know people might hide things down you can just see he's completely content happy with what he's got conversations flew and it shows in his streams his like since his return his streams have been doing absolutely fantastic you get something that's like I don't know the term, but like if you take a break and come back, like myself, I've not streamed in like four months at the moment. When I return, I'm expecting obviously quite a lot of people to tune into the initial like return. There's that quotation hype. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Riggs got a bit of that going on, but it does feel like it's solid, like it's going to be consistent for him. And it just shows uh, where he's managed to get himself to. True happiness obviously will correlate with your streams having great vibes. And I think Riggs streams are basically built purely on having good vibes. Never Absolutely. a bad vibe in there. Yeah. And then you see Jace, just to give him a quick little shout out. I mean, he is just, he has been consistent since day one of his stream, basically. He is just always live. And his consistency, well, first of all, he just has insane consistency in the game and probably in real life and scheduling in general. I mean, the man's just bright and just knows what he's doing. It's fantastic. So yeah. I've been watching his journey. I mean, with Jace as well, again, I can't really speak on behalf of him, but as far as I'm aware, the only days off he really takes is maybe the odd day off if something's happening, but I know that he took breaks with COVID, which is obviously illness, but then he's only, like, if he goes on a night out or to, to some drum and bass event, they're the only days he takes off, really. I think he's live yeah. six or seven times a week. I don't know if he has a scheduled day off. Six hours a night, every night, working on his collection log goals, which are thousands of hours of content <laughs> there, you know. It'll never get boring. So his stream, I think... I don't know. I think he does clues forever, but I think his stream is just incredibly well foundationed. And the thing I like about that is I'm going to be doing the same content as him quite soon. So I'm wondering what that'll do to my stream when I get back to it, because he can wake up and he can work on his clue scrolls, which is a grind that would literally take you the rest of your life to complete. So he can, <laughs> literally, he could do them forever and just enjoy them. Yeah. But then when he wants to step to anything else in the collection, like he can just do that. And it just creates all this variety of content. Like when I played hardcore Iron Man, it's a linear progression you know i have to go train slayer for him say 69 for monkey matters 2 to 87 to get a trident so i wake up and all i'm doing is slayer 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 every day now i mean i still tunnel vision my grinds but when i get back to it just there's so much on the collection log to do you can just wake up and do anything you know if i just feel like killing a random boss i can just go and do it yeah it's a good feeling and just like jace it's not only him streaming consistently he is doing like 40 hours of grinding clue scrolls in the background that you don't see every single week the man is just a machine it's nuts and to have accomplished all he has on his account and to go arguably even harder now well i don't know about harder but like he is just consistent and that is the foundation his consistency and like you pop into his stream and you know he's not messing around he's gaming it's just like oh, i remember I, I watched a lot of his streams um and he kept his elite clue grind quiet collecting the golden keys from shades yeah. of mortal so he just revealed this tavern like a hundred and fifty thousand of the <laughs> keys combined and he's like yeah i've just been burning some shades off stream for two months i'm just there like okay i don't know what the equivalent of clue scrolls that is but that's a lot of elite clues yeah. to come i am so hoping that he pulled at least one of like the heavy third age items you know like third age bow or something like that even a pickaxe he pulls a pickaxe i think it's the most expensive item in the game but just seeing one of those you know i don't want to see the cloak i want to see like drudic something unique that you just don't see often at all for anyone to pull would be awesome from all those shades but even go back to what you said like when he said like he's going hard now again i can't really speak on behalf of him but when he initially did his rank two, I'm pretty sure he was like working part time as well to actually manage the work with the rank two. So that probably goes down to really good time management and being able to get it done. Now he's blessed with the ability to be a full time RuneScape streamer, you know, because his community support him in what he does. So now he can literally wake up and be like, all right, don't need to work part time at the moment because he's got his stream. The part time working for him might be preparing the next stream. Yeah. He could be playing like 14 hours a day every single day right now and just loving life because of how much he has to do you know yeah. i've been playing about 14 hours a day recently the collection log there's so much to do and it's just like it's not gonna get done itself but it's just 
there's no burnout with it really that i've witnessed yet might be a grind later that maybe burns me a bit but it's so enjoyable and the variety of what as well going back to what i said you can just log in and do whatever you want in the game yeah it's it's a it's, lot more refreshing lot initially as well because you just have everything up which could be overwhelming to some players but i think for you it's just like you could just do anything um, I have been on Parkour Iron Man, linear progression, the same thing like six times because I keep dying in ways that I'd always justify that I could make another and keep going. I'm happy with that. I never like, there's some people that die in a hardcore and they just remake straight away. I don't know how people do that. I really don't. I had to yeah. justify my recreations for reasons that would make me want to do another one. And my recent death is the last straw. I died to a disconnection after taking all precautions to not die to a DC. So the way I see it is it's going to happen again at some point in the future. And then um, that's basically why now it's got the hardcore Iron Man trap. I've, I've managed to escape it. I was on hardcore for six years, borderline doing the same grinds. And now let's just say there was like a restriction on the game through the hardcore mode. Like the wilderness is basically off limits. If you play hardcore, kind of smart. People obviously go wilderness to make it like more spicy. That limit is like, it just opens. Like the gates are opened and the whole game is there. No restrictions, max gear. And it's like when I started playing again and I was doing like Kriara for the first time in max gear and just melting the boss and killing so many per trip. I'm used to doing bandoffs and getting like seven kill trips on a hardcore and being really happy with it. And then now I just go and do like 50 kills at Zami in one trip and I'm just there like, this is awesome. And I'm really enjoying it. The whole aspect of the one life in the game through the hardcore mode, that was what really interested me because it was a test of my skill, but it's because everything can be so permanent in a way like going forward. As long as you don't lose that life, the game doesn't get boring through PVM. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me addicted to it. But now that I've died on the last one, I'm completely content. I, I don't think I'll ever play a hardcore ever again at this moment. I might make one for a series, but that's only to make the series. I don't know if I'd even... I'd probably play it after, maybe. But the collection log stuff, I'm enjoying this far more right now than remaking another hardcore Iron Man. Yeah, it's crazy. I remember, I mean, Alfie's built different. He just remakes, remakes, remakes. Like, there, it just doesn't even phase him sometimes. But even Roydy, when he died to a smoke devil, I mean, it was like the next t 10 minutes he was on a new, another hardcore. I feel like it's like fake it till you make it kind of because I don't think anybody actually wants to, like, remake a hardcore right as they die. But for the content, it's pretty badass to just restart right there but yeah yeah i i died on two hardcores and i remade immediately but both of them had less than 43 prayer my okay. usual rule is if you have a hardcore iron man if you die before you get the protection prayers then you can justify a restart you might lose 50 hours but you can justify the restart yeah. after the protection prayers things get a bit different because now obviously you have the most powerful mechanic in the game which basically renders 99 percent of the monsters in the game to do no damage so technically if you play correctly you shouldn't really be dying in most places as for Alfie, Alfie, I, I was watching. He was doing the regular gauntlet on one of his accounts. I want to say it was Alf Bait or so, it might have been Alficiency or something. And he died and his account was so good. Like it might have been a top 10. It was probably a top five content creator hardcore at the same time. Because I, I consider there's two different types of hardcore when people are asking who's the best hardcore in the game. Content creator hardcore and then the other people that may not be as known because they're only known for like Twitter. Some of those people have some disgusting hardcores out there. Yeah. And every now one pops up on my timeline. I'm looking at it and he's got like seven armadal chest plates in his bank and all this. I'm just like, Jesus Christ, his account's an absolute beast. But Alfie died to the, the, the regular gauntlet on his account, amazing account, and he remade in five minutes. And I was just like, <laughs> I don't know, I need a break. As for Roydy's death, again, I can't speak on behalf, but that was Roydy's first hardcore that died. Yeah. Um, so to justify a restart on the first hardcore, when, when it's a death that's so dumb as well, a dumb death is one of those that you know you can avoid it in the future in a way. So he knows that he's not going to die to a smoke devil ever again. Yep. And I think his performance outside of that can easily justify him restarting the account. But most of his deaths recently have been so unfortunate. And his current hardcore, wide fella, I mean, he's, like, he's doing his farmer stuff, like his group hardcore. His current hardcore, wide fella, is stacked and i think most people have forgotten that so as soon as i think when the farmers maybe lose their last life or complete their theater of blood grind or whatever they do for their final grind when he rebrings that account back to the limelight onto twitch that account is a beast and i'm really interested to see where he actually manages to take that one compared to the previous ones okay i want to talk a little bit about the story of hardcore iron man and how it got like so 
insanely popular, especially back in 20, like 17, 18 ish. Like that was when it was just popping off. Like I remember Foe. I mean, it feels like Foe and you were, are always the guys just like leading the train, basically, of like the hypeness of like a new game mode. And, uh, but it doesn't feel quite the same nowadays. It feels like just so many years have gone on that the, uh, I mean, the prestige is still there. By the way, I don't know if you've heard of Praise Foot. That man, he's a hardcore, maxed. He's like at a Bill XP, and he's also one task away from Grandmaster. Which is. Oh, which. I've, no, no, I don't. Which is the last task? 10 HP Hydra. Ooh. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I. That one, I I think that's more nerves, but I don't know Hydra too well, but I think when it spawns, it attacks you with a 50-50 chance yeah. for major rain. Yeah. So you could probably do some research, maybe because most people start Hydra, I'm going to guess, southeast corner, which is towards the first vent that you'd actually do it. Hydra's attack's obviously quite short. You might be able to find an area in the room that gives you an extra, like, maybe game tick to react. And you just, I'm guessing, you just camp a prayer. And if you get the prayer wrong, you have an extra tick maybe to teleport yeah. and you just keep repeating until you initiate the fight. The real problem with it is, um, so it's 10 HP and it requires you to use a Darox Axe. Yes. The whole time. So like you're in melee range, of course it can't melee you. But it's the fact that it's so inconsistent that Hydra has these random poison splat attacks during every phase. That if you just take too long, it just shoots poison and you're not prepared for it and it just insta kills you basically i remember doing that task it took i died eight times and i was trying my hardest to not die and i died eight times now if you get enough practice of course like you could probably do it but the nerves oh my god i can't even imagine having every other task completed and you're just missing that that is horrifying yeah. I feel, again, I've not done Hydra in a while, but I feel it's also a place where, apart from the poison splats, you are in control of everything that happens. It's going to yeah. attack three times with mage, three times with range. I think they're the mechanics. As for the poison splat, I don't know, but maybe if you know that it's on a static attack, like maybe every seventh, let's just randomly say, I don't know if it is, that you can run away or something and just dodge it, like loose. Like you don't have to go tick perfect. People yeah. think you got to do it efficiently. Maybe just run back, tank a few hits, and then he does the poison. You've got forever to react to it. Run to a certain square and then path around them all or something and then go and attack it. Easier said than done, obviously, yeah. in the moment. A lot scarier. But I do feel like, apart from the initial hit at Hydra, you are, the confidence to it is you're in control of the account. You know, you know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were to die to poison, maybe you just played it wrong. If you miss an overhead prayer, you know, you just played it wrong. It's only yourself to blame. Because I, I don't know what RNG is in there. Because there's a, the electric balls as well might be scary, you know. So <laughs> yeah. done that task. Um, I, I will be doing my challenge mode. Sorry, my, my combat achievements at some point, maybe this year. So I might be eating my words of what I'm saying right now <laughs> when I try and do it and die like 40 times or something. But... I don't know. It's it's just terrifying. Weird. it's weird because it's melee too. So you're I'm just so used to T-bowing it from long distance, and then you're all of a sudden right up in front of it, and everything feels different. And if you miss a prayer, I mean, you're literally in melee distance for most of it. You will just die. But you, obviously, you got to focus. But yeah, there is. I feel like the pressure and just everything that's on the line is gonna make that task just total hell for him. But he is already like extremely talented i i feel like he'll easily get it but oh the stress yeah if i mean obviously you've got to be crazy good at the game to be at that point so it's just if you go down there it's a respectable place to go down but forever like forever you'll be like if only you know no no hardcore <laughs> in the game has the zook grandmaster helmet as yep. far as i'm aware right yeah, now no one does. that's the closest i've heard of imagine that you actually do die on that one and knowing oh, you were so close yeah. you'd lose sleep over that you, every time you're sleeping you'd be like oh. thinking if only whatever mistake you made you didn't make it or something or maybe your axe if only it hit a bit higher kill yeah. it quicker something like that yeah yeah that's got to be a terrible feeling but if you do it you're chilling at that point you wear the hardcore armor with the zuck helm oh my god you're just balling out of control no honestly i think he is out of all the hardcores, I mean, we're talking Sick Nerd. I think Sick Nerd at one point had the best. I know um, XCN had an amazing one. Who was? Oh, Oispakalja, an incredible account. But I think Praisefoot honestly has the greatest of all time, account-wise. Not skill-wise, per se, although it is up there. 
I might, I might have to do a bit more research on this person. I might have to get his Twitter or something to follow. I love following the high-level hardcores. I stand that XX account is still absolutely disgusting. Like, not to make it a content creator bias. Obviously, mm-hmm. we see XX account in the like the spotlight all the time. His account and what he achieved on one defense is <laughs> utterly yeah. mind-blowing. Like, I do... Like, one of them I find weird is the Thera Blood hard mode. Like, even in hard mode, the Nihilus batter me when I have 99 defense. He's doing it on one defense, which means any mistake, it's just like, that's a lot of damage he takes. That alone, I think, is absolutely ridiculous. But then he also has wilderness pets and all that stuff. I think he's going to be quitting the game soon, so I don't think he'll finish this Grandmaster uh, thing. I guess he has to get 70 defense, though, for a dark set to actually do it. But no, I'd be happy to. I really want to follow this other person you're mentioning because maybe he does have a better hardcore slightly. I think if he did complete the... um combat achievements on a hardcore that does regardless of gear everybody can go get god swords armadil maybe sigils as well on their accounts but how many hardcores forever will actually have a zook helmet on their account so it's very unique and i think if he gets it it definitely propels him right near the top oh 100 percent. and i am like exact is a god i mean he is honestly i think exact is the most mechanically gifted player of all time mechanically I think Wooks is like agree. I think Wooks is the king of like pioneering methods and just being just overall the goat, but exact mechanically, he's just unstoppable. Yeah, the way I word this is I think Wooks is the best the best runescape player of all time. Just yeah. simply put a best PVM of all time if you want to throw that down. I'd happily say best runescape of all time. I don't think he'll be beaten main reason i say that again is there's something called recency bias if you look at what he did over the past like 10 years plus he was just so ahead of time and paved so many methods that now there's so many gifted players out there that can take some of his methods and apply it elsewhere maybe and create these new methods that are crazy crazy good so that's why i think wooks is the best player of all time and i you can negotiate with me and say like exact and i can completely understand it i think it's a very very valid opinion right there but i just think wooks in general is just i don't understand but he is so i think even now he still levels ahead of most people oh right yeah. now as well i agree with you i do think exact is the most mechanically strong player ever to grace the game i think he's like i was watching him do theater of blood last night and i yeah, watched him do nylo room i was watching his webcam watching his eyes his eyes are going everywhere and i'm just thinking like how much information is he taking in to yeah. do this so clean it's beautiful so for that one i'd happily say wook's best runescape player of all time i don't think that'll ever change for me because i just think for what he did in the past he's paved the way for so long that yeah that's just how i see that exact i'd say is the most mechanically gifted player i think he's just absolutely disgusting as of right now though i would happily say that i think port kazard might be the best all-around runescape player currently he won't be able to overtake wooks ever no one can yeah. but he is pretty insane you know i really yeah. wish he like streamed or i know I, I can only follow through twitter but i don't want to know what goes through his brain he knows a lot of things that are pretty damn insane yeah and on top i mean just port kazard i had him on the cast and he is just a brilliant i i mean just brilliant in real life as well as the game and on top of just being extremely mechanically gifted is like he's pretty much on the level of exact exact I'm, I'm sure is a bit higher but we don't really i mean we haven't seen poor Kazard play but he is just insane and on top of that he knows the ins and outs of the tick system and like skilling wise i mean he was developing skilling methods as well and yeah he's insane and what was the th- he did the three combat in uh the three combat fire cape after the uh whole nerf of the mind shield i can't even remember how he did that but yeah oh we used the uh i think it's the beaten book from the elemental workshop 2 quest oh so obviously you've got to utilize the red click mechanic if you read that book it'll automatically drop the scroll if your inventory is full i think so therefore you can constantly maintain red clicks the thing is when you watch the mini clip he put on twitter of it the precision of the red clicks you have to think that yeah he's clicking them quite well for this 90 second clip he had to do that for like five <laughs> hours maybe without a single misclick like one yellow click i think everything just completely messes up so again that takes a bit of perseverance a lot of focus but that's another thing that puts him up there as just one of the best if not the best player we have right now when wooks returns of course you know when raids three or the hype updates but i think port kazard actively plays the game and i do think he is just that good there's also a player as well like you have to always put some respect on i think his name's Hen- henky 66 barbarian assault player quite unknown 
that guy knew everything about the game 10 years ago or something just through barbarian <laughs> assault like everything so <laughs> barbarian assault it's something that i'm looking at right now into doing so i need to do it for my collection log but i think barbarian assault is one of the most advanced mini games to ever hit the game and as of right now as well um it's been do you know much about barbarian assault speedruns I have seen it, and I remember... I don't know if Casey was doing speedruns. Pers- I think just whenever anybody's going for the VA pet, they end up doing speedruns or... Yeah, speedruns and selling leeches as well yeah. for crazy money. But the Barbarian Assault, I think, has been speedrun or speedrun, sorry, for well over 10 years. As of right now, the best... I don't know if this podcast will release after it gets broken, but I think they're about to break another minute barrier in speedruns, taking it to the first ever time that I... I don't know about RuneScape 3. The first ever time that Barbarian Assault, wave one to the completion of the Queen, will be done with single-digit minutes. They're on 10 minutes and, like, one second right now. And as soon as they break that 10 minutes to the nine minutes, I don't think they'll ever get to the eight minutes. I don't know if it's physically even possible to get it to the eight (laughs) minutes. So this is, like, the final minute barrier ever that barbarian assault will ever break i don't know if that'll be demotivating for speedrunners of barbarian assault i don't know the community that well i've just been watching loads of clips of speedruns and stuff to kind of learn my attacker role uh mainly watching a player called sedation i think his name was he's just i i was watching like his speak of how to pass the trial quite kind of basic i'll learn it in my time it's like kill these attack these blah 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 and then i go watch him do an advanced run he's got like seven skill capes in his inventory i'm like what that he uses like i don't know if he uses different ones at different times because it's like a specific amount of ticks for the animation to roll a wave over i have no idea but barbarian assault is one of the most advanced things in the game and when that minute barrier gets broken that's really sick i think on behalf of the barbarian assault community to see that done um, don't know if it'll be demotivating, but I think they're always after the records. And you could probably always improve it by maybe one game tick. But that's what it's going to come down to now. Doing a run, wave one to the queen to save one game tick to get a new world record. Yeah. I think that's pretty pretty intense. I wonder what they have mathematically calculated to be perfect RNG, the absolute fastest barbarian assault time possible. Wave one to whatever like perfect like spawning by the ladder as well to save as much time as possible i wonder what the fastest possible time hypothetically actually is but going back to henke he's a barbarian assault player and he's just someone that knew the ins and outs of the game eight ten years ago or something ridiculous like that he just knew everything yeah that's insane i remembered what i was gonna say is uh, i wanted to talk about your ten thousand dollar challenge to anybody that could get a 40 combat inferno and i also want to give a shout out to afzal who recently got a 39 combat inferno 39 absolutely i remember <laughs> when x got the 40 uh, i'll answer the question in a moment okay. but when when x got the 40 he mentioned immediately 39 was possible I can't remember what he said, but I think he said you had to go in with like 20 rings of recoil or something to recoil some monsters down to get that level and then just hypothetically prayer flick everything throughout. I don't know if that was the method for 39. I don't know if 38 is possible doing something like that, but... (laughs) It's got to be possible, I think, if just RNG, your hits are good, I think. Well, actually, that doesn't matter because it's based off XP, so your hits don't matter at all. Well, there'd be, I, th- I think there'd be monster regen as well that could oh, maybe, true. but you, if you max hit, like hypothetically, if you max hit the whole thing, you might save a level, but I don't think that's like a realistic one. Is 38 possible? I mean, if you walked in with 20 rings of recoil, can can it be done? Will we ever see it? Because this 39, I don't know if it was like a 39.875 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the 40 might have been on the like, midpoint, it's like 40.5 or something. Um but no, I remember when, when that 40 combat Kate was achieved from x I think I was watching it live. Yeah, I was. I was there at the party. Oh, no, yeah, because he logged in afterwards because it wasn't actually done live. It yeah. was a recording. Um, I, I Honestly, I, I consider that 40 combat cape the greatest RuneScape achievement of all time. I don't think there's anything that can even be close to how insane that cape actually is. As for the 39 combat, that is now, in my opinion, the greatest RuneScape achievement of all time. And I think it went under the radar as well. Exact being obviously quite a prolifically known player. He's one of the best, like going back to what we were saying before. People know him. People know he's one of the best, if not the best. The other player that got it, I think he said Afsal, I think his yeah. name is. He's not that known. So I feel people don't even know this 39 combat cape even yeah. exists. But it's just, it, I even I like the Inferno is one of my weaker parts of the game. I know some bosses quite well, but the Inferno is one. I've never, I, I've not done it in max gear in a while. My gear's always rags throughout, which I think makes it much tougher. 
But the idea of doing a 39 combat one, knowing that if you just miss one flick from a ranger, you're dead. And you have to go remake yeah. the whole account, go get a low level fire cape. Do, I don't yeah. think you have to do desert treasure anymore. But I, I look at it and I, I compare it to like Dark Souls runs where you don't take a single hit through Dark Souls. It's the same with RuneScape, you can't take a single hit. But with Dark Souls, you have zero millisecond inputs for a controller or whatnot. Whereas RuneScape, you've got ping against you always, like maybe 20, 30. One, one lag spike, one tick rolls over or something, one prior miss, you have to let you go and recreate a new account. And I don't know how long that takes, let's call it 50 hours to get it to the Inferno. And then you gotta do it again and repeat over and over again. So as far as I'm aware, that 39 combat cape, I don't know if 38 is possible. If it is possible, I think we will probably see it maybe happen eventually. It might be Afsalu does it himself if it is possible. But the 39 cape, it, 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 I, it's mind bending. Like I've played RuneScape for almost 20 years and I will never be able to do something like that. <laughs> But it still hurts my head to actually think about truly what goes into that 39 cape, you know? It's not just killing Zuck. You have to go through every individual wave with like 27 hit points. And like, you know, the nibblers, you can't barrage them. You can't burst them. You can't blood barrage. It's, I don't get it. Like, I could do that for like 10 years and I still don't think I'd manage to get it <laughs> yeah, a single time. Literally. No, it's insanely impressive. It's like stupid impressive. It almost seems like a robot did it. Like, there's no way a human could pull that off without being uh, succumbed by, like, all the stress and everything. Because during Zook, I mean, you have gotten to Zook now. And the only thing going through my head at that time, if, if, I, if that were to be me, which it never would be, is just, I'm going to fuck up. I'm going to fuck up. But, like, I'd just be thinking that the entire time. And the whole off-ticking, the majors and stuff, stepping under, I'm maneuvering them in a way. Like, what? How? How? Like, the fact that the safe spots are known and to know what tiles you can be on at Zook is already an impressive feat <laughs> alone. Because just getting to that point and testing it through trial and error, I believe that's how it is. Unless uh, GE Challenge or somebody just already had the line of sight of Zook and could just tell, basically. But, by the way, GE Challenge, you got to give him a shout-out as well. One of the most brilliant as well, especially when it comes to God Wars. Hey, player absolutely fantastic play yeah, again he's paving all these both methods i personally hate both of god wars i've never done it it's just there's something weird about ranging grador to me you know i mean i know you can drag and dart it for the pet these days but grador for me has been merely since its release in 07 08 whenever the hell it came out i think it was 07 um and now you kill it with both and the both hits it like it doesn't have any defense grador's <laughs> one of the tankiest monsters in the game and his boss just this bow just destroys it yep you know, so the methods are crazy good, but even when I get round to my Grodd or Pet Hunt on Bowie, although when I do my Pet Hunt on Bowie, I want to try and go for the Bandos record or even tie it. It's owned by um, Reed at the moment. 300 kills, I want to say it is. I want to go in and see if I can do that myself with like Torva and Scythe and all that, but I much prefer Melee Grodd or I think I might learn the Bofa methods though, just, to, just so I know how to do them. They might come in handy at some point, but... Ah, Zami God Wars, Bandos God Wars, it's melee. I can't I it, can't get myself out of that. You know, I can't adapt to the times, you know, adapt or die. I'm choosing die on this one, mate. I'm sticking I'm, to my melee methods or something. I am totally good. with you, by the way. Like, like the, the melee you know, methods are either. really bad. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I hope it doesn't get nerfed because I think if they ever nerf it and just make Grado's range defense really high, people are going to look at me and be like, Bodhi, did you ask for this? I'm like, I wanted it. Yeah, I really want that, but should it be in the game? I think it's fine you know to be honest it's a method it's pretty advanced method as well like at the end of the day the movement you're like you're using movement to your advantage yeah. i think it's the greatest mechanic in the game is using your player's movement to kill monsters i think the solo one fight is one of the best discovered things ever in the game i think it completely changed the game when that was all found but i think the on fight is one of the best going back to what you said about moving healers uh, sorry the mages on the zuck wave though i think it was a player called unpredictable who i want to give a shout out to as well because he's another incredibly talented player uh, when it comes to the game. Um, I think he also... Was he the one who worked out the six jads? I think I think Probably. he found a method that allowed Wooks to work out the way to kill six jads without overheads. I think Wooks was still the first to do it. Disgusting achievement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then Unpredictable did it. I know Molgoat Kirby did it. I think Molgoat, one of the best players as streamer. X at level, just a touch below as well. Yeah. Incredibly gifted player out there. There's just so many good players nowadays, you know. Like so maybe five, six years ago when I did my one man army series, people were like, oh, Boaty, he's such a good player. Nowadays, like <laughs> I am, oh man, I'm like the ant underneath the shoe of these good players now, you know. It's ridiculous. I have been in hardcore for six years though, so I would like to try and improve as a player, but 
some of these limits people go to is just i don't know if i can get them i love runescape as a game but to get it to that level i'd I'd love to be good at the game that i play but some people are just they're just too good at this game nowadays like people need to get worse you know take us back to the days where everyone was garbage you know reed messaged me speaking of reed uh he messaged me in because at the time, him, Cloud Badass, uh, I mean, you were one of the names he also mentioned. Like, you guys were the goats of PVM, you know? Um, I remember watching Reed streams back in, like, 2016, I believe it was, probably, or 2017. But, uh, yeah, he was just a total gamer. You look at Reed and you're like, okay, that guy is just really talented. And then he messaged me probably a few months ago. Uh, and he was just like, I can't, I, I, I can't even compete. I'm like, in the, I can't even do CG. Like all these new PVM content has come out and I can't do any of it. It just feels completely foreign and everyone is a total beast now. And he was just like, damn, I don't think I can compete anymore. Like I'm getting too old for this <laughs> kind of, and there's yeah, just so many it, talented players now. It's like back then as well. Um, it was around when like God Wars is the most advanced PVM. Uh, there was this like unofficial Saradon and God Wars record that people wanted to go for a lot of the time. And there was a point where I actually had it and it was like 53 kills I got in the trip using the Wooks method with the prep. But I slightly adapted it to my own method and I got 53 kills in one trip that was unheard of back then. Nowadays you could AFK 53 kills with a twisted bow probably. Um, but then I had this 53 kill trip then someone beat it. I think it was Corporal Eric beat it, another great player. I don't know if he plays, I think he plays Iron Man these days, yeah. but he's another one. I think he was the third to the Inferno Cape uh, just behind uh, Kelvino, another great player ahead of Letu Lane and another great player. Oh, All these good players. But the, um, it was like the Sour record. It was unofficial, but I actually held it at one point. And it's nice to know that it's obviously very outdated, but at one point I held two solo God Wars records. Both of which, I, th- I think God Wars records nowadays, no one cares for them, particularly with the new methods, really. They have the Grador record, 300 kills. I think that one's actually, people might still be interested. But nowadays, it's more about speed running, like the, the, the Chambers of Zeric or the Theater of Blood and all that. So they're kind of dead. But I was quite proud of that because I actually had like a 96 kill Saradoming trip with a rune crossbow back in the day or something using like control click to run around the room and such. So... Damn. that was fun but yeah i had the bandos record at 46 kills and the sarah record at like 96 i think it was at the same time that was my that's about that's about my claim to fame you know yep. with my pvm abilities i fifth and third i'll take that as well actually um but that, that, that's my client uh, claim to fame nowadays obviously the guard records at 300 i would like to attempt to beat it i might tie it i don't know i think reed asked me to beat it but I think if I, I think Reed, I'm, I'm very good at Grado. I'm very happily say that. I know how to kill Grado with zero prayer points, prayer flicking everything, in defensive prayers, all that stuff. I've done it on hardcore mostly. So to do it on a max main with max gear, probably no problem. I do think Reed is a bit better than me at Grado though. So I'm more worried that if I beat it and get like 320 kills, he just comes back and gets like 4,000 kills in one trip. And I'm just like rank, rank two for the rest of my life. Yeah. Or I could tie it and see if he wants to go and beat his own record or something like that. Uh, but that's something I want to do at some point, going back to the Bofa method. Um, going way back, sorry, tangent, the 10,000, do you want me to go into the $10,000 challenge that I did a while ago? Or was there an open topic we still haven't finished? No, that was it, that was it. Okay, so the $10,000 challenge, where was I at this point? Um, oh, sorry, that was it, yeah. So I hit 10,000 subscribers on Twitch. It was the second time I hit 10,000 subscribers. And the first time I hit 10K subs, I was just so happy with it that I actually just donated all the money away to streamers and charities and something, you know. It was just hitting that 10K. That's Twitch completion. You get, I think it's a bit less now, but you get 60 slots unlocked. You've got, you've unlocked every achievement you can get on Twitch at that point. And knowing that I did that, like as a human, as a RuneScape player, there's not many people that have done that. 10k subs nowadays is a bit easier because you get can get gifted there i think i had like 2000 gifted when i got it so i had like 8000 primes and normal subs so very proud of that but the second time i hit it um and i had this prepared because i did the speech on the spot i think i was playing dead my mode at the time killing lesser greater demons i think in that lair in uh zaya i don't know the name catacombs or something Uh, no the chasm of fire or chasm whatever the word is but i had it prepared and i basically I thought that at the time, XX 46 Combat Infernal Cape was disgusting. And I know that it was lower, was of possible, people had mentioned it. And I wanted to see it. So I put a challenge out to the RuneScape community that was, um, if anybody can beat XX 46 Combat Infernal Cape, I would send them $10,000. Purely just because I wanted to see someone do it, because it was some of the best content at the time when XX went for his 46 Combat. This $10,000 obviously came from my Twitch paycheck at 10K sub, so it was more than covered through basically the community gave me the money by subscribing to the channel, give some back. 
However, I also offered Exact the ability to beat his own record. And I offered the Exact, I think it was $5,000 to beat it and an extra $1,000 per combat level that he shed off the 46. So with 40 combat achieved, it was $11,000. Uh, I'll come to what he did with the money in a minute because it definitely deserves some attention. He actually was already working on a 40 combat cape before I announced this. He mentioned that to me after he achieved it. Um, but he, he beat his own record uh, from 46. He beat it with the 40 combat cape that, again, I considered the best achievement. There's now a 39 done. Unfortunately, to the 39 guy, there's no $10,000 this time. I'm, I'm not streaming. I don't have 10K subs anymore. You know, I can't, I can't be doing that right now. Um, but um, when he did it, Obviously, I announced that he'd won the challenge. I give a shout as well to Mulgoat Kirby. He was attempting as well, and he was streaming his attempts, and he was doing really well with it. I think, obviously, he just got demotivated when the prize pool had gone. Not really much point, apart from personal achievement to yeah. beat that record yeah. with how much effort goes in as well. Again, like I say, you fail it. You have to make a brand new account and do the whole thing again. Um, when Exact won, he won $11,000, and he announced, and we did this together, where he he's not, he's not a full-time RuneScape content creator. Uh, I don't know how old he is. I don't know what he does. I don't know how much he earns. I'll never know. I'll never ask him. But when he won the $11,000, he decided to donate $10,000 of it in 10 individual donations of $1,000 back to RuneScape content creators who were pursuing full-time, you know? People that, in a way, in his own words, would benefit from the money more than he would in his life. And I think that's just so crazy generous and all that for him to actually do that. And the concept as well, I, I honestly love doing that with him. It's something I like to do. I like to bring some creators up. I like to help them out, give them a boost, give them the motivation, maybe through stuff. When X had to announce that, man, I had the biggest smile on my face and I was so looking forward to it. I can't remember truly most of the names that received the donations, but XX 40 Combat Cape that he was doing anyway earned him $11,000 and he donated $10,000 of that 11000 he earned away to content creators who he thought could benefit more from it. Incredibly generous and it just deserves to be known on this podcast that he actually did that. Oh yeah, he is... I, I don't understand how insanely kind and generous and just insanely talented and handsome. I, was, I saw a clip of him doing this little poll thing role play thing i think it was for his neve cosplay or something <laughs> but i was like the dude is jacked now he's talented he's generous he's kind he's funny he's just everything like damn I'm like we have an amazing community i mean we got the most amazing people ever in this community it's, yeah uh, i think insane. he announced with the, with the charity stream he's just doing i don't know if you watched any of his solo tier but he was doing yesterday technically to this recording the last one he, was painful I, at the end oh i oh it was, it was when he oh it was oh my god i have never i, I like i know that exact knows what he's doing you know when he's yeah. running around zuck on 20 hit points i know he knows what he's doing so it's fine but for him to go for the blood fury heals <sighs> i just wish in some parallel universe that the blood fury popped yeah and he managed to get the cape sorry not the cape he managed to get the solo in that one it would have gone down as just the most ridiculous <laughs> i remember when bone saw got the first fire kit and he had one prayer point and basically prayer flick jad when prayer flicking was barely known as a thing and it was crazy in the chat back then this would have just eclipsed that as an achievement really it still had seven percent so it's quite a bit yeah. but i don't know a couple of max hit scythes blood fury pops on i think the big number of the scythe heals him up yeah. and then he manages to get that oh it would have been it didn't happen, unfortunately, Never but lucky. I'm confident he will get the solo. And I think as well, it'll be the second hardcore I'm to solo, the Theater of Blood. Um, a cold one um, got the first one. But I also think it's one of the first solo TLBs ever with low defense. I don't know if anyone's done it without having like 90 plus defense. Mine was done with 99 defense. I think most were done with 99 defense. He's doing it with 42, I think, actually, right now. So that alone, plus the hardcore it's mad that he got that close and yeah. i have no doubt that he will manage to get it unless he just gets trolled so much that he runs out of purple sweets i don't think he'll put the time in to get more sweets <laughs> unless you yeah. find a fast way because i think he is quitting the game i think real life um has come hey, he's gonna be busy he won't have the time i think he'll get it i can't wait for him to get it he might have got it by the time this podcast is live for all we know but i think if he is truly quitting the game you never truly quit runescape Maybe we'll see him back in the future. I think with Exat, we're losing one of the greatest players ever to play RuneScape, one of the greatest community members, and all in all, just a fantastic person and a great human being. We're losing him from the community. 
It's going to suck. It's going to suck, but I'm really happy that, again, he's put a stamp. He'll be remembered forever, and he deserves it more than anyone. Yeah. Now he's a absolute legend. I'm honored. Uh, him and Addie Connor are actually going to be coming on the cast in June, just talking, and, yeah, I'm stoked. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm honored. <laughs> I have Atticon's third age pickaxe in my bank. I'm never selling it. <laughs> it's mine forever, and it's just blessed because I think Atticon as well is probably again when it comes to content creators and mechanicals he is definitely one of the best out there he's like his click i watched him oh, do the inferno so and i remember he's so good at the he's, i mean he held the world record for a bit but i watched him do it and it might be a really minor or rookie thing that the inferno speedrunners know how to do but i remember when he spawned a wave and when he went to attack a monster he manually pathed himself two squares north to make sure that this monster that he just knew was slightly south of i think he had a major to the southwest assuming the northeast rocks where he is he had a major to the southwest and a ranger to the south and he just knew that the ranger if you take the tiles of them both is like two squares behind the major so he manually puffed himself north where the ranger can't attack him and the major can and then ran down and off ticked them and i was watching it's mechanics like that people you don't really notice it but that is what in my opinion shows you as a good player yeah it's like to take it to pvp people think pvp or good pvp is particularly back in the day you spec a 48 48 with a dart bow you're the best pk in the game <laughs> you dds double 40 you're the best pk in the game people don't realize that if you watch a true tribrid fight between two insanely good brits there isn't going to be any big hits, really. It's an unlikely chance to get KO'd. The killing blow will be like a 17 from a ball when yeah. they're out of food. <laughs> that, you can't appreciate it, you know, because it's so, it's not that big hit that makes you go, whoa, you know, you hit, you hit that big XP, you go, whoa, nice kill. But the true, like, depth of a PvP, -er, the fight would technically be so boring because <laughs> of how advanced and far ahead they would actually be and the hits would be so low most of the time. Yeah. So, yeah, going, like, to that, that's just how I see one thing anyway. Now, uh, it's funny because that actually reminded me of chess. I know you kind of have your little chess phases. I've been kind of getting into chess too ever since like the whole Queen's Gambit hype. I never even watched that, but I just joined in on the chess hype anyway. But uh, it feels like that where two grandmasters are up against each other. Nothing actually crazy goes on because they are just so incredibly offensive and defensive that like nothing ever. <laughs> it's always basically a tie game until the very end. Um, Ooh, I, I'm going to, I mean, have you seen the Queen's Gambit? I haven't. That's the sad part. It's so strange. I haven't seen that, but yeah. Definitely worth the watch. I think it's great. Um, if you're not already subscribed to Agad Mator on YouTube, oh, I don't know if you are. Yeah, I am. He's a legend. I disagree with what you said about a Grandmaster game not doing anything because some of the games, obviously, some like so when it comes to like a world champion, if you look back at like Fabi versus Carlson back when they did their world championship, the second one that just happened or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, before Nepo was the challenger. That, that was like 11 draws in a row or something. So in that aspect, yes, they find the draw and move on to the, the bullet and the blitz or whatever it is. Otherwise, you can go watch, you can go back and watch some of the best, like Mikhail Tal and all that, who has just crazy games. But sometimes they upload some game where a piece is just moved in a way and it's carnage. And I think the reason why, going back to what you said, is when something on the board is created that's so insane, the grandmasters can spot it before it happens. Because some of the moves that are played that are counted perfectly are so artistic. <laughs> but I mean, some of the games I like, um, I won't go into like Morphe's opera game, but some of uh, Mikhail Tal, obviously, I think he's known. Dubov as well right now. Dubov is like a um, modern day, just chaos on the board. It really, really enjoyable to watch. So I think chess is like, I think the only thing that would kill the chess is the fact that if you're watching a bullet or blitz game, it's over so fast you can't see it. Yeah. But if you're watching a classical game and see some carnage on the board, it's so long till the next move that it's not there, you know. Tribe to fight in RuneScape, boom, 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 boom. It's rapidly earned. PVM in RuneScape, boom, it's fast. Chess is just a game where I don't really play it anymore. Um, for my like i mean i play it here and there but i put so much effort in and got nowhere it's a tough game it's so and it's hard. pure skill pure skill minus of who goes white or black at the start i guess but the fact that it's pure skill it, you know, it's depressing when you get dominated <laughs> eight times in a row by people of your own skill level you know i'm thinking they're like i'm doing my research i'm studying you know i know what a um prophylactic is and yeah i'm still getting stumped by people i'm like come on bro i should be beating more people here so no chess great great game yeah um going back to Adicon, watching him do inferno speed runs you look at him going and you're like okay he knows what he's doing 
and you just you, he makes it look so easy. He's using the scythe strat. He's using thralls now. He's like switching spellbooks ha like probably by wave 50 I think is when he switches to ancients. He is doing he brings in a trident and unloads the runes from it or something something strange just to save an extra inventory spot. And when you watch him and then you watch anybody else trying to do the same thing, it's like, "Oh, okay, this is actually extremely difficult because when you're watching somebody that's decently good but not amazing, they are just losing ticks left and right. I mean, they're trying to do their side swings. Adicon is flawless and is it is nuts because he will do like a blowpipe and then within one tick he will, you know, switch weapons and perfectly click a monster across the side of his screen. I mean, just the accuracy of clicks is insane because you would just inevitably miss ticks just by accidentally yellow clicking on the ground right next to the monster you're trying to click. He is flawless. It's insane. Yeah, he's, he's the former world record holder. Um, again, I actually managed. I think I don't know what the record is now, but it's something like forty-five minutes and eight seconds or something. I think the forty-five minute barrier might be broken. Again, I'm curious to what it could be, but I still think um, fair news might need to see another minute or so shed off because it is quite a popular speedrun community. Because again, I think I spoke to Adicon about it. Um, I, I'll be careful what I say here again, because you can't correct me if I'm wrong. But I think you have to solve a wave literally in one game tick or I think maximum four game ticks, you know, by the time the second, the monsters rolled its second attack on you, the wave needs to be solved and you need to know what to do. And by that, it's not just having your defensive press to take new damage. You've also got to be attacking things and killing them. Otherwise your speed run time is not going anywhere. And so like when you're not attacking in the Inferno, your speed run time kind of like just stops, you know, you're not doing any damage towards getting to the end in a way. So the wave spawns, you have to attack the nibblers, solve the wave and then kill things. And, I, I do I think a lot of people have been waiting for to say this, but I do plan to learn Inferno speedruns. It will not be anytime soon, I'm sorry to say. I need to complete the Tazar log first, and that's just killing them in the to, to moral wreck, really, which is boring. <laughs> then I've got to go get the Jad pet from Jad, and then I can start learning Inferno speeds to get the Nibbler pet. Um I think I'll be I think I could get okay. I've got the clicks. Um I've got the clicks, I can definitely work on the muscle memory. It'll be tough, but I'm excited because, again, I'll go in, I'll get absolutely battered as I initially start it, but it's all learning curves. Yep. I'm good at prayer flicking. I think I can solve waves fairly fast at times. As for adding in the offensive part as well, it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. It's also going to be very stressful and very annoying, but, yes, I will be doing Inferno speedruns at some point. I wouldn't get too hyped because I'm going to be like... I, I mean, if you call me budget icon, I'll take that as a compliment because it's going to be <laughs> yeah. pretty scuffed runs, a lot of misclicks, and I swear, oh, you know... Do you know those yellow clicks you get if you click? I think it's... If you move your cursor somewhere on the screen and you click in less than 20 milliseconds, your click will null and it'll yellow click. That is the most annoying thing in the game, and I think everyone knows if you're Inferno speedrunner, you must get like one of those every run or something. It's so frustrating, and whenever I get those, I'm gonna be very, very angry. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting though. I mean, it is insanely difficult to get good at Inferno speeds, but you see people do it, and you know it's possible, because I remember when Bandos flicking for me seemed impossible. I'd watch Hauke and Latius, doing flicking i'm like what is going i can't even wrap my brain around this and then you just learn it and you're like oh that wasn't actually that tough and now i mastered it so yeah grado when i learned it because again wook streamed it and i basically just studied the wook's past broadcast it took me one day i think it was about 10 hours to go in and learn to prep like everything including the step away and the tick eating it took me 10 hours to get all of that down at grado yeah. And it's one of the reasons I love Grado. It's just this boss that, moving away from the Bofa method, of course, it's just this boss that's been in the game forever. And yet the fact that you can take into your control the ability to negate all damage in the room except for the RNG damage you can't avoid. I love, I just love things like that. Anything in RuneScape where you can remove the max amount of RNG by using your own skill and prayer flicking and all that, I love everything about that. Okay, I want to move on to a topic that I'm looking at right now by Tasty Life. He asks, yeah. as the grandfather of the RuneScape community, you've seen many streamers come and go. What, in your opinion, is the greatest marker of future success in a creator? So I read this question. I read all the questions, but I forgot them. Ooh, this one on the spot again. I put no thought into any question because I wanted to wing it on the spot and see what my brain would just pop up with. Um, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah. He says, what, in your opinion, is the greatest marker of future success in a creator? The future. Mm, I think there's probably many things um, with a stream. 
But I think you need, I'd say you need kind of like, I want to say a laid back personality might be one of the most important things, you know. Obviously, you need to be entertaining at the same time. You know, like, I think obviously being entertaining, it's just like, I don't want to say the answer is be entertaining, you know, simple as that. That is probably the answer. But obviously, what is entertaining? People find entertainment from different things. It's a pretty difficult one to actually um, answer because I don't think there's actually a specific answer. There's loads of different things because the viewer base you're going to have different viewers, you know? There's people like, if you wanted to put me as like one of the biggest streamers on the platform, I guarantee you there's people out, well, there is. I don't have to say guarantee. There's a lot of people that don't watch me for any reason because they simply do not enjoy what I put out. And I consider those people intelligent, you know? If, if you don't like someone's stream for reasons why you don't enjoy them, either as a person or for their content and you don't watch them, that's brilliant. That's exactly what you should do. You should go watch someone that you do enjoy. But to answer that question is what, in my opinion, is the greatest marker of future success in a creator? I think you have to be entertaining, uh, decent at the game, maybe a good sense of humor, somewhere where if you go to the stream, a viewer enjoys coming back in a way. So being unique is, again, difficult. Like, the game, in a way, is kind of so sad. When this comes to Twitch, I think when we talk YouTube, YouTube, be unique or you want. We've got this new series by Settled, this tile man. Who the hell plays RuneScape and unlocks one tile at a time? But if you go look at it, you can see that that, is, that, that, that series is doing incredibly well. Yeah. And that's an example of being unique is a great marker of being future success. You know, obviously, Settle was incredibly successful. So on the YouTube side of thing, if you want to be a YouTuber and not a Twitch streamer, I'd say being unique. As for a Twitch streamer, it's just so much more difficult. I think just you got to be fluent with what you say. Think quick on your feet, I guess, about what people might be saying in the chat. Be active with the chat be entertaining uh music taste is obviously subjective so you can't really say play good music because my music that i think is good techno realistically probably loses me 90 percent of the runescape community because they don't want to <laughs> listen to it you know if I was playing alternate rock or something or like just constantly playing like trance or something maybe i get more in but i listen to the music i like techno just gets me hyped up so i've got my adrenaline running i've got my enthusiasm enthusiasm probably another one i can throw in there but i don't think that question has an answer I'd love, to, I'd love to know what people would actually answer that. Like from a, from a perspective uh, of what they like, that might be a better one. As a streamer, what makes future success? I'm really trying to think. Um, there's obviously, I want to say networking, um, not leeching. Networking is different to leeching. Leeching, I don't like the term, but I'd say leeching is say you're a, say, say you're a new content creator and you're like 50 viewers or something, and you keep raiding a massive streamer. Let's say myself, Foe, Roydy, Oda Block, and it's Will, any of those big streamers. You keep raiding us in the hopes that we might raid you back or something and all that. I don't think that's a great way to grow. If anything, you should probably try and make friends more with people around your size in Twitch. Going back to what we said at the very beginning of the podcast, the Rig, Zulu, and Jace, when they grew, they all had the same viewer base, they all had the same viewers, and they constantly, they just made friends of each other. And now everything's like kind of there. And them right now, the future success of all three of them is brilliant. They're still here. I don't know when they started, but let's say five years ago. Five years ago, they started streaming. They grew by growing with streamers of their own size. They brought them themselves all up, and they're now still here for today. But if I had to just answer the question and go back to it, what's my opinion of the greatest marker of future success in a creator? I'm going to just have to go with, I think it's just pure enthusiasm and passion for playing RuneScape. Kind of showing that this game that we play is so basic. You move a mouse and you click, but you see past that. You see the enjoyment that you get out of the game. You can articulate that through your voice when you stream. Show that you're passionate. And you've not just turned your stream on to try and get some donations or a paycheck or any of that stuff. You've turned the stream on, you've played RuneScape for 10 years, and you want to share your experience with a chat. So I'd say it just has to be something to do with a pure enthusiasm or passion for the game we play, rather than just turning the stream on, I don't know, to try and create a stream to make to go full time or something. You've got to enjoy the game. I think most people enjoy the game. But taking the enjoyment of the game you've got and being able to reflect that through a stream via voice camera anything reactions i think that's probably the best thing i can think of on the top of my head because there's so many different things but i think if you're not really passionate about the game and you don't have enthusiasm i really can't see you getting there i think most of the top streamers all so passionate about the game we all love the game 
we're all passionate about it. I think I said that twice actually. Um, but just being able to reflect that to the audience, I think is a reason why most of the top streamers are probably in that position they are right now. So you're like very, very enthusiastic about the game and your voice and everything. I want to just ask because like I just watched, I've been watching your new collection log series. I just watched your latest episode last night, but you're always just enthusiastic. Is that something you're like trying to do? Is that like, has that come over time? Because on actually, I think I've already answered my own question because I remember watching a video of yours like a decade ago and you had, <laughs> you were just as enthusiastic. Do you have to try to do that though? Or is it just completely natural at this point because you actually are enthusiastic and your your voice is just like- Completely it natural. Um, I consider myself, like I'm 27 years old, but I consider myself a child at heart. Like I'm a child at heart forever. Um, I can get- interested enthusiastic over the tiniest things there's obviously a tiny bit of acting i guess but i don't feel it's forced ever everything i do is just natural flows off the tongue there's obviously some acting because i'm creating a video mm -hmm. um i mean i've got some clips where i was live recording an lms game and my enthusiasm is 10 times higher than when i wasn't recording because the recordings otherwise is i'd have the recorder and i'd kill the guy focused and i'd speak and it's borderline monotone voice because i've just beat this guy but when i'm live commentating it's there because i know i have to be entertaining but no, I mean, I've played RuneScape for almost 20 years now. I've played it since I was eight years old. And if, if you were to go back in time and just say to me, hey, would you want to play this game for a living in 15 years? I would I would sign that contract without <laughs> even getting a lawyer to read it, mate. Like, instantly in. And then I, look, I like to look back at things in hindsight. And I'm like, if I was asked that 15 years ago, would I accept it? I definitely would without any regrets no hesitation and obviously now it's a reality you know that obviously that's a hypothetical situation but it's a reality right now that technically old school runescape or this is, let's just say runescape is the game that i get to play all day every day and it's the game i've played forever i've got probably close to fifty thousand hours in this game i remember when the modern warfare 2 phase happened one of my friends in school and my closest friends he had like 31 days played and everyone used to take the piss out of him because he had like he was a nerd quotation no life he smashed everything he was one of the top of the whole year and i remember sat there i was a closet runescape player at this point and he had like 31 days play time i think i had like 500 on runescape at this point i was like yep okay never gonna tell anyone this just in case now i think i've probably got around all my accounts combined since i began playing i think i'm on around fifty thousand hours um Give or take something. I think, wait, am I doing the math wrong? I think I'm doing the math wrong, actually. Because 50,000, no, I think I'm doing, am I doing it wrong? I don't, know, probably, I'm up with I, I don't know. If you've been playing consistently for like 20 years or so, I mean, you, it's got to be up by like 50,000, but maybe it's a little lower. Like, I'm at around 20,000 of old school hours since 2015. I think it's a little lower. I think I'm getting completely okay. confused with Drum Gun right now because he had, he had a video ages ago where he hit 2,000 days on the game, yeah. 48,000 hours. I think I'm probably around 40,000 rather than 50,000. Okay. 10,000 hours is a lot. Because if I took all my old school RuneScape gameplay, I don't think I have 1,000 days played. And I don't think I had 25,000 hours before old school came out. So I think I'm probably between the 30 and 40,000 mark now I think about it. But no, going back to it, all the enthusiasm. I love this game. Like, simple as that. Um, I've not really anything bad to say. There's a few things that I don't like about it, I guess. But I have nothing bad to say about RuneScape. I'm never gonna badmouth it. This I I don't need to get a tattoo of RuneScape for charity or anything because this game I'll never forget it. I'll never badmouth it. It's borderline. It's the most time I've ever invested anything in my life. You know, 27 yeah. years old, and if you think about it, if you if you to cut out my life, I probably have sleep as the thing I've done the most in my life, and second would be RuneScape. <laughs> so it, 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 there's so much there, and yeah. the enthusiasm I've got for it. It is my favorite game. Simple as that. It's my favorite game of all time. And the fact that I can actually play it as I do, I play, I, like you can look at it and I play the game the way I want to as well. There was a dead man mode forever ago where I wasn't taking donations. I was killing bats in Tavoli Dungeon with an Addy Dagger and I was enjoying myself because one thing I do that I really makes me enjoy the game more, I think, is I don't follow all the efficiency codes. You know, I'm not efficient because I have to be. When I train a skill, I like to learn the efficient methods and I always will learn efficient methods, but I just play the game my way and I always just have. I kind of create my own path and do it that way. I'm not following a rule book or anything. Mm -hmm. I followed some guides, like I followed the Osiris guide for hardcore before. Um, I, fo I followed my own guide as well, but just playing the game, I do my own thing. I don't care if it's inefficient, you know, there'll be that one guy in the chat that's like, bah, bah, bah. you know, you can do this, that, that. I'm like, you know, what? I don't care, mate. I'm having fun doing what I'm doing, you know. It's the difference, I think, is just a lot of people 
how many people actually have fun, like the definition of fun, when they're playing RuneScape and how many just think they have to play it because they want to. I have fun doing almost anything in RuneScape, except for AFKing. I'm not a huge fan of AFKing the game, but I guess I'm not playing at that point, you know? As long as I'm playing the game, I enjoy it. Things I don't enjoy is probably doing Barbarian Assault in World 6. Um... (laughs) Pest control starting to give me a bit of a burnout recently. I'd say I've done a lot of pest control on my many hardcores. And there's a few things that I don't really enjoy. I'm trying to think of something that I don't enjoy. Yeah, like 1.5 ticking teak logs or rune essence. Not a fan of that either, so I don't really bother. I'll always take the inefficient path if I don't enjoy the efficient one. But no, my enthusiasm for the game is simply because I love the game. Played it my whole life. Biggest part of my life. Still playing it today. And... I don't really know if I'll ever quit. No matter how busy I get in life, I think I'll always find the time to do something at some point. That's awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to link this to you. So, Sekon asks, in regards to the recent health complications you have had, I was curious about how your mental woes were. Uh, What did that situation teach you? And then I'll just read the last two. A few years ago, you talked existential dread on stream. Do you still have moments like that? What helped? and favorite bottle of wine okay so i'll quickly jump in here um existential dread i don't know what that is i'm gonna be honest <laughs> so whatever i said on stream i don't even want to google the definition of that and i'll try and recall the moment but i have no idea what that actually means so i don't know how to answer it okay. um in regards to the health complications i'm very happy to go into detail on my health complications but i'm gonna be honest it should probably be at the end of the podcast okay if i go in detail it is very depressing and what i go through is or went through sorry i'm still going through it now i'm not 100 percent recovered um for those that might be new the, the health condition i will go into detail on if you want me to is called topical steroid withdrawal my advice is if you even want to google it or research it trigger warning there is a lot of just oh it's it's hard to put the word on it of what you may read about and see and there's no cure that you can't even take painkillers man like there's this so let me answer the question so regards to the health uh, i'll go into detail later if you want me to um yeah. to the recent health complications curious how the mental lows were what a situation teach you so i am very very good as a human about keeping the positives I am someone that I consider myself so well grounded that I know everything that I've got. You know, I've got loving parents that support me. I've got tons of friends, both from high school, online, university. I keep in contact with them all. I love meeting new people. I've got all that waiting for me. I've got my stream, dream career. You know, I'm financially stable. I've got a roof above my my head. I've got, you know, just all that stuff I could say. I'm very well grounded at knowing what I've actually got as the positive. The negative I had was I had a skin condition called topical steroid withdrawal. And when I say negative, I don't don't take that lightly. It was the most brutal experience of my entire life. There is nothing in my life that even comes close to how difficult that month was. But to answer the question about how bad my mental lows were, if I had to be honest, I really don't think I had mental lows during the whole recovery because I believe that a positive mindset is crucial for recovering. And I managed to turn it into the point that I knew what I was going through was temporary. I knew what I was going through. I'm not the only person going through it. There's a lot of people going through it. And I realized how blessed I was to be in my situation of just having enough savings in the bank to not have to worry about work at all. You know, I'm just like, hey guys, I'm going to take time off streaming. At this point, I didn't know how much time. I'm now 115 days, I think, since I last streamed. This is the longest break I've ever had from streaming ever since I've begun. And my stream is waiting for me, and I know that. But I'm really good at keeping positive mindset by just knowing everything that I've got that other people may not. It's not to say that I'm better than them in any way. It's just the fact that I don't take anything that I've got life for granted. And I'm brilliant at just taking 60 seconds to really truly think about what I've got and ask myself, can I really complain? You know, yeah, I can complain when I have the skin condition I've got, but does it really bring my mental health down? I don't think it did. It really sucked. But to go with mental lows, I kept myself positive throughout the entire thing because I think it was crucial um, to do that. And I think the main thing that allowed me to do that is I knew it was temporary. I knew that I could get there um, and it was just a day at a time. So I kept myself as positive as possible. Uh, The mental lows, I'm happy to go into detail. If there was one specific night 
I still don't know if it's considered a mental low. I really don't know. I think my mindset's just so positive all the time that I truly don't know what a mental low might be. But there was one night where basically there's a symptom in topical steroid withdrawal um, where you have something called weeping. Your skin is so inflamed that it oozes a, a liquid, a fluid uh, out of it. And this fluid has like stickiness to it. Similar to the best way for me to describe it is imagine you were covered in, in these certain areas, someone just got a Pritt stick, which is a glue stick, and just started wiping it on your arm. And now your arm sticks to everything because you've got the glue on it. You wash it off and it'll instantly come back. You cannot get rid of it. It's on you 24 hours a day. Maybe off you for 30 minutes after you shower or something. Um... I had to deal with that for about 25 nights. We're going to day 25 here, which people said this because I tweeted it. 25 nights straight, I lived with basically my entire upper body with this Pritt stick garbage on it or whatever. I was sticking to everything. It's very hard to get your mind around how bad it was. Um, you just have to force yourself to get used to it, I guess. But if you want to try and think about how to relate to it, imagine just putting some Pritt stick on your wrist and then you're playing RuneScape or with or something with the mouse, and then you move your hand off the, the thing, off your desk, and it'll obviously slightly stick. That was me to everything. Uh, but there was one night uh, where I just couldn't sleep, and there's one inevitability when it comes to TSW, and that is that you'll scratch yourself. Can't be avoided. Any eczema, psoriasis person, you'll know scratching, it feels ridiculous. It feels really good. You can't stop. You can't avoid it. It is physically impossible to not scratch. And that's why you can't take painkillers. So you just have to take the whole pain. But there's one night when I basically, I went into these really weird trances. I'm going to try my best to explain these. These are the most ridiculous things you'll ever hear. It's like a dream, but you're conscious kind of thing. Not, not like a lucid dream. It's not sleep paralysis. But as an example, I remember that I was playing capture the flag with my hands on my body and I had to scratch myself to capture the flag. It just sounds ridiculous, but that's what my brain was telling me. And then I suddenly, quotation, sober up. You know, I'm completely sober at the time, but I sober up and realized that what I've been doing is I'm not playing capture the flag. I've just been scratching myself and the damage I've done to my body now at this point, I can't just unreverse it. There was one I mentioned when I was playing the um, Shattered Relics. And I had this weird, I call it a trance. I had this trance that I had perks or shattered relics that would allow me to rewind time so that I could scratch myself and then just go back in time and it never happened. Oh and then obviously I sober up and all I've done is completely scratch my body to the point where I'm just bleeding all over the bed sheets because my skin is just so thin at this point. This was, this, I was streaming at this point. This was happening while I was streaming. You know, I've been going for TSW for ages. But then I had this one. I can't remember the one on this night, but I remember I had really weird ones when I was watching Sopranos. I owed a Paulie from the Sopranos 60 grand, apparently. But if I was scratching my leg, I could pay him back somehow. Don't know. Another one was when I was watching Hannibal. I had to prove Hannibal Lecter was Hannibal Lecter through Sherlock Holmes. I just, I, I can't truly explain them. They just sound like I took some psychedelic drug or something and wrote a story. They were just completely sober, like Jesus. just what my brain was telling me. I can't, I don't know what it is. It's completely psychotic or something. Like, I don't know if I've got psychosis or anything. They, they've died down a lot. I don't get them anymore. I can sleep now. It happened every night, different stories every single time. Now I can sleep, it doesn't happen. But going back to this night, I don't know what it was, but basically I was scratching myself. And I go into the bathroom and I've scratched myself, just layers of skin off. I'm bleeding all down my forearms. The, the weep is all over the place. And I just like, I, I, I left the bathroom and I have, I have like a towel around my neck because I, I wear it like a shock blanket. It really helps with scratching. I don't know why, it really just soothed me all the time. I was wearing this all the time. And I just sat down basically by my plug sockets that are just outside my door hand elbows were on my knees elbows were caught open at this point i put my hands in my head i'm just there like i, I can't deal with this anymore it's the, it's the only time ever in my life trigger warning that i've ever wanted to kill myself ever now i don't know if it, this is put the mental lows by the way i don't know if it was a legitimate threat quotation threat it only it was in my head for about two to five seconds i was just thinking about how, how do i do it you know I, I think I I don't think it was legit though. I don't think it would have ever happened. It's just the fact that that's the first time in my life my brain ever went to that as an option. Obviously, I won't go into detail. It's a permanent permanent solution to temporary problems. Again, I kept my mindset up because I knew it was temporary. Yeah. It's just the fact that everything I've got in life, probably one of the most fortunate people ever, 
and it still put me to this point where that was an option that my brain went to one night it only happened once i don't know why this night was so bad compared to the rest maybe it's because i dealt with i've been dealing with the same thing for 25 days before and there was no recovery because i was just scratching myself and ruining everything and I don't know, but I'd say that is the most mentally low I've ever been. If it was mentally low, I don't know, I don't know if that's the terminology. Let's say it is. That is the most, the, the lowest point of my life ever. And I don't think I'll ever be able to go down that low ever again. It was something different. I don't know if heartbreak could do it. I don't know if like a loved one passing away. I think that's grief in a way differently. It's a different thing. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything possible that could ever bring me back to that specific moment of just being sat by my plug sockets and that being what my brain was telling me was something that i might be considering as an option it was only in my head for five seconds i, I eliminated it immediately as far as i'm aware and i just went back to my recovery obviously easy said than done yeah but i'd say that was the most mentally low moment of the entire recovery most mentally low moment of my entire life and the second most mentally low point moment of my entire life, I really don't know what it is. Like, there's just nothing again that even can come close. There's nothing I even want to put in perspective compared to that. It was, it was bad. I'd say that's where it is. But like I said, that that's one night of my recovery. So if I go into detail of my recovery later on, it will get dark and depressing. So again, if we're going to do it, I'd rather do it at the end of the podcast so people can enjoy the podcast. And then if they're not interested in hearing the stories or if it gets a bit morbid, they can just leave and still have enjoyed the majority of it. Sounds good. Yeah, that's uh, that's fucking terrifying. Honestly, I, uh, I wish you the best in the rest of your healing because that's just like, and, and we'll get into it toward the end. To say I'm 95% recovered right now. Um, I only have minor symptoms left. I don't have that weeping anymore. That weeping, if anyone here has TSW, the weeping is the most irritating thing ever. It's very hard to get your head around it. When it disappears, and it will disappear naturally, it gets a lot easier after that. Just saying, if you got this far. Um, oh, what was I saying right before I mentioned that? Um... I was about to say something. I quickly sidetracked to say that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm 95% healed. The only thing I'm dealing right now is something called a thermoregulation irregularity. I love saying it. It just flows off the mouth so nicely. <laughs> uh, basically, my body can't regulate temperature. So I can be freezing cold and I sweat. I can be boiling hot and I don't sweat. But unfortunately, sweat, I'm basically borderline allergic to my own sweat right now. Don't know why, but when I sweat, it's incredibly discomforting. It's why I can't stream right now. I I don't I, I don't sweat a lot when I stream, but I raise my voice a lot. I'm laughing a lot. There's a lot going on. It increases my body temperature. My body temperature goes all over the place. I physically cannot stream right now because I will sweat when I do it, and I know it. And when it happens, I have to get off the sofa, take my shirt off, and just wrap a blanket around me for like ten minutes and just let it pass. It's pretty horrible. Um, but that's the only bad thing I've got. That's dying down a lot in the past two weeks. Actually, um, it's getting a lot better. Other than that, I've got still my forearms, my earlobes, uh, a bit on my face, and the back of my hands is still to recover, and a tiny bit down on my left calf, um, but mostly through it. I'm through all the hard parts now. It's, it's smooth sailing from here, day to time, but dead easy compared to what the first month was. Okay. Second's last question was, favorite bottle of wine, if you have one? Oh, did you, did you, did you Google the existential dread thing? Like, I'm still trying to work out what, what that is. I, I don't know what he was asking, honestly, because it's it I, it looks like it was something on your stream that you said like years ago a few years ago i, I don't I, it sounds negative let me just I've, oh i'll just pull the wrong thing um many people at some point in their lives suffer existential dread it is the questioning of life death and all uncertainties surrounding them i'm gonna be honest i don't think i said anything to do with that so i'm not sure where this guy's pulling this from uh not trying to clear my name or anything i just don't remember that's not something i really talk about I can answer the question to say that I live my life um, in the moment. Like I'm 27 years old. I do what I want to do in life. I, I, I would make the most of your 20s. I'm again, one of those people blessed with the ability to have good fortune in the like financially stable and obviously some excess money. I put money towards investing for the future, but I like to also live life in my 20s. You know, if I was to save all my money up from streaming, try and secure myself a permanent future and let's just say retire at 40, 20s are where I live my life, you know, I have my life running and the things I like to do is I like to play RuneScape, I like to go to restaurants, I like to go to techno raves, and I guess the gym just for natural health. It's the only thing I like to do. Existential dread, no, I live my life, I wake up and I live that one day and I repeat from there. As long as I know that I'm securing my future a bit here and there, I make sure I'm happy in the present. 
Favorite bottle of wine? Ooh, so I go to quite a few tasting menus. I've done some wine pairing. I think it's more of a gimmick, but I've learned quite a bit from it. So my favorite bottle of wine, uh, I don't drink white wine much, but anything from the Riesling area is definitely my favorite wine. I will only drink white wine with a fish dish, sea bass, salmon, um, calamari starter or something. So that's my favorite white. I obviously much prefer red wine. I drink white wine probably maybe three times a year. I drink red wine almost every time I go to a restaurant. I'm actually trying to cut that down now. I want to try and cut alcohol out a bit, so I might try and enjoy restaurants. I mainly go for the food, so I want to start going to restaurants and maybe just get either a soft drink, like a pineapple juice on the side, or just water, and just enjoy the food. Favorite bottle of red, though? I always pair Malbec with a steak. My favorite bottle of Malbec, I don't know the name of it, but my favorite overall bottle of wine is something known as, I think it's pronounced Cotes de Rhone. Uh, it's basically a cheaper version of, I believe, Chateau de Pap. I like both, um, but a Coach de Rhone, I can buy a 10 pound bottle of Coach de Rhone from the co-op and enjoy that just as much as I enjoy a 40 pound Malbec, let's just say. Um, when I say a 40 pound Malbec, if you go to a restaurant, if you go to restaurants, a good way to see drinks is you're not buying a 100 pound bottle of wine, let's say. You're paying the restaurant 40 pound to drink a 60 pound bottle of wine. And then you got a tip on top of that, which is fine, but yeah. I like to drink wine. I normally go for the cheaper bottles most of the time, unless I do a wine pairing, because that's just how I see it. You know, I don't want to pay 40 quid to drink a 60 pound bottle of wine. Yeah. But no, I'd say Coach de Rhone is my favorite bottle of wine. I will pair that with anything except for fish dishes, I guess. Any red meat, anything at all. It's a good go-to. It's smooth. And I just enjoy them. I've never had a bad one. And if I ever want to treat myself, I believe Chateau de Pape is a better version of Coach de Rhone. And uh, I actually got my parents a magnum of Chateau de Pape for uh, Christmas. So that was nice. Which they've not opened yet because I saw my dad last week. Um, but no, I'd say Coach de Rhone is my favorite bottle of wine. Awesome. All right. We got a topic from Max. And he asks, do you think you would start the gym again when your skin condition allows it? You made really good progress a couple years ago. I actually want to kind of talk about your whole fitness journey because uh i've had foe on the cast and he was talking about you know his fitness and same with roidy and stuff and i actually really i admire those streamers that can maintain a healthy lifestyle as well because it's so easy to slip into just complete laziness i've been there you know uh, i'll come to that in my answer the question first is a quick one uh yes i do plan to start the gym again I've got some images of my recovery that are very bad. I put on a lot of weight for recovery because, again, I can't exercise or anything. And my diet's not been the cleanest. I've got it clean now. Um, basically, I spent the first three months, I couldn't even wash dishes because my hands were so bad. So I couldn't really do much except order food inside. So I, li I lived off like f just ordering food for so long. Um, I do plan to. Uh, I want to go quite hard on it. But I also obviously want to maintain living life for the last three years in my 20s as well before I'm 30. So I'll be training while still drinking alcohol and still going out and stuff and still going to restaurants. I don't know how bad it is for me to eat clean, let's just say six days of the year and then go to a restaurant on the seventh. So I don't know how that's going to affect my progress. But I want to take one of the images from my recovery um, and then I want to train until a year later. And then I can put a year, like the comment would be one year progress an image of me during my recovery where I just, it's all gone and I just look ridiculously bad. And then a new one where I've managed to get myself, you know, leaner body fat percentage down, put the muscle mass back on, you know, get the size back. I hold my size quite well, actually. When I saw some of my friends for the first time, one of them said, you know, I look big and I've been lifting. I didn't touch the weight in seven months, you know? Right now I can't go to the gym because again, sweat triggers my skin too much. I don't want to go to a gym and not really get a sweat on. It's not much of a workout. I'm happy to just wait until this passes and get there. Also, my forearms are obviously quite bad, so I don't want to take all these really bad skin to the gym because I'd probably flake dead skin everywhere still. So I'll stay away from the gym for now. But yes, I 100%, 100% plan to go. I'm going to a new gym, though, because I have to go on with air con to keep the temperature down. Um, that's the answer to that. If you want to go back to what you were mentioning before about the fitness journey, I can go right back to day one if you want. Let's do it. Okay, so basically, I moved out when I was 21. Um, and when I moved out... I lived so long on literally co-op meal deals. I drank water. I've been drinking water for a long time. If any of you want to get into fitness, this is the advice I give everyone ever that isn't overwhelming. If you drink sodas or any of that stuff, literally just go and buy a half gallon hydrator or a big bottle, fill it with water and put that next to you on your desk and just only drink water. Honestly, the best thing you can do, water is just perfect. And it's not overwhelming. If I was to tell you, eat clean, calorie deficit, all this garbage, you're not going to maintain it. Water, 
Just don't go fill pint glasses up. Even bottled water. I used bottled water for a while as a placebo. I'd reach over for my Tango can, my Fanta, my Sprite, whatever it was, and I'd grab a bottle of water, and obviously I'd just drink it. So bottled water is a good way to initially get into it. But I think drinking water, if anyone wants to get into fitness in any way, start by drinking water. Just do that and make that a habit. It's really easy to do, in my opinion. Um, and again, you can never go wrong drinking water. For me, though, I basically lived like three years of my life off co-op meal deals um, because I was playing RuneScape. I was streaming. This is around just around when I think the first Deadman mode released. I uh, was when I noticed it. Uh, so the channel was absolutely popping. And I realized at the time I was about 23, maybe 20. No, I was about 22 or 23, 24 years old. And I realized that my physical fitness was horrendous. But the thing is, my physical fitness will always be horrendous unless I actually go put some effort in to actually getting there. And I realized that immediately. Like, I'm not going to suddenly get ripped overnight. I'm not going to get healthy overnight. It's not going to happen. The only way to do it is go to the gym. And it's one of those where I ask myself in the moment, will I regret this in a year? And I was like, absolutely not. One one year older me is going to look back and thank the person, blah, blah, blah. You know, like that's I think that's looking at life in foresight. So I was like, right, okay, let's go to the gym. But it's a bit too daunting just to go straight to the gym. So I set myself a challenge of one, get the diet a bit cleaner. I started eating, I ate raw broccoli for 18 months. So never, I can't even look at a raw broccoli anymore. But my goal was to run a 5K in under 23 minutes, I think it was. It's obviously not that fast. But again, when you're trying to get into fitness, you need to set yourself goals that are manageable and achievable. So my first 5K was like, I don't know, 36 minutes maybe. But eventually I got the 5K in under 23 minutes and that's when I went to the gym and that's when I started lifting weights. I built myself a little foundation, a little goal that I knew could be achieved immediately, achieved that, and then I went to the gym. As for going to the gym, I, I got myself a personal trainer. Uh, you can go to YouTube videos all you want and get people to tell you the tutorial. But a personal trainer is multiple things. I consider it probably the best investment of, I've ever made in my entire life, a personal trainer. There's no financial return. You obviously spend the money, but you're investing in yourself. I think investments in yourself are the most important thing you can do. Like Invisalign. Invisalign is another one. Like get your teeth fixed or anything like that. Do it sooner rather than later because you'll reap the benefits for the rest of your life. You know, if you only consider investing, investing to get a return with your money, it, you know, like the physical fitness that I got from it, it's confidence, you know, it's, it's obviously fitness, it's health, you know, I might live longer, you know, it's good. I'm not going to have, hopefully not going to have a heart attack by the time I'm maybe 35 because of cholesterol, let's say, because I'm exercising. But the personal trainer was probably the best investment I ever did in my life because it's motivation to get there. They teach you the ropes and they, they give you a push, you know, they push you um, towards obviously like growing and gaining size. They can answer your questions, help you out with nutrition all that stuff. And then you don't have to have a personal trainer forever. You can literally have a personal trainer for like 10 sessions, five sessions, then just kind of copy what he did for another few weeks. And then if you want, you can grab him again and change it all around again and do that. But once you start going to the gym, the hardest part is just going initially. And eventually, if you go for the first time, you'll have something called delayed onset muscle soreness, which is known as DOMS. A new person going to the gym might get DOMS and go once, twice, maybe three times and then just try and recover on DOMS, which is smart, but then the motivation dies instantly. Personal trainer will get you in the gym. You'll still get the DOMS, of course, but hopefully it gets you back to the gym. Once you start getting there, when you start seeing the the gains, let's just use the term, like when you when you see what's happening to your body, the improvements, you know, you start looking fuller, filling your shirt out, you can see the forearms starting to gain some size. It's confidence. You feel really good. You look in the mirror and you're like, oh my God. And it's addictive as well. It's just initially getting there is the hardest part. And my advice, and I say this to everyone, the best advice I can give is if you want to start being healthy, start by drinking water, fix the diet next, way down the line, like a month of drinking water, run, set, like, set a goal of running for a certain amount of time before you start going to the gym because you can tick them off. And once you go to the gym, the first couple of weeks at the gym will be the hardest. And then when you get there, you'll see, you won't see results in the first couple of, you might actually see some results in the first couple of weeks, just nothing big. Gym results are very slow, very slow. I mainly went just for general fitness because I realized when I was playing dead man mode, I was eating meal deals. And I just think it's the most unhealthy diet possible. I need to fix this. And that's just how I fixed it all straight away. Ran my 5K, got myself a personal trainer. Personal trainer got me in the gym motivated, pushed me in the right direction. And then when you see the progress come in, you can get yourself in the gym after that so you don't permanently need a personal trainer and then youtube videos and all that can help you out and you can't ever regret it you can li anyone listen to this podcast right now if you've been putting the gym off for any reason whatsoever 
ask yourself in a year from now if you want to actually bother going to the gym not everyone can be bothered in a year from now will you look back and be like shit i wish i started the gym when i watched that podcast let's say or started training or started eating healthy drinking water all that stuff and there is no one that can tell me that you wouldn't say that you regret it a year later down the line in my opinion so it's one of those look at it in foresight and then obviously judge from there it's not for everyone but in all honesty, I think everybody wants to naturally be healthy. And that's the yeah. advice I can give. Yeah, it's uh, I I was pretty fit in college, and then getting into streaming and content creation, where you're just like setting your own schedules and stuff, and ordering food, which is the that is addicting. By the way, I like six weeks ago, seven weeks ago at this point, I had to just delete all my delivery apps because I'm just so addicted to just uh, getting convenience so food many times. yeah i i plan when i can go back to the gym to remove my um delivery apps i might be able to do it now i've started meal prepping uh i meal prep all the time but i've started meal prepping in actual meal prep containers nowadays uh where i can actually make it look a bit aesthetically pleasing let's say rather than just dumping everything onto a plate i've also learned to cook a bit more the amount of restaurants i go to i just cook the bland chicken rice broccoli or potatoes Nowadays, I actually add flavors and spices to all of my stuff, mainly the rice, actually. So I'm actually really enjoying the food I cook right now. And it's um, very important as well. Again, I don't want to be saying this the main thing because I think people should drink water first to start. When you start eating clean, you have to make sure you enjoy your diet. Because if you eat clean for six days, like I said, then you just order a load of food. You just negate all the progress you just did. If anything made it worse, and there was no point in you eating clean for the six days. Yeah. Except for the fact that if you ate dirty for seven days, that's obviously way bad. But that's why with me, I, I go to restaurants quite often. Maybe once a week I might go to a restaurant. Maybe once every other week. I don't know how bad that is if I eat clean for six days and then suddenly go to some restaurant and I will eat the whole menu. Like... 4,000 calories, no problem. I will destroy that menu. <laughs> I will eat everything. So I don't know how bad that truly, truly is there. Well, you were like putting on muscle, I feel like. So in that case, I think it's actually probably a beneficial thing almost if you only do it once a week. But for those like trying to lose weight, yeah, maybe that's a different story. At least that's how I see it. Back in college, I would just eat. I would go to McDonald's at like 2 a.m. and just like order food five mcdoubles because i was just working out and i needed the calories i was so hungry <laughs> the thing with mcdonald's is you go down everyone thinks mcdonald's is cheap but then you work out your doors 18 quid because you order 20 mcnuggets three burgers <laughs> big mac large fries milkshake spicy wrap mcflurry i don't know you order absolutely everything from that menu <laughs> i realized i mean because i'm turning 27 next month and i'm just like i'm getting too old for this i physically feel ill now when i eat a bunch of fast food back in the day i could just eat a bag of candy and just have like three hamburgers and feel fantastic i just can't do it anymore which is i think i i kind of wanted to bring this up with the health journey i almost feel like it's inevitable well not inevitable per se but i feel like you hit a point in life and for everyone it's different where you just need to start treating your body better but i, I mean at least for me five years ago if somebody Eh, maybe like four years ago or so because I actually was somewhat healthy in college but like four years ago when I was kind of like out of college and just working if somebody told me to try to get fit I just wouldn't have cared because my life was already fine I was young I could eat whatever but you eventually hit a point where you decide okay I need to change these sh shitty habits yeah, like I, I, I call it the wake up call, but I had it in my time when I realized how bad it was. Even now, I still drink alcohol. I mean, alcohol is terrible for you, but I do still drink it when I go for a meal, when I go on a night out. I don't really see myself quitting alcohol. I'm, I'm cutting it down though. Uh, me and my girlfriend, we want to cut it down a bit because we go to restaurants a lot and alcohol will double the price of the meal most of the time, depending where we go. Uh, so we want to just go there, water, maybe just one glass with the main or something. We want to start doing that. So I wouldn't mind doing that because I'm 27. So I mean, like drinking, it's obviously not like, I'm not saying it's like a cool thing to drink. It's just, I enjoy it around other people. You know, I've got good mm -hmm. friends. We all bounce off each other. It's, it's just those vibes, you know, it's always yeah. good. Well, I want to try, we want to try and cut it down just a tiny bit, you know, because sometimes I go out and I drink like maybe a half a bottle of gin before I go to a rave and then load a double vodka Red Bulls or something. I'm just like, <laughs> a lot of alcohol at the end of the day, you know, but as long as you enjoy the night again, I'm living, I'm living in the present. Yeah. If the next day pays for it again, the, when the next day pays for it, I might miss a stream and then it's like affects that, you know, day offs here, here and there are always good, but there's so much benefits to actually quitting alcohol or just cutting it down in general. So it's something that I think post recovery as well. 
I would consider myself like the healthiest person on the planet right now. The amount of vitamins that I take in the morning that and I've done all the reason I'm putting coconut oil in my hair right now and stuff like that, you know. I had um with my 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 recovery, I had sub support dermatitis, I think it's called that like basically your scalp is like it's like super dandruff. And I had it for so long and it can be chronic and I finally got rid of it or basically got rid of it. Applying coconut oil to my hair and then just rotating between three anti dandruff um shampoos i've managed to actually alleviate most of it and if it's gone i'm really happy because i think out of everything that would be the biggest confidence i can go out with my face looking a bit bad or like maybe not my hands i want my hands covered just for you know people not like worrying about what's on me but that was the only thing that would affect my confidence i think is my hair just flaking everywhere so i'm happy that i've managed to get rid of that yeah you're uh i gotta give you a compliment i saw that picture um of you like it must have been right before the skin condition started happening but your hair is just luscious and thick man i'm jealous <laughs> i'm gonna say I, I i'm sorry to say this i lost a lot of hair my hair is very thin right now it sucks but it's it's okay because when i started it's actually quite notoriously known before recovery that you should shave your hair to recover mm. i physically couldn't that is where my mental health would have been destroyed i just didn't want to I would have if I had to, if it's inevitable, do it. But I've managed to get through it without shaving my hair. But I did lose so much hair that if if, if, I, if I pull my hair back, you can see borderline see my scalp if you'd look carefully. Beforehand, you couldn't see anything. It was like an ocean of hair up there. So it but, grows back though. So yeah. it's all good. Yeah, I was going to say it should naturally get back to its state, hopefully. Um, I want to kind of actually like i have a topic right here but i actually want to ask this first because i'll probably lose it what was the whole uh beard oil and beard products with uh caffeine what can you tell the story about that because i know you kept it secret for a while it seemed like and then you released it and it was a huge thing so yeah it, it's really upsetting because i released it and i've gone through so many complications and my health issues that pushed it back before i go into it one of my worries was that i may have had a i, I was pretty confident not but i may have had an allergic reaction to caffeine a lot of people said that might have been what caused my skin i've been using caffeine before it launched like back in february we had the prototypes of like 21 i had them um i don't think i'm allergic to any ingredient but i am checking that just to check because i have to make sure that what i'm selling isn't going to cause people i mean if you're allergic to an ingredient in there then yes you will get an allergic reaction but if you don't research or if you if you're allergic to a skincare product you should know the ingredient that you're allergic to yeah. um but i was worried about that because if i was or anything i probably would have had to just disband it because i can't sell or don't want to sell a product that's bad um on the skin and it goes back again when i had the support dermatitis it was under my beard as well and if it was chronic i can't sell beard products if my whole beard's constantly flaking off and all that so i'm so happy it's gone but no, it was a long time ago where basically I, I consider my beard genetics flawless, like simply flawless. And my dad's beard genetics are fantastic as well. So I think I got it from there. But there was this conversation we had one day. Uh, it was around a table. We were having a meal. Some drinks were going around. A lot of the time, drunk conversations can lead to great ideas. It just depends if you want to actually put the effort in to do it. So we were talking about how a beard sponsor would be fantastic for my channel, completely flawless. And instead of that, my manager was like, why don't we just create our own beard brand? And it basically sparked from there and we put in some effort, we did some research, we started creating a product. And I think it took us like, let me remember, I'm, I think it was like 14, no, eight, I think it was eight months. I wanna say eight months um, to get the first one going. And to, yeah, um, I've got it on my Twitter right here. Uh, Premium Breaker I've been developing for over eight months. Yeah, it's about eight months. Uh, we decided that instead of a company paying us to promote their brand, we're like, why don't we just create our own brand, promote it myself and see if we can grow it to something big. You know, like a business, like businessmen are the richest in the world, you know. The motivation is obviously not to try and make as much money as possible. I'd rather create a successful brand. I haven't launched the next one yet. I don't know when. It's so delayed because I need to record the videos and I can't because my skin's on well, my face is not good enough. The new one it's called Omni. I'm trying to get samples to send to some people and maybe send some money their way to just like give it a little shout out before it's even launched or something. I'm not a huge fan of people doing things for free, uh, particularly content creators. If you do things for free for businesses, then you, 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 need, you need to know your value. Like you can be paid a fair amount of money or whatever. It's very, very important. So I'd rather not. A lot of people offer to do it for free though because of what I've done for them in the past, which I'd say that fair game. If it's a favor any day, but I'd like to pay. I am very confident 
when I launched this new one, which is named Omni, that people who currently have beard products might switch to this one permanently. It is that good. It is better than Bonsai by a lot. Bonsai is fantastic. I was so happy when we finally created that one. This new one, if you're watching this and have a beard and you plan to get it, I am genuinely, and I'd love to know as well if you do remember this moment uh, to anyone that buys it. I genuinely think people will swap out their potential beard products for this new range when we get it. It's fantastic. And the longevity is ridiculous. I wear it out recently. I can finally reapply it to my beard because the skin beneath is actually fixed. Obviously, I can't put chemicals on broken skin. Um, and the longevity of it, I think I was out for like six hours and you could still smell it on me six hours later. So I'm really happy with that one. But the whole concept of Cafune, it was literally, do I want to be sponsored by a beard company that's established or do I want to actually try and create my own business? You know, if we create my own business, we get good products, we do everything right and it does, it can grow to be worth quite a lot of money, you know, like to see how it goes, boost it through the channel. If we get a global brand, I mean, the market for men's skincare is billions, multi-billion market. If we even get into a fraction of a percent of that, the brand will be worth quite a lot. So I think it's kind of that. It's, it's another another gateway, really, let's just say, gateway to like more like financial stability or something in a way. So if the brand does well, that comes with it, which would be perfect. But the goal wasn't just to release a product to make more money from the viewers, though. I genuinely really want to try and grow Cafune to be big like i'll be proud of it really proud of it once it actually gets to a certain size it's just i've had all the setbacks so you release it hype and then nothing for so long the hype's just kind of dead kind of worked well though because there's been nothing with cafune for almost a year now so i can kind of re-spark that hype when i'm good to get everything going hopefully no complications and then get it snowballing from there hopefully create something awesome with it yeah that's very cool i thought it was awesome i love the the video ad and everything you just it was super professional it was, it was fucking cool. i've already got I've, I've wrote it down i know exactly what the next one's going to be as well <laughs> i know how the video is going to go i know the product i know how it all works everything ready and then i go get my skin condition so i can't record a video of my face still irritated or something because it's a skincare product well it's a beard product at the end of the day so i need to look flawless don't know how long's in recovery but all i'll say is the new product is delayed for a long time but I, I, I feel it's like a second chance to launch the company. So um, when it's ready, and I also think it's better than Bonsai, I think this one will do really, really well. I'm just a bit worried about following it up, to be honest. It will be tough. We spent ages on this one, and it's really good. Awesome. All right. Sick Nerd asks, how does it feel having the hardest job in the world? <laughs> how do you cope on a daily basis? Struggling with this myself currently considering becoming something a bit more laid back like a firefighter or something i know this is memeing but uh i'm gonna give a shout oh, out no, no, I've got good answers for this so the way i want to answer this now it's it's hard for me to say because i feel you can always just everything i can say in a moment you can always just reply and say well yeah because you've got a stream that's got one of five thousand subscribers and all that so obviously i don't need to worry about things i feel like the, the quotation streaming being hard goes more out to smaller streamers let's just say to answer the question, I've been streaming for almost 10 years now, let's say. I don't know exactly. I think it's about 10. Wait. Wait, I've been streaming for 11 years. I've been streaming since 2011. Okay, I've been streaming for 11 years. Um, streaming is one of the easiest jobs on the planet. And if you're a streamer, you can have that hard day. There's a day where maybe you don't feel like you can entertain or something like that. But I've been streaming for 11 years and is the it's it's not it's the second easiest job in my opinion for what i do youtube is the easiest job on the planet don't care what <laughs> anyone says i can literally pre-record five videos set them to schedule three days apart and go on holiday for two weeks and then repeat the process youtube is piss easy bro because i'm doing it now because i can't stream i'm recording videos left and right that just that quick like if i play runescape for 14 hours a day call it 10 hours a day i can create a video in four or five days normally like you know most yeah. videos are around that for quicker and then i can just schedule it a couple of days later and then if i create another video let's say i'll get some good rng i can make a couple of videos and just go on holiday for a week so i think <laughs> youtube's probably the easiest job out there twitch though uh again to answer the question obviously the question's a bit of a bait uh for anyone that thinks sick nerd genuinely thinks he has the hardest job sick nerd i think is a very well grounded streamer as well he knows what he's got he knows what it is he knows how easy it is obviously if you're a streamer watching this and you think streaming's hard why you know that's the question why is streaming hard for you i think the reason i find streaming so easy is because i don't treat it like a business i never will there's things on the side like cafune or maybe sale merch that i sell that could be considered as business but i just go live to have fun with everyone exactly the same reason i turned my stream on in 2011 
I turned it on to have fun with some people, to stream my gameplay and whatever. 11 years later, exactly the same, you know? Everything that came with my stream happened through me treating it the same. I just go live and I have fun. And because I have fun, the vibes are there. It's a good time. I'm sharing the music I love with people. People are sharing music back to me. I never find it difficult. There can be that. The only time I think streaming is difficult is when I'm hungover. You know, the amount of times I'm talking about alcohol as well, I sound like the biggest alcoholic, but streaming hungover can be pretty difficult. It's very hard to be entertaining when you're feeling like sluggish, let's just say. Yeah. But no, most of the time I wake up, I, I'll, I'll go to the gym. I, I, eat, I eat clean, I drink water. I don't really have much caffeine. Maybe I have a, a, a black coffee before I start. If you're relying on energy drinks or alcohol or potentially like drugs to do your streams, then yeah, I can understand how it's difficult because you're relying on something to do the stream for you in a way. For me, I just turn it on. It's my natural energy. It's what I want to do. You know, I go live, I get zero subs, zero donations, whatever. It doesn't bother me, you know? Now, fair enough. I'm financially stable on the subscribers, so I don't need to worry about the bills. But you have to ask yourself, like, because streaming has no security to it, should you be a full-time streamer if you're, like, pushing, like, if you're chasing the dream, fair enough, but if you're pushing paycheck to paycheck, I feel you can see the stress and all that. So it's it, this is why I think it goes to a smaller streamer rather than myself. It's dead easy for me to say that streaming is not hard. But I think the true reason I think streaming is easy is because I never turn it to a business. I don't go live trying to maximize revenue, get sub trains or something, get, like, a, a sub goal on the screen that doesn't get hit. I go live, get no donations, no bits, no subs, let's just say hypothetically. Don't bother me. I'll go live tomorrow as well. It's fine. But someone that needs that, I can understand how it might be a bit scary. But I think that's kind of the difference between treating the stream as a business and just streaming for fun. I stream for fun, the money's a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like those that started a decade ago, I feel like everybody that was starting on Twitch back then, or I guess Justin TV, when was it switched to Twitch? Was that before your time or uh, after? Mm so when it switched to twitch i got partnered on youtube and partnered on twitch as well so i was actually partnered on twitch with zero followers on twitch at the time this is before sub buttons existed though okay. partnership back then was it was ad revenue and i'm talking it was like 40 dollars a month uh, even with a few hundred views it was absolutely nothing Jesus. um but no i i started right as it turned to twitch basically that's why i went to that platform because i initially streamed on a website called owned tv i had a three in there or something some people might remember that but that was a long time that's back when i used xsplit and all that as well um but no it's some sometime very late 2010 i want to say it switched to twitch okay that's, I don't know, I see those, like, your generation of streamers, everyone went into it for fun, because like you said, there was no money involved. But nowadays, I mean, you see a lot of people that aren't even gamers going on Twitch, and they just, like, kind of do it as a, as a, like, a side hustle almost. So the, the it, they do treat it like a business from day one, basically, because they see the, the potential money in it. Yeah, the whole, it's, just, it's a thing that, again, I think I'm quite bad for adapting uh, in a way, but the whole industry of streaming nowadays in 2022, it's seen as a legitimate job and everyone turns their stream, well, not everyone, but I think a lot of people turn their streams into businesses because obviously it becomes their full-time, like streaming is my full-time job, you know, I've got mm -hmm. YouTube as well, and I, both of them do me quite well, but I, will, I, I just don't think I'll ever turn my streaming into a business. I don't want to go there and be like, making all these financial incentives for my viewers to get something from me like making money cost something in the stream you know i go live i think you can pay for a song request and that's about it in my stream but someone comes in they're like bodhi go pk and i'll give you 100 quid for an hour that's 100 quid in an hour you know but i'm not gonna do that because well one a sponsorship would pay exponentially more money there's always a price you know if someone said go pk for an hour for five grand I'm, I'm doing that any day you know i might as well <laughs> money obviously speaks to some limit to everyone out there um but I just, I feel like I like to go live and I'm not trying to rinse my viewers' pockets for everything they've got. You know, my viewers have lives too. You know, they've got their own bills to pay. I, I'm probably earning more than, let's just say, 99.9% .9 of the people watching my stream. It's probably some billionaires maybe that watch my stream or something. But most people, and I think my viewers know this quite well, is they understand that I earn more than them. So if you're donating me a fiver, you know, like there's a lot that you could probably do with your own life instead of giving it to me because a five pound donation to a big streamer myself all it does is increase my bank account by a fiver you know it doesn't really matter it's just going to sit there and do whatever because i've already got most of my stuff covered by my subscription revenue that i get all i ask for my viewers is just if they want to sub they can sub it's five dollars a month and that's all i really mind it keeps me financially stable alone i'm great with that if they want to donate go for it and obviously if you don't have the financial 
situation to subscribe you shouldn't be subscribed to a streamer is that five dollars a month you can use it for i don't know towards a gym membership or like a disney plus maybe let's just say disney plus more of a luxury i guess then you should probably put it towards your own life rather than give it to a streamer who's probably a multi-millionaire probably earns way more than you do and yet you're still giving him money i get it it's not about the money at that point it's just the, the whole you know thank you for the content you watch 200 hours of a streamer and give him a five dollar sub let's say yeah. you're basically giving him is it 2.5 pence an hour you know it, it, it's like that you know most yeah. people can spare it and they're generous you know it's appreciated but in my channel that's all i want it to be and you can maybe pay for some song requests i'm very happy with that as well yeah but i don't want it to be where i go live and pe i've seen it all these days and it's just all like i join i won't name names if they're watching this don't i I've, I've all the people like i'd have a beer with any of them not bad mouth with anyone the amount of streams i join and the whole streams are just about gifted subscribers you know i'm just hearing 10 subs for this 20 subs for this you know i'm just like the whole stream is getting money from your viewers like yeah, yeah. maybe it creates the content because i can't relate to that i don't know what it's like maybe it's content for the viewers as well but i'm like they're just trying to maximize as much money as possible per stream it's it works it's, it's a psychological bait if you mention subs or anything if i mention prime i'll get five primes you know <laughs> click of a finger i do it every now and then as a joke i might as well and i do get the primes and i fully know i'm gonna get the primes it's fine sometimes i don't and i'm sat there like hopefully don't notice you know it's embarrassing but I don't know, I feel a lot of streams, the whole fun aspect is gone because you could probably watch some streamers and the most common word you'll hear them say will be prime, subs, <laughs> bits, emissions. And I'm just like, if that's the most common word of the stream, you know, the most common word in my stream is probably banned, like literally your band or <laughs> mate. I say mate all the time, things like that. I don't want my stream to be that. Fair play to other people. If they're doing it, they're enjoying it. Their viewers are enjoying it. Obviously, don't change your stream because I don't like it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying I don't like it. It's just I can't watch some people when I hear the word gifted 12 times in five minutes. I just simply can't. Like 10 gifted for this, 15 gifted. I can't enjoy it, you know. The vibe isn't there. It, it seems like a paywall for the content in a way. I like to go to a stream. Going back to what I said, Jace, Rig, Zulu, any of them. There's none of that. If someone gifts subs, it's because they want to gift the streamer some money to say thank you for the content, really. So, small pet peeve of mine, I think, there. No one should take offense if you do that. Um, all their streams are great to their audience. Their audience obviously isn't my audience, so it doesn't. It does not matter what I say. All of them, I'd have a beer with them in person, so it's nothing personal or anything. It's just something that I guess as a streamer for like ten or eleven years, as a not really wanting to turn into a business, the idea of just trying to maximize your income from your viewers' pockets. I'm not a huge fan. It's kind of like you see all your viewers as potential money every stream. Yeah. I like to just see my viewers and have a good time with them all, really. That's a good mindset. Good mindset. And I, I see, I, I, like, I know who you're talking about with, uh, I mean, I'm I'll, I'm also not going to name names, but <clears throat> I think oh, they're happen, just I'll hustling. Happen, you know? think, it's the true hustle. Most people, most people just pull out the name Oda block here. I love Oda streams. The thing I'll say about Oda is I'm actually not talking about Oda here. Otis Streams is the OG of just the baited subs and all that. <laughs> I can watch Otis Stream all day and enjoy all the gifts coming in. It's yeah. everyone that's just trying to copy what he does yeah. because of his, there's so much money involved. Otis Stream day one is just gifted subs for content. And it's brilliant. I love it. I sit there and watch him get 500 gifted subs and do all this crazy stuff, and I generally enjoy it. And I go to someone else's stream, the Zs are out, you know, they're saying Walla and all this, and I'm just like, <laughs> I can't, you know, it, it's it's not you it's someone else's personality yeah. in an attempt to get the financial gain they're getting in a way and it's something that i struggle to watch but yeah. if it works for them good you know again like i said anything i say do not change your stream for me you do your stream and if you're enjoying it perfect all right uh we got a topic from whale and he asks what is the best dead whale name and why is it whale peeled and tortured and just for me to add what how did the whole whale thing come out and i know you love whales so uh i'd love to hear the whole story around that yeah basically when i was eight years old i went to i think it's called a car boot sale in the uk i don't know what it's called but I went to my school loads of stuff you could buy for dirt cheap sweets random toys i went on this lucky dip that was in like a wash bin for like 20p and i had great techniques so i go down i'm feeling all these tiny little shitty toys and i grab this mammoth of a toy down at the bottom pull it out and it's this gigantic blue whale i still have that blue whale today um i actually had that whale before i started playing runescape and i still have it today so that's where the whale started and then i just used to, when i was younger i just researched them i just find them interesting you know like the largest of the massive you know i mean 
I've never seen one in the wild. I've seen pilot whales, but if you swim past like a blue whale in the ocean, hypothetically, it takes like 60 seconds. If you're both swimming in the same direction, 60 seconds until it's past you, you know? Sheesh. I find things like that interesting. I mean, if you're swimming next to a human at the same speed, you'd never technically pass them, but... I don't know. I just find them really fascinating. I like how they are. They just seem so chill. They just seem to like swim all day, just swim and just eat some krill here and there and then go to some weird cove to mate where we don't know where that is and all that. So no, I just find them really interesting. I didn't know until like a year ago that a blue whale is the largest animal that's ever lived on earth. Yeah, from what we know, because there's some concepts of, I think they're all mythical creatures, but I think Leviathan, if that ever existed, or Megalodon. No, Megalodon, actually, the biggest one from teeth we found, if it existed, which we think it did, never exceeded it. I really want to say there is a dinosaur that's bigger, tail to head. Mm. Um, one of those with the long neck. And I think if you put the neck down and put it horizontally, it might be bigger. And I should notice, because I'm very confident that, yes, the blue whale is the biggest animal ever to have lived. But I really think there was a dinosaur that might have exceeded it that I can't remember the name of. But as far as I'm aware, I'm happy to say, yes, the blue whale is the biggest thing to ever, ever exist. That's just crazy that it literally fills a football field. Like you would just lie it down on a football field and it would just. <laughs> uh, so I think I think the females can grow bigger, but a, a female fully grown adult blue whale, I think, would actually be bigger than how big is a football field? Is it 94? It's like 90, 90 meters, or uh, 90, or uh, what am I saying, 94, 100 yards. Actually, it would be 120 yards because of the end zones. Let me do some calculation. Uh, okay, no, <laughs> whale, so uh, 120 yards is 109 meters. The biggest blue whale I think they ever found or got proof of was, I think, 33 meters. Oh, really? So, Why did I think it was a football field then? Um... You might be thinking of a London bus. There's sometimes they can quote it to a London bus. It's like 10 of them in a row or something like that. Can't remember the stats, but there's loads of crazy stats on how big a blue whale truly is. So I actually have on my Instagram, there's a life-size one at uh, the London Museum, History Museum in London. Uh, I have a picture of me stood by it and it's a life-size one. It completely dominates the entire room. But no, I think the largest one I ever found was 33 meters. Okay, I'm way off then, but that is still insanely massive. A oh, hundred foot. I don't know the conversion rate to any uh, Americans or whatever. I'm not sure metric to whatever the other one is, but hundred foot, thirty three meters, Sheesh. and just dense. One hundred ten feet, actually. I think. Yeah. So what? Could be even more than that. What happened to the um the way I remember popping in your stream here and there back like you know seven years ago, and I I would see constant people subbing with new accounts with some sort of tortured whale in their name. So, I'm sorry about that, by the way. But, uh, it's fine. Um, it's kind of like uh, a bit of a meme, I guess, in the channel. And obviously, if you create the name, you want it, you want, you want the attention. This is one way you sub for attention. There's nothing wrong with yeah. it, of course, in that situation. Um, but no, you'd I'd have people subscribe and I'd react in a jokey way where some whale was, I don't know, a whale crushed in car crusher or something so i'd react in a way like i'm like i don't want to see the whale get crushed like my my brain thinks of this whale now in a car crusher you know that's kind of what happens you know yeah. i'm really good at like imagining things so now i mean i'm thinking of it now there's some whale being crushed slowly and it just just doesn't really react until the very last moment it just explodes or something. <laughs> sat there all bored and whatnot because they just don't really have an emotion they just swim um the best dead whale name of all time uh, so I've got a feeling that when I restart streaming, there's going to be a whale, whale with topical steroid withdrawal, if you can fit it, <laughs> whale with TSW, that's definitely happening. No. Oh, um, the best whale name of all time, though, is actually from Whale himself, at Terrible Clicks. His name used to be Whale Steamrolled Tail First, yep. and I think that is the best whale name of all time. There was one that was like Whale Flayed and Salted or something, which is pretty good, but I think Whale Steamrolled Tail First, the attention to detail... That is the best whale name of all time. I won't I, say he changed it, but now he has the username Whale, which is just the best name on Twitch, so yeah. I like it. And his prefix is Sit, <laughs> which is just awesome. He has a an emo called Sit Rat, but uh, yeah, he's he's got it nailed names-wise. I think my favorite whale name actually was Whale and Molten Terox. I think uh, that one just I, visually hit sure me. I really want to say he's still active you know i've got a few there's um there was free willy got harpooned uh because when uh well when the kiko the whale that acted for free willy well he actually died of hypothermia but yeah free willy got harpooned 
There was Wales extinct by like 2017, and he keeps changing his name to the next year. I think he's actually sat now on extinct by 2019. He's left it there or something. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, there's one more. I can't... Oh yeah, there was. Um... No, there was one more, but I can't. Remember. I think I'm, I think I'm mixing it with Free Willy or Harpoon. But no, there's <laughs> Wales extinct by an X time. But I still think Wales steamroll tail first is it's the best iconic. dead whale name. Yeah. I don't think anything will beat that either. You'd have to have really good creativity. But again, it is just such a clean name that I don't think you'll beat it. Damn. All right. Um, I'll link you this next one. Why does a man of your stature um, use a zero instead of an O in your name? Is there a backstory? Uh, so the backstory was basically... Um, I used to play RuneScape Private Service back in 2009 and 10, I think. It was around this time where it was... I want to say it was Bounty Hunter era. No, was it? No, 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 definitely not. I had the ancient statuettes when I returned. It was when free trade was removed from the game, basically. I was playing some RuneScape Private Service because all my pures were dead because Bounty Hunter was garbage for pures. And my Zerka was dead because I was in the top bracket of Bounty Hunter because I had 10 summoning for a Gecko or a Lizard, whatever the hell the 10 summoning one was. Uh, so I started playing private servers and I played with one of my friends and we changed the private server and we wanted to make alternate accounts. So I think he had the name Boaty and I had the name Boaty with a zero. Or it was the other way around. I think it was the other way around actually. Um, and this is all named off the Lonely Island song, I'm on a boat. When it came out, we used to just <laughs> listen to that. I think, how old was I at the time? It would have been about 2010. So I was probably about 15, 16-ish around here. Um, but yeah, I went to a private server and we had twin accounts called Boaty and Boaty. I think I had one called I Love Boaty as well, with the zero this was. And then eventually I changed to a different server and I just took the I Love out and I just used the name Boaty with a zero. And then I started making some hybrid videos and my hybriding back then was horrendous if you look at it now. But for the time, it wasn't too bad. I was doing like eight-way switches and six-way switches because I could click decently fast with my like Logitech mouse. It's like a tenner or something. Uh, so it went okay, and then I remember I went back to RuneScape when Free Trade was removed, and I had to use an Amos Famous at the time, but eventually the name Boaty got cleared up and I managed to snipe it. But in all honesty, the name Boaty with an O is taken. It's not me, and the person always gets asked if he's me. It's not. I use the zero just simply because that is how my name looks, and if you type Boaty with a zero and Boaty with an O, I don't know if this is just my brain seeing it that way, but Boaty with the O just looks garbage. Boaty with a zero is just, it's fine. It's annoying though, because my, my email, whenever I master an email, is Boaty at hotmail.co.uk. I'm happy to say that. B, every time someone asks, like, can I get your email? I have to go B, uh, then zero, A for alpha, <laughs> to make sure they do it right, because it's not B-O. And the amount of times that it actually ends up being B-O-A-T-Y instead of B-0 is so annoying. That's the only downside to yeah. it, but... Yeah, yeah that, that, that's it. Uh, the name will never change. It is now B zero forever, and I, I prefer it that way personally. Very cool. Yeah, it's iconic yeah. now. Just the shape of the the words now kind of make it you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm locked in now. Fishing sharks, and yeah, I don't. I just he has the line through it. It looks good. <laughs> okay, we got a bunch of topics from Lopsy, so I'll just cover them all, and then you can answer them in what, whatever order you like. Most memorable chat message. Most memorable chat message you banned. Most tilted you ever got on stream. Top three chatters. Favorite old school update content content wise. Chambers top, etc. And most fun mechanics to master in old school. Oh, okay. Uh, top to bottom. Um, most memorable chat message. Uh, I don't think I know. There's, there's no specific answer to this that I can think of. There might be a really obvious one that I'm missing, but... I don't know. I think I think my favorite messages that come in might be times when people try and link me like KRTM Pigeon or some Swarper song in a specific way that can be quite good. But I'd probably say if I had to find one that's quite memorable, uh, there's a user in my channel called Bjorn. He's one of my mods. And he started off by always typing a Boaty VV followed by a random emoji of something and then followed by some text for what I was ever doing in the game. So an example would be... Um, I would be three tick mining and he'd come in the chat and just type Boaty VV with a pickaxe emoji and then just like in asterisks is three ticks or something like that. And that's just how the VV thing just kind of started in a way. Um, so I think that's quite memorable because it, it's still here to this day, not as much, but that's just kind of where that started. 
I can't really think of a chat message that really stood out. I've actually got an image somewhere of Wooks, Wooks himself typing about your VVMO. <laughs> Could be that. You know, that. That goes up there most definitely. So I don't know. I don't think there's an individual one. I've been shooting 11 years. I've probably read about 5 billion messages. So an individual one that stands out, I can't think of one. Most memorable chat message I banned. I can't think of one on the top of my head, but I was actually watching Torvester's video a while ago where he tries to troll streamers, and I just instantly banned him for saying that he's done chambers or something. And he has a recording of his chat just getting wiped because I just banned him <laughs> straight away, which is pretty good. Uh, most memorable chat message that I have banned, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't really know. And obviously nothing negative it'd be a joke that i banned someone for if it was actually negative and i perm them for a reason then i'm not going to remember them so yeah. i'm not too sure most memorable chat messages i've banned see there isn't a i've not seen four months so again i can't remember yeah. there's got to be one that just stands out or something i don't know there's always one where maybe like i bait the ability to not get banned and i'm looking for like a k kona remote or something <laughs> because the whole meme quotation you can't ban a brother and then they come in and they mistype the, the emote and then I just ban them. That's, they're, they're pretty good, you know. Yeah. Like, it's all going to come in. I'm like, right, type a Boaty VV right now and you're not banned. And then they come in and type B0ATYVV and if that's not the emote. And obviously the text pops up and just gets smited straight away. I think that's some of my favorites to ban, actually. But yeah, just mistypes. It's all, in, all in good fun, really. Uh, most tilted I've ever got on stream. Uh, I'm thinking of a few. I don't get tilted that often, but I remember getting quite annoyed at Modern Warfare. Um, I had quite a bad mindset to play in those games. They used to just genuinely lag to shit. So I'd die to lag. I'd die to combination <laughs> of lag and the opponents actually being better than me. Combine the two together is a one way trip to getting very angry. Um, there was also um, Dark Souls when I played Bloodborne. It was before I realized that Bloodborne is a tough but fair game. So I used to think that the game was pissing me off. It's not the game. It's one of the fairest games out there. It's punishing, but it's fair. I used to get very, very angry at... Oh, what was the NPC called? It was... I want to say it was like Elebrius or something, but I think that's a RuneScape player. It was one of the Bloodborne bosses, and it's a massive one in some like high up place. The camera angles, every time this boss did a lunge, your camera angle had changed. You couldn't see your character for five seconds. Ugh. Pissed me off so much. I can't remember the name of the NPC though, but if I remember, I'll bring it up. And then RuneScape related, I don't get too angry when I play RuneScape most of the time, but I get very frustrated when I PK purely because either I hit shit, it just, it just, it just annoys me. I'm removing that quite well right now because I'm doing Last Man Standing and the amount of fights that I lose where I think I should win i've just taught myself if i win the fight i win the fight and if i lose the fight i lose the fight you know if i splash 30 barrages and lose the fight who cares you know i've lost the fight yeah. it doesn't matter i can, I can be like you yeah, should have won to, i could probably do that to almost every fight ever there's always a reason why you can lose a fight you know if yeah. you even splash one barrage you splash the important freeze you know there's your excuse to why you lost the fight yeah. so i'm removing that a bit um but i got quite annoyed uh on runescape uh pking frustrates me but i wouldn't say um, like tilted that much um I got pretty tilted when I was learning the Chambers of Zeric a while ago. The Chambers was so tilting. When you're learning Chambers, like when you've learned it, you forget this. But when you're trying to learn P3, I want to say, and you get a, a white or acid phase, you get a white pole and an acid trail at the same time, it would always happen. Like 90% of the time you get a white pole, I'd be like, oh, don't give me an acid trail. Boom, acid trail on me. That really annoyed me. But I think the most talent I ever got was during my charity month a while ago, I want to say. I was playing Last Man Standing, the very old Last Man Standing, the Prayer Flick Simulator. And I was playing so well, and it's so long ago, but I was basically in a point where I should basically win every fight. Borderline, you know, it wasn't tribiting, it was just Prayer Flicking. And I had everything to my advantage, sometimes I'm good. And I just couldn't beat anyone. And I, it was the high stakes weekend, actually. And I lost so many games in a row where I genuinely was playing well. And I know this in my heart. It's not me making excuses. <laughs> and I got so annoyed that I just turned my camera off and muted my mic and closed the chat because I was pissed off that much. It never happened before. And then I went and won six games in a row because I was just focusing the game. Everything started to click. I was hitting well. I won six games in a row immediately. And I reopened my chat. And I remember this. Everyone was spamming boaty hearts because I've never <laughs> been so pissed off on stream in my life oh. and the fact that i got pissed off because i was hitting so shit yet playing so well closed everything and i just won six games in a row and made like 100 mil or something like that and i turned the chat back on i was like there we go guys i'm freaking hitting now you know i'm not pissed off anymore i'd say the most tilted i got i think was probably 
I think last man standing. I think I think I banned like sixty three people or something. I don't know. No, I closed the chat. Um, there was a time I banned sixty. Oh no, it was the start of the stream. I baited it and banned sixty three people in a row. <laughs> if you ever get banned in my stream silently and I give you no attention, then there's a little bit of salt somewhere. Somewhere I don't know where, but there's a little bit of salt. If I give you attention and ban you, it's all for fun, basically. Old last man standing was yeah, fucking yeah, awesome, was fun, but awesome. it was insanely difficult for casuals because it was literally like you said, prayer flick simulator. Spark Mac was yeah. really good at it. I was impressed actually with his ability. Yeah, it's perfect simulator, but there was a few things you could do. Like I'd, I'd throw like um, the defensive prayer because Rigor and Orca didn't exist back then. But you'd throw Piety on for their hit for the defense, and then you'd have to smite flick them and maintain zero prayer point loss. Yeah. You could also hybrid with range and mage, or even you can tribrid even at that point, depending on how many points you got. But the new LMS, shout out to Mod Rock, who, for those that don't know or forgot, Mod Rock created the current last man standing in his own time. And in my opinion, it is a fantastic update and I love it. It's the best PvP in the game, in my opinion. I don't mind if it doesn't make me a quotation PK because I don't go to the wilderness. LMS, for playing a video game and having fun, I can have 20, 30 fights at LMS in one hour where there'll be 20, 30 kills plus deaths combined throughout it if i fight someone either i die or they die and then i fight someone else and the thing with pking is i just like to fight someone i like to try bread i don't care about the loot i just enjoy the fight in general and outlast them and lms is that perfectly give me a key plus the upgrades from the other player strategically working out where chests are and where i can catch people in fog there's loads to it i love lms for what it is so a big shout out to mod rock for doing that again always need to give him the appreciation for that the first lms i liked it i was good at it but the new one is just well the new one i get battered by the brits who are just the god tier tribrids but no i love the new element it's fun yeah it's addicting especially if you're burned you die, from the I, game I, just, I i can get annoyed when i die it's fine a little for frustration maybe I've, I've, i think i just have this tight this little bit where i can be a sore loser when i die it's fine i'm not like a super sore loser but when i die I, I always hate losing a fight. It is what it is, you know. Maybe I underperform. Maybe I miss two prayers and they bolt me a 38 twice or barrage me 34 twice. That's very annoying. But end of the day, I look back, I miss the prayers. It's yep. fair, you know, the guy rewarded. Um, but as soon as you die, the portal is right there and I yeah. click it and I'm straight into the next game. Yeah, that's good. All right, top three chatters. Um, If we're going on meme-wise, I think Magic the Blathering needs to go right near the top. <laughs> he comes in with some very... I'm going to have to say high IQ messages. He thinks outside the box and comes in with some really, really good ones at times. So I'd have to say he's right near the top. I don't see him that much anymore. Uh, he's either got a bit busy in real life um, or he's been trapped in the uh, Kesha live stream, which is probably a downgrade. <laughs> he, he hates my music. And then he goes to Kesha's live stream. It's just Dr. Peacock and 190 BPM whacking out there. You know, he'll come back to mine. I'm like playing techno and he's like, this is like Beethoven or something. Uh, I'd say he's up there. Bjorn would be there as well. And then it'd have to be like, I don't know, Amistrules comes out with some good things. You know, we've got Quagga comes in with some good stuff as well. Um, I don't know. There's a lot There's a lot of chatters, really. And then the thing is, I have so many, like, people that always come back that they all blend in with each other. But there's a few ones, I think, that come in with some, like, good messages. I mean, I'll throw it. It's Will. It's Will. He, you know, he's not there often, but he comes in with some good messages here and there, you know. It's what it is, but... I'd say. But no, I think top chatters, I think Magic the Blavings up there, Bjorn's up there, and then third place is up for grabs, really, you know. We miss, um, we used to have a viewer called Jiseku. He'd be right at the top, but unfortunately got arthritis in his hands. I really don't know what he's up to these days, but he used to be in the stream always, constantly there. Probably the best mod we ever had. You know, two days ago, Will raided me uh, after his stream, and I was live in late evening. And you know what he said? I, I mentioned that you're going to be on the podcast and this is what I screenshotted it. This is what he said. You gonna take Ew. that disrespect? Um, I mean, I can't say much right now. Unfortunately, Will's the biggest streamer than me right now. You know, so it's all good. Nah, it's fine. It's all good. That's the thing I like about the RuneScape community, man. Well, who the hell's right? There's a guy above him called Mid Two Hundred and Seven. That guy's going in the cage. He's going after one. <laughs> um, at the RuneScape community, everyone just trolls each other. You know, like at the end of the day, we all know each other. We have this thing where you can sort of trash talk each other in any channel and it's all in just in good faith yeah. banter you know not and taken too far miracle, i think you know some people might not like it um it's just it's all in good fun you know so i mean i i've got some good stories of me being in the world chat but you know i used to spam a fair amount of uh, penises in there before it gets banned on twitch <laughs> yeah, that was a mod in there 
and I refunded all the channel points anyone had ever spent, and he found out it was me. <laughs> and unfortunately, he demodded me. I'm not a mod anymore, but he has like no mods. He has like three mods or something. So I go in, it's just like ASCII penises. No bot either. He's manually getting banned or something. Now, Will's chat is probably one of my absolute favorites. There's absolute carnage in there, and it's so fun to be a part of it, really. It's as long as it's not being taken too far. I remember, I think my rule is do whatever you want in a twitch chat unless you can see the stream is actually maybe a bit frustrated or something with what they're doing at that point that's when you don't want to rub it in because i remember there's a time i was watching will learn challenge modes and he died and i spammed loads of lols and i could tell he was actually kind of frustrated with the death it yeah. happens and i just I, I don't like being that person that's also lolling you know it's not good for the streamer you can't enjoy your stream your chat can bully you all day long quotation bully like, you know all in good faith but when you're actually not enjoying the game and the chat's just against you it's very hard to get yourself in a good mood so yeah my usual rule is i'll, I'll pipe in any chat i'll tag good stuff but if the streamer is actually getting annoyed or frustrated slightly, I ease off and, you know, try and type good things and all that. Yeah. Now, Will's chat, honestly, when I think of a raid, I mean, generally you'll get a raid and it's like nobody talks. You know, it's just like maybe two people. But with a Will raid, the in my entire chat explodes, which is just amazing. It just shows how interactive he is as a streamer. And oh, 100%. Just, He's yeah. right at the top for interaction. And I think he has a really good again connection to his viewers i can't speak on behalf of him again but the viewers everyone likes him he's a great entertainer obviously they're all sat there piping at his ability to play the game and all that which technically we would all happily say is subpar compared to most <laughs> of the people out there don't bother him it's part of his character though again i, I watch and he dies like four times to grotto i think he got the pet now so i won't see that again but he dies like four times to grotto and i'm just there like it's just part of his his uh, stream in a way to be honest so yeah i like it well, no, definitely up there. One of the best interaction, best entertainment. And I always enjoy when he bans someone, you know. I'm, I'm in there. You know, I ban people. I'm just listening to him speak in his, like, monotone voice when he's reading a paragraph. And then he just says, 12 days. Or just, like, enjoy the perm. <laughs> and the guy just gets banned. It makes me laugh so hard. All right. It's my favorite thing for sure. Favorite old school update content-wise? Oh, God. Um... I won't say I won't say hardcore Iron Man, but I enjoyed hardcore for six years, so it would be that. But if we're talking, I don't know if that's content actually. So content wise, favorite update. Um, I think I'm gonna have to go with the Inferno. I'm not the best at the Inferno, um, but the whole concept, I think it's the true test of a good RuneScape player or a great RuneScape player, let's say. If you can get an Inferno cape, I consider that I think that is the sign that you are decent at the game you play. And I always say that if you play RuneScape and RuneScape's the only game that you really do play. If you're intimidated by the Inferno cape, that is, like, if you play, I, I've said this before, but if you play one game, you want to be, kind of be good at that one game in a way, you know, rather than just coasting. I coast quite a bit, but I've been on hardcore for six years, so now I'm playing the end game on the main. Now I can actually start learning the game and getting good again, hopefully. But I think the Inferno is a good test if you're a good player or not. And if you're, like, intimidated by it or anything, yeah, if you go in, you're going to keep dying in the early waves, but you will pick up the information. And the way I see it is if you start the Inferno as kind of a garbage player, you will end the Inferno as a good player. Like, you aren't going to get the Inferno by being trash. You will improve as you do it. Simple as that. Like... I always strive to be good where I can in the game or learn methods when I need to. So for something like the Inferno, if you start it and you're kind of bad at the game, by the time you've got that cape, depending how much it means to you, if you don't really care for the cape and you just want to leave it be because you're not under stress or anything, then fair enough. But if you get it, you will be much better at the game when you finish. Simple as that. You will improve getting the Inferno. You don't have to go in with the skill set to get it day one. Oh, and the confidence you leave. Like, you leave the Inferno after getting your cape and your confidence is just skyrocketed. That is when I could finally just convince myself hey i can actually probably try to learn to flick bandos and zami because it didn't intimidate me because inferno was always the pinnacle of intimidation and then as soon as you do it everything else feels pretty easy yeah it's the thing when you get the inferno that is like the sign that you can go learn everything if you put the effort in simple as that yeah. um if you think the inferno is the end game though good god mate <laughs> there are like i go back to the very start of the podcast there are some people out there who are so disgustingly good at this game. Yeah. I'm not going to go there. Yeah, it's nuts. I'm literally, I'm just thinking about last night, Exact doing his solo Tob runs on a hardcore Ironman 40 defense. The pinnacle. 
pinnacle of the game right now. That is the best the best you can get. He just doesn't mess up, and you don't even anticipate him messing up. You see players where you're like, oh my god, he's going to slip up at any time, and you're tensing. But when you watch exact, you're like, just relaxed. You're like, he's got it. It's fine. Oh, I was still, yeah, it's, it's, it's again, I know him. I, and obviously if I had to place a bet on if he'll get the, the, the solo TLB or not, of course I'm betting on him, yeah. you know? He's ridiculous at the game. Yeah. But even when I watch him, it is kind of, I know he knows what he's doing, but it is scary at times. That's true. Yeah. Um, Ladius and Lake. Lake, by the way, I have to say, whenever when, when I watch Lake do any PVM content, I can relax. I'm just like, you got this. You're just a genius at the game and extremely talented you got this and uh yeah yeah lake is one of those streamers that i really wish was doing better than he is he's doing great but i just think he's kind of slept on in the community i he's one of the absolute best players of all time he's interacting with the chat he's got the energy you know if he has his face cam on he's always smiling as well man I'm i'm a really big fan of lake and there's a lot of streamers that I really wish were doing far better than they are. Not to like do it in a way where I'm saying that they're not doing that well. They're doing great. But Lake, he should be top 20 on Twitch in my opinion, man. I'd love to see him there. Obviously, there's nothing you can do about it. There's strokes of luck here and there. But I'm a huge fan of him, so I'm very biased when I say this. But he deserves a lot more than what he's got, I think, for the, the skill set he's got when it comes to streaming. I agree. Yeah, he is... a oh fucking beast at the game and uh to think back uh what the inferno came out 2017 he was no pillaring and i mean he, he was the first person to no pillar the inferno in 2017 like yes that's insane that was back where i mean people weren't even tile marking the zook safe spots i mean it was early early inferno that's just nuts to me yeah i just remember when he did it he he died on wave 66 on his initial run because he uh forgot to use pray range or forgot to pray completely and just died because the thing is like the mages hit so low that he didn't realize and then suddenly they hit high you know when your health bar just drops suddenly you know you've done something <laughs> yeah. wrong he had the mage bar off for so long and they hit like twos and threes and zeros and it suddenly was like a 40 and a 30 and then you realize you're like oh shit you know at that point you can't heal back up but i remember that on the first run through i think everyone remembers that Day one of the Inferno was so sick on Twitch. You know what's really funny is like, I mean, I've I've uh, gotten my Zuck helmet now, but back in the day, day one of the Inferno, I promised myself mentally, I was like, I'm never gonna enter the Inferno. That looks like total hell and just awful. It looks so difficult. And, and but I remember I would have like five streams open: yours, Zulu, V the Victim, um. Wooks, of course. Who else was doing it? It was like way up there. Everyone, everyone was doing it. I just remember the amount of my favorite one there was where people would sacrifice their fire cape immediately for the new content, and then within ten minutes they were like, "Yep, that gives them on fire cape." I'll never get that cape because they obviously all wanted to do the inferno. Yeah. Cat didn't realize the difficulty. Go in is get bought by like wave seven or something like that, and then you threw in the sound. But going back to what I said, I think if you want to try and get the inferno cape, if you don't have the skill set, you can get the skill set while learning. It's just going to cost you a lot of supplies. It just depends if you want to deal with the frustration or not, because it will be there. It is, it's punishing. You know, you make one bad decision, you lose the whole run, an hour and a half's gone, and you're just kicking yourself, really. That can happen four times in the same day. Mm -hmm. And then you get it, though, and then all of that depression that you were experiencing of dying and having to reset, it just all washes away. It just doesn't even matter. You got your cape. You're chilling. Yep, that's exactly how it goes, yeah. Yeah. All right, his uh, Lopsy's last question was, most fun mechanics to master in old school? Um, I mean, I don't know what mechanics I've actually mastered. I'd probably have to say, I think I've mastered Grador. I think I know almost everything about Grador. There's a couple of, well, apart from like the both methods, but melee-wise, the only thing I've not truly mastered, I guess, would be the red click methods uh, with melee, but they're not really too important. I think Grador and Zilliana, I really enjoyed those because I learned those back in 2015, and it was like... I think it was 2015. It might be even earlier than that, actually. But you just felt like such a beast of the game because this is back before all the gods just popped up, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was prayer flicking those, no one else was really doing it. So I was streaming myself, prayer flicking Zilly. I'd walk in with a full inventory of stamina potions and range potions and bones to peaches. And everyone's like, where the hell's your food? And I'd go in and prayer flick everything by off-ticking. I just felt like such a beast back then. Oh, yeah. uh, I enjoyed those. I think my answer to the question would be... 
I think it's either Grado or Zilliana. Um, PKing is very fun. I'm relearning PKing right now. I'm in the position where I don't know if I should learn bottom switching because bottom switching is very efficient, let's just say. Um, when it comes to the most competitive aspect of the game, you might want that. But I think as well, if I continue how I'm doing, muscle memory picks up and should allow me to do most. I just think like no matter how good I got with top switching, I could still get destroyed by someone doing bottom switching because they just have this advantage of bottom switching. So I don't know yet. But PKing is always fun to learn. I think, though, the answer would be Bandos and Zilliana because I did them back in 2015. And no one really did it, so I just felt like really good at the game when I was doing it, streaming it as well. So fun to learn as well because it's not too punishing though. Like when I learned Solo Alm, my favorite fight in the game, but Solo Alm is not fun to learn. It's so annoying, so frustrating. Yeah, but then when you learn Solo Alm like proficiently, it's so addicting. It's so rhythmic. So fun. I wish like because you have to grind the whole chamber to get there. Yeah. Um, so you have to go do all that. It's just fine because I I like vanguards. When I was learning vanguards in challenge mode, that was really fun to learn as well because they came up on these rhythms of like certain ways to kill them, and you have to try it fast and all that beautiful fight. Perfect vanguards in uh challenge mode are so clean to watch i remember watching lake do it once and he just did like borderline perfect vanguards and lake it's just is, it's clean yeah. room lake is so lake good is at vanguard so good. he'll pop in with 20 hp and just redemption the entire thing and just be living off one prayer point yeah. that's kind of like i consider myself to be pretty good at the game i'm happy to say that i'm quite good but there are the players out there that just make me look garbage <laughs> simple as that like and lake is just one of them it doesn't bother me it's motivating really yeah. motivating to know yeah. how much better i can get over time you know i feel like if you were the best at the game and there's nothing to improve at what do you do you know i feel like with pvp i honestly don't think the ceiling of pvp has been hit yet i still think we have a disgusting level to go that don't know when it'll be done but there's just an infinite amount of things you can do in pvp really so i'm excited i don't know if we'll ever hit there but soon some people might just get to this highest peak of PvP and just become just, just horrible. You know, I fought the bots, the bots in LMS. Kind of in a way, the Megatrons, they, they literally would teleport around you and just do switches all over the place. I consider it humanly possible to do that. It just would take an outrageous amount of practice, muscle memory, and you can't drag any items or misclick. So human error taken into account, very tough. But if you could learn to PK like those Megatrons effectively, like using some like rhythm or algorithm of how the other player works. Oh, freaking beautiful. I loved like fighting those. It's annoying because you lose, but they were artistic to fight. <laughs> yeah, I uh, remember watching that Sir Pugger video of the Terminator out in the wilderness that would just fully automated, just hunt people down and kill them, guaranteed. Like pull off those one tick TVs and everything. And uh, But the thing about those bots, I wonder if those terminators can almost predict prayers because i know a lot of like the super op lms bots just rely on whatever you're showing and then they'll pray to that the very next tick but i mean you can always do zero tick hits against things i wonder if those ais will start pick start to like kind of pick up how you pk and start using like artificial intelligence to like predict what you're about to do yeah. yeah, that's the only part where if I was to fight a bot in LMS in a major range fight, let's just say the Terminator, realistically, if I was clicking well, I could get every attack correct because obviously if I zero tick, they're going to do it right. Yep. That's the only time when fighting a human, it's like a game of rock, paper, scissors when it comes to the major range battle. And you can sometimes look at the player and work out what they might do, but it's very hard to actually do it most of the time. I like There's ways where... If the player has like protect from range up, I'm gonna want to barrage, but then they just stick on the mage power on the fifth tick and I barrage them on mage and they go back and all that. They're kind of baiting me into doing it. So it can get really difficult to doing it. It's one of my weakest sides. Sometimes I go and I dominate the major range fight. Other time I get everything wrong. This is walking into everything they're trying to do to me. So Or you're up against somebody up so against somebody. bad that like you literally are trying to fake them out, but they are so bad that they're actually calling all of your fakes because they're just so slow and you're like, holy like this is painful. You can normally adapt to that. One thing I do in PvP is that you like I think everyone PKs their best in the first 30, 40 seconds of a fight. Once they eat, that momentum's gone. Oh, so yeah. you can judge a fight normally around that, but I there's a fight, I've got it in my video where I fight this dude and he never prays mage. So halfway through the fight I adapt to that. I just barrage him like nine times in a row and he doesn't change to pray mage and I just destroy them because every barrage hit as well. Because you can do that. The thing about yep. PvP is you can do that and splash all nine barrages. And it's just like, oh, there goes all my DPS. That's the most annoying thing for this. But in this exact clip, I literally say, oh, this guy don't pray mage. I'm going to kill him a barrage. And all barrages <laughs> started maxing straight away. So I look like a god. 
Okay, Sonofish asks, thoughts on Mainscape versus Ironscape? Going further, what are your opinions regarding the main meta becoming increasingly more reliant on alting? Um, so, uh, let me... Mainscape versus Ironscape. So Mainscape, I'll say straight away, um, main meta becoming increasingly more reliant on alting. Again, you're blinded by this word meta. You're blinded by this efficiency, you know? You don't have to be efficient. You're playing RuneScape. It's a video game. Play it the way you want. So with me, I don't plan to alt any of my PVM for pets, except for maybe Corporeal Beast. I think I might boost that, but other than that, and maybe for Shani before the teleport. Other than that, I don't mind. I'll happily go to the bank and spend 25 minutes getting kill count. It doesn't bother me. In this time, I'm still playing the game and I'm enjoying that, you know? I think there's people are just trying to rush to get things done because they might want to get stuff done in life. You can always say that obviously I'm, quotation, paid to play the game, so it doesn't matter, but I'm not a fan of playing RuneScape on two accounts at once, really. Yeah. Um, I did recently do a grind on my video that required an alt to do it a specific way. There are certain um, times that I do happily use an alt, but most of the things in the game no that i could use an alt for no i'll just use one account it doesn't bother me i don't mind if it's inefficient compared to somebody using like a spec trading all or trading an inventory of stuff over i don't mind downtime at all downtime just allows me to chill out a bit i'm still playing the game at the end of the day um so no i don't think uh i don't really well no i don't know i don't mind i don't play to that level i don't play for that efficiency i just play for me i play for me and i enjoy the game so i don't really need to bother with the alting as for ironscape i completely despise genuinely despise how the game is catered to iron man i really don't like that obviously i've played iron man since well before it existed i played self-sufficient i have hated every update that catered to iron man not hated but i've disliked them i enjoyed iron man like it's a bit more of a tedious grind to say it's easier said than done but i liked iron man when you had to sort of uh, create battle staffs for crafting. You made bank from that. It was great money and all that. It took ages, but nowadays you go mine sandstone and break it down for billions of sand, and then you can get giant seaweed and all that stuff. Some of the updates make sense, but that's a bad example because I do think that's actually quite good in the game. But I just think monster drops and all that, they made the Iron Man mode a lot easier over time. Yeah. I wasn't a fan. I kind of like Iron Man to be self-sufficient for half the stuff. Obviously it takes longer, but going back to what I said, I'm not following an efficient path. I'm just playing the game. And if playing the game means I've got to go pick a thousand flax or something, it doesn't bother me. I'll enjoy that 1,000 flax just as much as I would enjoy something else realistically. That's just how I see the game anyway. So I don't know. But no, I'm not a fan of how the game caters to Iron Man. Not a huge fan of how it caters to mobile, but I don't really care for that. And then as for Mainscape, I, I don't think you need an alt. Just play the game. doesn't matter. If you're inefficient compared to the guy using the alt, ask yourself the question, are you having fun? And if you're not having fun because this guy's doing it faster than you, then you're playing, you know, like you're thinking about someone else and what they're achieving. You should be doing what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the monster drop tables were the biggest problem because I love Iron Man. I, I love doing the little skill and grinds. And I actually really love like early iron man where you had to like hop charters and stealing that one gem oh, that, from that, the that one grind. i freaking hated the touch <laughs> so, because it was obviously it. they made the um the giant seaweed uh and the sandstone they're good updates i like them but i do think the kate's iron man whatever they're good in the game it's whatever yeah. yeah but if it replaces that charter boat method that method sucked like i despise <laughs> that method you know i'd rather have I don't know what I did initially. I think I no, I manually filled buckets of sand at Yanil. I enjoyed that because it's self-sufficient getting my own sand in a way. Yeah. And oh, I want to say I picked my seaweed at Piscatoris <laughs> or something stupid like that. But I, I don't know. The concepts of that, I just like using the game terrain to get stuff, basically. Yeah. So that's how I see that. But that's that charter boat method garbage like <laughs> despise it. It's so boring. It became awful when you're competing with like 10 other irons on the world. You're just you just keep you're trying i would be that guy that's trying to coordinate with like five other people because i'd hop into them and i'm like hey man can you take these 20 worlds i'll take these 20 and they just wouldn't listen they would just start hopping every world again they'd be like yeah, yeah, yeah man i'll do that and then like you know you go back to your zero stock worlds again and you're like oh my god yeah i did that grind the one of my hardcores i can't remember which but I remember the worlds being very annoying as well. Because I guess the initial thing, when I did Peckish Whale, this is before Iron Man, so the, um, I actually went through, you buy buckets of sand and shit from the charter boat in Port Kazard, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And back when I did Peckish Whale, there was no Iron Man, so I had to full stock every single world, so I had the max efficiency when doing that. And then I redid it, and I had to buy them from Catherby or something, so... 
Yeah. It was that. I but love no, that the, the, the ch- chat about method of hopping was just. I did it on one of my accounts. I wasn't a fan. One of the few grinds I th- I would never do it again, but one of the few grinds that I don't really enjoy. I think part of it was uh, I would watch DVS a lot on YouTube when with his hardcore series, and I was always a little bit behind him, and so I would see him doing his next grinds. I'm like, ooh, like he's trying to get 85 crafting for a Fury doing this charter method, and I had just never done these things. It was my first time on an iron, and it just excited me. So I didn't see the dread in it. I was just like, ooh, I'm at this point. Like I'm at where he is, so it was cool. But yeah, it was, you know what the biggest uh, um, annoyance of that was, was I was in a clan and whenever you hop worlds, you just miss a bunch of messages. And so you're lost in the conversation. That was the biggest annoyance, in my opinion. What is that for the chat about hopping? Yeah, just hopping worlds nonstop. You just can't even keep up with conversations because I, I wasn't a content creator at the time. So I relied on my DMs in game to chat to people. And so when people are sending you messages and then it says oh they can't send you a message because you're in the middle of hopping that was annoying yeah private offer that grand in all honesty i did it when i was when i was buying battle staffs on peckish whale for the crafting ground when i did it uh just private offer that because otherwise you know you can't really talk to anyone you know what i want to ask you about pure essence mining because i feel like you're like the one <laughs> unique individual that it that genuinely enjoys the traditional room crafting where you go mine your pure essence and you go use it at a traditional altar Do you have any yeah it goes back to what i mentioned though about the whole self-sufficiency of iron man i have to mine my own essence it seems the right way to get it in the game is i go get it from its resource so one of my favorite grinds i ever did in this game was on peckish whale my amulet of fury to get the onyx, I mined 16,000 or whatever pure essence, runecrafted them into death runes, and sold them for Tockle to buy my onyx. And I loved that grind. I just think the whole concept, I did it for Mage Training Arena as well, but that Fiori grind of how unique I did it, really, really enjoyed that grind. But no, I mined 200,000 pure essence on Peckish Whale, um, <laughs> which I think was about 120 hours of mining essence. So it's not that bad if you think about it on the terms of RuneScape grinding. That's true. Uh, I do remember one night I mined them for 18 hours straight, though. And it's one of the very few times I think I actually got a headache from playing this game. Very rarely do I get headache or wrist pain. I always stretch my wrist, but very rarely. I mined them for 18 hours straight. And, yeah, I logged off at, like, 4 in the morning because my head started hurting. <laughs> that was me at Guardians of the Rift. Right when it came out, I was so obsessed with getting that outfit as quick as possible, and I was staying up like way too late, and I was getting headaches. But I was like, I need to get this outfit to make some I videos. Really enjoyed my Guardians of the Rift grind. It's fun. They fun nailed one. that. Perfect. I'm dead. Nothing I'd say was wrong with it. Yeah, it was. I'm very surprised because you don't. It kept true to the traditional room crafting because you're going to the traditional altars. And then on top of that, somehow they made it not annoying and they made it somehow fun and exciting. I don't know how they did yeah, that. Yeah, my, my favorite thing about it, though, is um, that I'd say almost every single account has to or should do that because of the colossal pouch you have to get from there as the drop. And also the rune crafting outfit as well is probably worth doing. They brought the price of runes down, but I think most runes are basically store price these days anyway blood runes are obviously a bit weird because of the whole iron man iron men are still after blood runes or something of some kind mm-hmm. um but that's what i like is if you want to get rune crafting up it's worth going to get that pouch and playing that mini game so you can go there to improve rune crafting outside of that mini game because obviously they had rune span rune span was so much experience you wouldn't ever rune craft through never again pre oc this was you just rune craft that to 99 this one you can go guardians of the rift for i don't know 30 hours if you want roughly and get the outfit and the colossal pouch and then never return but it's worth going there for a bit on every account yeah and you can just do it so early on because you don't even need essence it initially was proposed that you would need pure essence to do it but now it's just get the level and you're just there forever yeah i think that i i've obviously not seen the concept of that vision with the pure essence but again i think they nailed the update i think it was basically perfect so I'm pretty happy they changed it from whatever they had, so it's quite nice to know that they nailed that one. Yeah, it gives me hope for more mini games. I was actually like really against mini games a few years ago, like turning mini games into the skills, but now I'm kind of like you're nailing it because you're benefiting the entire skill. It's not just you do this for the skill. Cool. Yeah, exactly. I'm not done Temporos, and I think Winter Toad isn't too real needed, but though this runecrafting mini game was brilliant. Okay, Amy has a question. 
She asks, what is your thoughts on a new skill in OSRS? What do you think would fit into the game? A uh, new skill? I'm not bothered by a new skill, personally. Um, I don't want to see Dungeoneering. A lot of people keep asking for it, but I think Dungeoneering, copy and pasted, even though it's great, I think there's a lot of nostalgia to the reason why people want it. I'd rather have something fresh. As far as I'm aware, I don't really think we'll get any new skill. I don't think they'll ever pass a poll. The only exception I think would pass a poll would be sailing if they actually remastered the skill and created it to actually be a really good skill. There's loads of concepts you can do with sailing. I've had tons of ideas I've thrown around on my stream as well. Um, but no, I voted no for artisan, I think the skill was. Or was it invention? No, what was it? What it was, was the art. skill they released? Oh, warding. Warding. Yeah. yeah, I voted no for that. I'll happily admit that. I didn't want to see it in the game. I didn't want to do it. So I just voted no. Again, when it comes to the RuneScape poll, if you want to see an update, you should always vote yes for it. If you don't want an update, you should vote no for it. Uh, you shouldn't really take anyone else's opinion on it. The only exception is the PvP updates. That one's, that's a bit weird, that, because I'm going to guess most people vote no because they don't want to see the PvP updates. So that, those that they should change. I think PvP updates should change slightly. But for anything else in the game, if you don't want to see a new boss or anything, just, just vote no. If you want to see the new boss, if you like the idea, vote yes. Don't you go, you know, most people go to their favorite streamer and the favorite streamer will be like, yeah, do this, do that. And you just copy them. Depends though as well, if you actually go to someone who kind of knows the game, because obviously if you've got 300 hours on RuneScape and you're voting, you might not be voting correctly for the bulk of the game. Yeah. Okay, here's a question from, a few questions from Nick. He asks, he's a mod in your stream, isn't he? Yes, he is. Unique. He's potted recently as well, so his yeah. stream's been growing quite nicely. Again, it's similar to the um, the Zulu rig uh, uh, Jace kind of streams. I've been watching like Quinique's grew a bit with like Tasty and Zoe Pancakes yeah. and those, and I think they're all doing quite well. It's kind of really refreshing seeing that group do similar to what I watched five years ago. I think all of well, those three I've mentioned, that all three of them will be doing really well on Twitch. Um, a year from now, two years from now, I think they'll all be doing really, really well yeah they nailed it uh I, it's so cool to see like the new generation growing it's cool that streaming is still a thing that you could do in 2022 because it it always feels like every year it's like ah oh, it's too late to start but no i mean it, it keeps happening so people people have asked me the question it's too lot to too late to start streaming on youtube since like 2015 <laughs> and there's always a new name look yep. at runescape for example you want to rewind the clock i was the biggest runescape streamer in 2014 during my um Wamanami days and then along came, well, Gross Score did quite well at the time. Spartamac was doing well. And then along came Ice Poseidon. And then along came Oda Block. And then Maximus Black came over. There's always, I mean, Maximus Black was obviously quite established, but there's always a new name that will pop up at some point who started streaming recently, you know? It's never too late. If you think, going back to what I mentioned before, you've got the enthusiasm, the passion, the gameplay. Give it a go. You never know. There's nothing really to lose from it. If streaming's simply not for you, like I know as Osiris, Osiris, I, I he's a fantastic player as well. I'd love to watch his gameplay, but he's just not interested in streaming. Mm -hmm. Sucks. I really want to watch him play, but yeah, no, give it a go. If you think it's something that you might be interested in, you can try it. You can always abandon it um, if you don't enjoy it. But no, I think the whole, is it too late to start streaming? In the RuneScape category, I don't think it will ever be too late. The RuneScape category is so tight-knit. Everyone's like closely known in a way obviously if you've just started you might not be at that level yet but you can get there quite easily runescape streamers we all help each other grow in a way all i think most of us want to do is see runescape as a game just grow and grow and grow it's a game we've played our entire lives it's a game i don't really think will ever die truly i think it'll always be interesting to watch yeah absolutely okay nick asks what was your breakthrough moment when you first started creating content did you start creating content with the idea that it would become what it has today? When when you did your love for Techno House ED, when did your love oh he added it. When did your love for Techno House EDM really start and what or who influenced that and DJ Stream win? Uh okay, when was my breakthrough moment? So I've been making content for I made content on private servers and then when I went to old school initially, um my tribriding, I was doing like five way switches with Helm Takeoff. This is back when you'd five tick a barrage, like you'd hit with a DCME or four tick even. You'd hit with a DCME, I was sixty attack, and then I'd start my switch. So in the time of hitting with a DCME, I'd do a five way switch, take my helmet off, and then cast a barrage. People had never seen things like that. <laughs> Most breeding was like four way switches or something. So I was like, what the hell is this guy? Damn. So I grew a bit from that via Zybez. I used to post some of my PK videos on the Zybez community back in the day. 
And I got myself to around like 10,000 subs, I think. I did a series called Road to 1,000 Likes. I did a 10 mil nuke challenge. Uh, I did Road to a 25 kill streak. All these little stuff. I was doing RuneScape series. Like, I think like, I, I really can't remember, but there wasn't really many RuneScape series back in the day. It was like RuneScape Gods Exposed and then like Rune Sharks from Scratch Corp and then God Wars from Scratch. And then I came and I don't think there was PK series off the top of my head. So I did a load of PK series where I went for a 25 kill streak and stuff. So I grew a bit there. But the breakthrough for me was most definitely um, One Man Army series that I created. Before that, it would be when I sold Fight Kilns. I used to have like 2,000 viewers back in 2012 or something watching me do Fight Kilns. Um, but no, One Man Army was by far my breakthrough. Very cool. Okay, did you start creating with the idea that it would become what it has today? I don't think anybody could have seen what content creation no. was. streaming. So much luck in content creation that you should never bank on getting anywhere. You should start um, creation, and if you enjoy it, you continue. Simple as that. But you should never expect anything. If you expect something, you're going to make streaming hard for yourself, YouTube hard for yourself. Just enjoy it. See what it gets you. And obviously, once it starts growing, realize that everything that you're getting through the growth, treat that as a bonus. You know, I go live every day. Well, not at the moment, but normally I go live every day with the whole reason the same reason I turned my stream on for the first time, just to have fun with everyone and everything else is a bonus, you know. Obviously now I'm a bit more obligated because it's now a full-time career, but I never go live, you know, thinking, right, let's try and make a hundred pound in donations today or something. I just go live to have fun. And if I get a hundred pound donation, fair enough. Thank you very much to that generous person. So that's how I do that. Don't think anyone should ever consider their content to go anywhere. Particularly going back to what I said, if you're unique or different on YouTube, for the whole purpose to try and grow, you still should not expect to grow. You know, I think you should just do it because you want to do that. And if it is unique, always have that hope at the back. I mean, even with hope, maybe you don't want the hope at all. I think you should just do it because you enjoy it. And if it suddenly all starts coming around and, you know, you're getting stuff from it, congratulations. Probably well deserved in that uh, case. Yeah. No, that's totally true. I love, I love YouTube right now because it is just a project. I don't even think about the ad revenue. I'm not sponsored or anything. So it's just like, it's just a project and I have zero stress from it. That is the beauty of it. Streaming, I get a little bit stressed because I am a full-time content creator. So that has always given me a tiny bit of stress ever since I, you know, quit any other rep, any other source of revenue that was coming in. But um, yeah, yeah, it's a lot know, nicer. It's when you take the step. But if we go back to that question I answered before of like streaming being hard, it, at the end of the day, I think it's easy. I wouldn't use the word hard oh, it's for so it. Easy. It's You're obviously right. it can be there. Because if you've got bills to pay and all that stuff, particularly with now inflation going up crazy in UK, we're expecting 10% or something. Uh, inflation's going up, living costs are going up, but all, all stream revenue is going down because Twitch are about to cut people that are on 70, 30, 70, 30 yeah. So 50, 50, it might be the same, but technically stream revenue is all going down as well. So yeah. living costs up, stream revenue down. In all honesty, in a couple of years from now, it's going to be pretty upsetting to see who pe which people left streaming in order to pursue something that's more you know secure streaming and youtube if anyone's watching this and might want to be a streamer from what i'm saying remember there's no job security there's no sick pay none of that i wish there was sick pay i needed that but there's no <laughs> yeah. security if you if you stream and like this is the thing that scares me the most of people that stream let's say month to month and they've done, done it for like five or six years but they don't really have too much to show for it let's just say and then let's just say streaming dies for them and they've suddenly aged seven years with no experience in any job. I'm like, well, what do you do at this point, you know? Because I think with me streaming, there's no job I could think of I'd enjoy more than streaming. So no matter what, I'm going to get a downgrade probably in every aspect ever. I'm, again, I'm, I'm including, I know what I want to do and all that, but since the time started of me streaming, 20, let's just say 20 years old, I dropped out of uni, I've got my A-levels behind me and that's it and I'm 27 years old. If I'm applying for a job, almost every other applicant I think is going to be better unless they want someone who can, I know, speak, speak fluently or something, you know, talk about random stuff. <laughs> but that's the cool thing is like your eyes have been opened. I mean, there are so many opportunities online for any sort of pursuit that you're into. It doesn't have to always be the nine to five job. Like, it, I don't know. I, I see this like even streaming and making YouTube, I feel like I've honestly developed more skills with talking to people, with learning how to edit simply, with learning how to just do stuff. I feel like I've honestly learned more just for real life doing stuff on my own, making my own projects than I would have just 
I don't know, going to school without really having a vision. And of course, if you go to school, like having a vision, knowing what you're going to do, of course, that's a different story. But there are benefits and you do learn things by streaming or making videos. Oh, yeah. Communicating for sure. I remember when I did um, all my interviews for university and I completely dominated my interview because I was so used to speaking to a microphone that I knew how to speak on the spot already. So when I went in, I was like 17 or 18 years old or something. No, probably 19 or 20, I think. Go in, I'm making eye contact with a guy talking to me. I've got my hand movements going on and all that. And everything I'm seeing is not just gibberish, but I'm flowing it like I'm talking to a microphone. Yeah. So I'm taking those, like I'm speaking now, I take those breaks, you know, I put the, 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 the emphasis on specific words or something. I know what I'm going to say. And I think that gave me an advantage over most people because the other people like might recite in front of a mirror, like in the Sims or something. I don't know if that's a real thing. For me, <laughs> I didn't need to recite anything. I just spoke to the microphone already. I had that speech, the ability to just talk on the spot already developed through live streaming. So when I did my interviews, I was so confident for them because I already knew what I was doing. Yeah, that's dope. Um, I wanted, well, actually I'm, I'm seeing some topics on here. There's quite a few, but people are asking like, what would you have done if it wasn't for content creation? Did you have like a vision of kind of where you wanted to have a career or what? Uh, it's really hard to say. I was at university for accounting. Uh, I'm good with math. Um, so accounting was something I think I would have been successful for. If you do well in accounting, it's decent pay. So you can kind of get a decent life for yourself, your family, whenever you get to there. Obviously you're talking like 30, 30 to 40 years where some of the stuff starts happening. So it's kind of a safe route really. Accounting is obviously a very popular degree to go for and it can get you into many different things. Um, so had I gone through that degree, it depends because the reason I pursued streaming is I was earning the same streaming in university part time as I would, in my opinion, when I would have graduated. Um, sorry, when I got a job like 10 years down the line at the age of 30, I was earning <laughs> like 50,000 pounds a year streaming part time on Twitch. And I thought maybe I'll be paid 50 grand by the time I'm 30 with accounting, maybe a bit more than that. I'm not too sure. And that's why I've decided to pursue streaming instead of that so that's where i think i would have gone but i also don't know if i would have i never quit content creation when i went to uni so if i'd have maintained it throughout the entirety of university and i would have done it with the motivation to pay off uh some of my not student loans my course that i was almost actually a paid course sponsored i didn't have student loans but like maintenance so if i streamed the whole time when i graduated with a 2-1 twitch would have obviously been where twitch is now which means it would have been way more likely that I could have pursued it full time, depending obviously, again, butterfly effect, my channel could have just fell off and died completely. But if it was still there, that's the perfect time to pursue full time streaming. If you're doing streaming parallel or simultaneously to like getting a degree, if it's going somewhere and you're making a bit of money from it, when you get your degree, pursue streaming for four, five, six months or something, give it a go and you might as well. You've got the degree to fall back on and there's nothing wrong with you spending six months trying to stream. Just the only thing I'd say there is don't lock yourself in streaming all day, every day, because you still have some life to live, you know? Yeah. I think to Coxie, I think Coxie nailed it. He graduated with his bachelor's and something and then he just pursued streaming because it was going so well and now he does have a fallback, you know, but his streams are just booming, so... Yeah, that's with me. I don't have a fallback. I have A-levels. So that's why when I pursued it, although when I pursued it, I pursued it when I was like 21. So if it didn't work, I, you can just go back to university or what's known as a mature course. I've done all my research on that. You go back to uni when you're like 25. And if you think that's weird, because most people at uni will be, I don't know, 18 to 21 maybe. It's not a problem. You know, people at university, all different ages. You might not fit in as well, but that wouldn't bother me really. I would have just gone back. So that's why I did. I had my backup just in case. I just never actually needed to use it. And nowadays I've got, I understand what I want to do as well after streaming. Uh, and so if the day comes when streaming ends, which I thought it would with Article 13, I know exactly what I want to go off and do, which again is a nice peace of mind while I'm actually streaming. But no, again, if Coxie, I, I know a few people have done it. They get the degree. And then they pursue streaming. It doesn't work for everyone. If you ever attempt it and streaming just doesn't work for you, just remember there's a lot of luck involved and there's a lot of streamers out there. You have to kind of put yourself at a point where why are people going to watch you over other people? It's pretty tough to do that, but almost everyone can do it. If you put the time in, you will get your core audience. Anyone listening to this now that streams, you know you've got your core audience to watch you almost every single time you're live. And that's something you should never take for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, going back to Nick's questions, he asks, when did your love for techno house slash EDM really start and what or who influenced that? 
So it's interesting. I've always listened to electronic music, but in all honesty, I got into electronic music from the song Chasing Status Eastern Jam. It was on the outro of one of Gigolo J's PK videos. I can't remember exactly which one, but it plays like 25 seconds of the song. This was like 2011 or 12, maybe. I'm not sure. But this put me on the dubstep phase before Skrillex was mainstream. Because I remember we were listening to Skrillex at school when he had like no views on the songs like Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites and Kill Everybody and those. Um... But I listened to dubstep and I listened to drum and bass. But then I've now, I, I listened to grime as well. I used to smash Devlin's Tale from the Crypt and Bud Sweat and Beers, I think. I used to smash that and SBTV freestyles and all that. But again, before Ed Sheeran was massive, I had the whole Ed Sheeran and example by the Nandos or something. I had that on my playlist. So music taste has changed a lot. But eventually I got away from the grime and I was back on my hard style and trance because again RuneScape hard style you get you get from Jad videos back in the day you know I think you had like I think his name was like Lapin Poika 2 and there was another dude I can't remember his name but he was really known for doing Jad's the Murder 21 I think his name was hard style all the time even Wooks hard style in the videos so I've always been electronic really as for techno house and EDM um my edm i guess started when chase and status released no more idols like three months after i got into them and that album was incredible it's one of the best albums i think released it's literally all good songs and then they did the no more idols tour and i witnessed them live um i went with my brother i was like 15 or something i was at chase and status live and it was the best thing i just remember when oh it was no they opened with the song chase and status no problem and there's like a little breakdown at the start after the vocals and they synchronized the strobe lights to that. And it was the first time I'd ever experienced music live. I might've seen Hollywood and Dead actually around this point because I'd seen them live as well and Escape the Fate supported. Wasn't really a fan of that. But then this is the first time witnessing EDM live and that that is, I can't explain it, but that is scarred into my mind of those strobe lights going off on the beats of No Problem. It's one of my favorite drum and bass songs for that moment. Anytime I hear it, I think of that moment. And I remember as well from the same night when um, Hype is Hype played and Temper T actually came out on the stage during Hype is Hype. I don't know if that's a common thing, but that got me into the drum and bass. As for the techno, one of my viewers actually, I, I take some requests uh, in donations and one of my viewers donated me some tech house and I think the song was Do You Feel Me by Dosem. He's linked me that, and it's a pretty, you know, textbook tech house song. Really good, really good build-up. And the build-up kind of gave me those vibes where every time I listen to a song, I kind of think, how good would this song be live? You know, what would happen? What, what would the stage be like? What would the strobe lights be like? All that stuff. And that's what I like the most about music. It gets me into it a lot. But that was a tech house song, and I loved it. So I tried to find more songs like that. And I ended up coming across a song which is called Alone by Kristoff. And it was the Marco Resman remix of Alone. And that song was where I really started to understand techno. So a tech house, I don't even know if tech house, I'm not sure. But that song was just so, I'll use the term artistic. It was like a, it's one of those songs where it has like a journey inside it. It's a brilliant song. Kristoff Alone, Marco Resman remix, if anybody's interested. As for techno, uh, eventually I, I put a tweet out asking recommendations for techno sets because I listened to um, Deborah DeLuca's uh, Circle set and also Boris Brescia's uh, Fountain de Bleu Circle set, and I loved them both. So I put tweets out saying, uh, anyone got music like this? And then someone, I listened to, my, I remember listening to that Boris set like three times in like two days because it was that good. It's rare I find a set that good, but Dax J just had the Closed Awakenings 22. I've listened to the Dax J Awakening set closing probably about 30 times since it released, and I think it released a month ago, something like that. I consider that probably the best set on YouTube right now. It's utterly ridiculous. It does not stop the whole way through, and it's just, it's not the best stream music, but it's just so much energy in that set. I was just playing that at three in the morning to keep myself up till five. Oh, that's But so no, cool. I just did that. I, I got into Boris through the circle set and some viewer recommendations. And then other than that, I went and just saw some techno live. Um, I think the first techno I saw live was Nine Nines and Kanda, uh, heavy techno. So I've seen Boris before, but heavy techno was like Nine Nines and Kanda. So if anyone knows techno, they know exactly what I walked into. And that was apps. I mean, I, I saw Nine Nines and they were okay. And I was like, I didn't know who these Kanda people were. And Kanda played some set, which I'd still say today is probably 
probably one of the best sets I've still ever listened to. It was just absolutely ridiculous start to finish. Completely relentless, but I'd never experienced techno on like the 150 BPM level at that point. And it was in a good club, good sound system and all that stuff. I'm actually like, I've been a massive fan of Kanda. I'm actually friends with the, um, the well, they used to be a duo, a bit off topic, but they used to be a duo. They recently split up, but I'm actually friends with them now. And it's really weird because they're our label DJs, which is a prestigious label to be on. And yet I'm technically just friends with them. I find that so strange being into techno. That's but bad. no, I think, I think, yeah, just listening to the production and going to see some people live. Uh, I've seen Clan Coenzel. I've seen so many artists now, live now. I won't go into them, but... If anyone actually wants to get into techno uh, live, I honestly recommend Dax J to almost anybody if he plays locally to anyone. His sets are pretty heavy, but they have this vibe where it's just, it's still entry level. It's just great music to dance to. Because if you saw someone like, let's say, Paula Temple or Rebecca, they're amazing. Rebecca's incredible, but they play heavy techno and it might not be the best. But Dax J is just a party every single time. Really good. Love for techno, though. It just came from some requests from the viewers and playing techno on the stream and just going to techno events. As far as I'm aware, my music taste has changed so much. I don't think it will move away from techno for the rest of my life. I think I enjoy it that much. Damn. I find like I've got good headphones and all that. And I just, I, I listen to things and every song I listen to, I think how good would this be live? And with these constant relentless bass kicks going on, it's just like, I know what that bass rattle feels like in my chest. Even when I'm streaming, I know what it's like. I know what lasers would be doing at certain points in songs. And it just gives me goosebumps even just listening to it at times. So I'd say to answer the question, my love for techno, purely from some requests and then actually going to some techno raves that were local to me. That's so cool. I'm going to ask his last question, but I'm also going to mix in Hamzy's question. And he asks, if you could create your dream festival, which three headliners would you book? Uh, it would probably be SNTS, Back to Back Paula Temple. Ah... Uh... I want to say SNTS back to back Paula Temple and then Rebecca to close. That is the hardest question. There's a billion different ones, but it's my bucket list right now. I don't have many things on my bucket list, but my bucket list is to see SNTS uh, and Paula Temple do a back to back set. It'd be insane. And then Rebecca, I've seen Rebecca three times and she is never bad. She's always the best every time. Almost every time I go to an event, I think I'll just go see her because she's just never bad. Damn. All right, and then Nick asks, finally, DJ stream when? So I I need to get my friend to come around and sort the cables out. I want to do one. It's not going to be good. I don't really know how to DJ, but I don't think anyone really truly cares. If I do a bad <laughs> transition, we'll get some giggles, but then I have seven minutes of a song if we just let them play, and that's just a lot of VV calls. So it'd be good fun. Um I don't know though, um, doing a stream, obviously a first time stream, it's obviously a bit daunting. Once you do one, it comes easy. I, so yeah, I really, I really don't know. I need to get the cable sorted first and just the confidence to turn it on. But I think there's more chance it's gonna happen when I'm pre-drinking maybe to go out to a rave or something in Manchester. I might whack it on for two hours with my friends and we just do a back to back to back to back to back and just play whatever. It'll be techno though, so it'll be good. That's cool. I know Ari Slash was doing DJ streams. He kind of stopped doing them, which I'm a little upset about because I love they trance. Were really, um, I love trance as well. Yeah, his streams were always good. His transitions are fantastic. Apparently, yeah. uh, transitioning trance is very, very easy. There's like a, just a rhythm you do for every song. But again, his taste in trance is brilliant. And the way he did his sets, always good. I'd listen to them all every time I was streaming three or four hours long. Yeah, he would he would pop into my stream right before he'd go live. He's like, do you have a trance song you want me to like mix in? I'm like, hell yeah. So I'd always have like one in there. <laughs> yeah. then he tries to he put it in as well if he's just so flawlessly done oh yeah it's always flawless and this one because he likes the 138 bpm mostly that's his trance style so i offered him something that was a lot slower and somehow he just let it work i'm like damn oh i remember when he played boris brusher gravity because someone donated for it and he played it at 138 i think <laughs> and it sounded so bad i think boris songs are like 126 maybe even 128 or something 129 somewhere around there yeah he played it at 138 and it just sounded so weird <laughs> yeah okay um gravity asks what do you think needs to happen slash change barring technical issues in order for dmm to be a successful and refreshing event for osrs 
And then he also asked, can you explain your fitness routine, what it was at least? How does one remain so humble while consistently being praised by the community? Uh, what I think is to happen change for Deadman mode to be successful. Um, there's only one thing that will ever make Deadman successful and it will never happen. And that is that every person agrees to play fair. Everyone plays one account, progresses their own account by themselves, no help, no donations, no nothing. And the game runs that way. That will never happen. And there's no way you can force it to happen either. There'll always be someone that finds a loophole. As far as I'm aware, Deathmatch mode is a completely flawed game mode until that is actually done. Now, tournaments on the other hand, the tournaments are fine because I don't think you need to have rules on a tournament. There's a cash prize. If you're in a 50-man team, by all means, go kill everyone and make them all quit and then just take the money for yourself. You know, I was kind of hoping that one dead man eventually would be one clan so prolifically ahead of everyone that they just eliminated all competition by like scouting everywhere and making sure no one could do anything. So when the final came, everyone had just quit, you know, and they just get the freest win of their life. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I don't think Dead Man's a successful game mode. I don't think it ever will be. I think the only way you could do it is just run a tournament once a year, maybe. Leave the tournaments as they are. The final, the finals obviously are normally pretty scuffed, but if they <laughs> drop the good finals and they're just like clean, we could look back at some Dead Man's when the final was clean. They're good events, you know, maybe get people on stage again, get those events going with, um, I can't remember the company that it was actually at, but no, I personally think Dead Man mode is a flawed game mode. There'll be a lot of PKs that think it's a great game mode. Those PKs have never died in the game. They've never had to rebuild. They've never had to have the worry of being PK'd, really. It's very hard to play as a non-PK. So there's just not that player base to do. The yeah. only way it would work is people play fair, and that will never happen. Going along that, just before we move on to the next question, do you have any thoughts on PvP? I know a lot of like the, the common phrase is fix PvP, but everyone has their own idea of fix. Do you have your own thoughts on what you would like to see for PvP just in general? In all honesty, I'm curious, but when they released the singles plus PJ timer, I'll call it that, PK streams have been popping on Switch. I wonder if people have noticed that, and I consider that one of the best, personally, I consider that one of the best updates to pvp recently now i know there might be some multi clans that are maybe listening to this and they disagree instantly i've never pk'd in multi so i don't know much about it in that aspect obviously i think they don't like it because it's gone but i like this because it's basically i get to watch people have 1v1 fights and the better man will win the fight it's always fair there's no tele block and 20 man dd just to make some money off the guy you know mm -hmm. it's pking for the sake of pking best man wins you have the adrenaline of being in the wilderness i think it's beautiful i love fair 1v1 fights as for what the singles teams have lost i can't relate um i i'm biased on this i have to say that i am biased with my enjoyment of this update because i'm not a part of a singles team i prefer having again i last man standing pk i prefer a one-on-one -on -one fight best man wins or all that so what do i want to see added to pking i don't really know i i really cannot think of anything that would make me go into the wilderness to pk again even if i did my 1000 lms wins i reckon i'd be extremely good at pking and i could make a lot of money from it which i could put towards my third age but the whole concept of the pk in the wilderness i think i've had my fair share of it i pk'd only on runescape from 2003 to like 2011 give or take and i consider those the glory days of pking nowadays i consider it the the, the 115 breeding skillful days I think trying to PK now, I always have that attempt to try and relive what I had in the past with the old wilderness and all the old PvP when everyone was clueless. It was more fun back then compared to now. For me, if I want to PvP, I'd rather go last man standing. If I win the game, I've had five to seven fights in a 12 minute period yeah. and I enjoy all the fights. And it's so much fun in 12 minutes that going around the wildy, I've just got to find everyone. So I guess actually to answer the question, remove some of the remove the wilderness from half the world. That's one thing I think would be very good. I think PKs want that. The ability to find more PKs, PK defenseless people is very important. Defenseless people obviously makes it more dangerous to do things, particularly hardcore. However, I don't think the game should be based around hardcore or Iron Man in general. The wilderness should be based around PKs maybe, which again goes to the point where they get skillers and shit get not skillers, but people get forced into the wilderness to get items. Don't know my way around that, but I think if to answer that question, if there's one update I want to see for PvP, it would be to remove the wilderness from half of the worlds, I think, so that um, it's more chance to find people. PK streamers hopping around can find people more often. 
they just want to fight people but they can't they have to hop for 20 minutes to find one fight and repeat the process for me i'm biased again i can just go last man standing and find five fights in 10 minutes that's fair yeah i've heard that uh argument i'm gonna have peter spam on so soon and he has his own thoughts as well i like talking to like individual pkers because I, I swear every single pker has a different idea of what would like fix the wilderness and well uh, the thing with that yeah. as well that i think a lot of people don't realize is i think honestly a lot of pkers don't know how to fix the wilderness because a lot of pks i think have pk for ages since the original wilderness but they've all forgotten that there used to be an unofficial honor code back in the day where you wouldn't pj people you'd let the fight run out and you would just respect that and not pj them nowadays the wilderness is just there's no rules in the world eh? it's just an unofficial one so the whole concept of no rules we've seen proof does not work people don't want to go pk and just have a 10-man person dd on them now you can go rev cave and if you die to the person you're fighting you died in a fair 1v1 you know, you might leave the wilderness, but the only way to get better is to learn from the deaf in a way. So that's why I kind of like that. But I think as well, there were people that they were trying to fix dead man mode. And these are the PKs that get spooned all the items from their clan and go and kill everyone in the game. This person has never played dead man mode, earning their own shit, playing the game, tanking PKs constantly and all that. So they don't know how to fix it, in my opinion. The people that keep dying, I've experienced dead man both PKing and not and my example for this is the original dead man when it came out the very first one i was pking and i thought it was the best game mode ever because i killing people and then i experienced a few dead mans where i the meta changed and you had to swap gp to get ahead and i had to earn my gold when everyone was running around barrage day two and the game mode is impossible to play dead man mode is a pay to win game mode in my opinion you have to swap gold or take the nations to be able to do any good there and that immediately removes a massive chunk of people that actually want to do it. Yeah. So fixing Deadman, if they can fix Deadman, I will give them a standing ovation. I will probably play. Content creators will always play Deadman. The viewer counts are high. There's sub counts. There's a lot of revenue for playing it. It is fun to play. It can be very stressful at the same time, but it does. It's, it's a bit different as well. Plus, it might only run for a week or so. So content creators will always play Deadman, regardless of the fact that the game mode is garbage. But if they can somehow fix dead man and create it to be something that i think the initial concept was going to be i will give them a standing ovation and there's a good chance that i would be playing it yeah i i liked watching the last one back in like september or august whenever it was with the relics and stuff because it, it just switched everything up and i i still understand it's a pay to win thing like you just have to be fed by clans to you know do anything yeah the previous dead man is the one where i think some pk has took their first ever deaths and probably realized what it's like to lose all your experience and your bank slots and mm -hmm. you've got it when it's easy you know back when we played we'd die unschooled we'd lose 28 bank slots 50 percent of every experience we had to rebuild <laughs> with 5x it wasn't even the multipliers so we went through the toughest versions of dead man mode you know nowadays it's it's still not easy it's, a, it's the hardest game mode out there without any doubts it's very tough um but those relics, they were very broken straight away. But the ability to actually see 1v1 fights at banks and see people die, I loved that personally. I really, really did. It was so nice. Bank fights, two good brids against each other in a bank fight. No one's really going to die. They're only going to get the people like myself that would definitely, I would definitely die in a bank fight. <laughs> I've actually died in many bank fights, to be honest. Oh, my God. Those bank fights where you're just like trying to quickly pull out an inventory of food just real quickly. Yeah. I yeah, that's the fun part. I've, I've never enjoyed well i did dead man like the initial dead man that turned into world 345 and i died within like three seconds and i was like all right yeah this isn't for me and then ever since <laughs> then i just had a bad taste in my mouth but i i always enjoyed watching it especially when yeah, you got specked out by a dragon warhammer that was awesome oh again like there's a pov of that guy and the guy's clicks are all over the show no disrespect to him of course but he specced me without being super attack potion and he had eagle eye on as well d warhammer is obviously ridiculously inaccurate and just gets the pid 35 or whatever it was on me you know so uh, i also misclicked through him as well because you can see my character i yellow clicked through there's so many tiny things there that would have survived well had me survive but the fact that he hit the hammer for so long and then bought me on the head at the end it is it's a good way to go down but oh man that guy was so lucky <laughs> oh god i don't know if you're gonna say something we can move on to the next uh question he asked can you explain your I'm fitness routine? That, guy, that, was, that was just that was definitely that guy's only killing dead man ever because <laughs> me as the pk i'm very easy to kill because of my style of low health 
But the thing is, like, I PK'd in that low health for like the original Deadman, and I honestly, the only time I ever got KO'd was like the first time I ever died due to being sat on very low hit points in a fight was like season five. I got Granite Moth out or something. I lost a few 1v1s, but when I'm running around fighting people on like 10, 20 hit points, I kind of know what I'm doing to stay alive there as long as I don't make a human error mistake. And I, I did like 500 kills in the original Deadman, all of which had like the 20 hit point thing. Most obviously on defenses PK as though at the time. But no, that D Warhammer was one where everyone's like, why do you eat up higher and all that stuff? The way I like to PK is I can die if I make a mistake. I like to PK with that cutthroat style. Whereas most PK nowadays, if you die, there's too much ego involved. You're not allowed to die. You can't be chanced. You, you can't give them yeah. even a... It makes sense why you, sh you shouldn't be trying to die to a person mm -hmm. completely. But if I'm fighting a guy and he's green bar permanently, there's no fun. You know, I'm not enjoying yeah. the game anymore. I'm just bored. So I just leave and I don't like fighting that. So I like to keep my health low because people would fight me back and I'd always get good fights. And in doing that, you can bait them into lower health at times because they think they're going to kill you. But obviously, if again, if I'm PKing well, I know what I was doing with the low health. I have like 10 deaths now on low health since then, though. I die a lot. Um... But it's all good because I got more kills with it, so I'm happy. I wanted to briefly say as well, I really actually, as a viewer, I enjoyed where everyone would just mass up at the end and just everyone's chucking chins and everyone's ice barraging everybody. Uh, I know they turned it to a 1v1, so it's a lot more fair. You don't have to be in a clan to, to potentially win, but... What, do you, what were your thoughts on the whole massing at the end, like when they'd all end up in Anacarl or like just north of Falador? That big I hated having to find the clan for it because obviously I ran solo, so I'd have to find a clan. And just, I, I, I had to like it's me messaging a clan like, "Hey guys, I've never spoke to you before. Can you help me out?" By the way, you know, and I just feel like I'm leeching off him. Obviously, because of my who I was in the community, sometimes I get a pass if I was to like advertise the clan and all that. That was fine with me any day, any day for that. But um, I liked the multi area because I was good at it. Because again, I'd sit quite low health, but I knew what I was doing. And I let my bullet barrage reheal me, so I was barely touching my bruise. I think I did the multi area three or four times to get to the 1v1s, and I succeeded all the, every single time. I never died in multi, except for twice where one I died to fog, and the other time I actually died before I even got to the multi stage because I ran into a clan uh, before because I, I was alone. I didn't have anyone to go with. And then there was one in the uh, the barbarian assault one where it was a massive stack of people. I did really well in that because I just blood barraged and kept moving all over the place. I much prefer the 1v1s though, I think that far better. Um, yeah. I, I think everyone gets a 1v1 now. I think Deadman's a lot better because of that. Because I think we do see the best PKers win. People have the most chance to beat everyone back to back to back are winning the tournaments. And I think that's how it always should have been. Yeah. Who is the best PKer? 1013. Yeah. like hands down uh, i think 10 30 and one year they go back and forth between the two but i do consider 10 13 the best pk ever to play the game i'd happily say for someone argued one year their track record is about even i think so i could happily say they're both as good as each other but i think 10 13 is like yeah ever if i had to say the best pk of all time i'd say book and pb just for what he used to do back in the day again i like to have the nostalgia with these but book back then would get completely dumpstered by 10 13 today but I think he is the best PK in the game. Yeah, he's his clicks are ungodly. It's just like damn. I, I I don't know how he does it. I try and replicate it. Like I can click quite well, but as far as where he just spam clicks his mouse and moves the cursor. <laughs> but when he spam clicks, he's moved the cursor correctly to actually hit all the things like correctly. But not that is the fact that everyone can click fast. Clicking in the right place is harder because he can click like eight inventory spots, take his helmet off and hit the barrage. And he does all that in like 0.6 seconds. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't even click the mouse that like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah. 10, 11 times. I can't even click the mouse 11 times in 0.6 seconds. Yeah, he's nuts. I heard he's also very young too. I heard he's like like 21 or something. Like He was like 14 or 16 when he was completely dumpstering everyone in the game obviously he's older now but he's been on the scene for about four yeah. or five years but i don't think he plays anymore i think he's kind of like the whole rng you can be the best pker in this game and you can still lose to someone just because you can't hit shit yeah. and it's the most annoying thing that's why i'm trying to delete like i'm doing lms i need to win 800 games it's over 5,000 fights. If I'm getting annoyed every time I think I should win a fight because I'm just not hitting, it's going to be an annoying grind. Yeah. So now I get a bit bummed every time I lose a fight. It's natural to be a bit disappointed when you lose, particularly when I come second place. Um, 
But I've told myself that if I win the fight, I win the fight. And if I lose the fight, I lose the fight. There's no reason. I don't need an excuse. Yeah, it's uh, the PvP tracker. I should just disable that thing. That thing just... I don't use off. the tracker. Again, <laughs> it it's like... I can have a tracker that says I won 90%. And if I lose the fight, I can be like, yeah, here's my tracker. I should have won. And then the guy's like, yeah, should have, but you didn't. Yeah, you know, end of the yeah. day, I, I didn't win the fight. So can't bother the tracker. I think the tracker's like... I don't use the term ego thing because I think a lot of people do use it. Yeah. But it's the whole concept of you've lost the fight. You need to defend the fact that you're good and say, yeah, the track it shows that I should have won, which is fair. Completely understand that. But you, I mean, I've, you lose the fight and you lose the fight. Simple as that, you know. You, you can literally lose a fight for splashing one very important barrage, you know. There's always a reason you'll lose a fight. And that excuse, nowadays I'm trying my best to delete that for myself. If I lose a fight, for whatever reason that I knew in my head, I lost the fight. Just take it, you know. I'm going to lose many, 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 many more fights getting this. And then... Yeah. If I win the fight, it is what it is, you know. It's it's kind of the beauty of LMS, though. The fact that you can just get dominated based off RNG, but you can also beat a person that's just objectively better than you because of RNG, and that feels good. So it kind of goes both yeah, ways. Yeah, it's... I mean, I'm, I'm PK now. I've not got my true muscle memory back, but I occasionally fight people who are very good. My favorite thing in the whole game is to fight good tribrids in LMS. I love it. But it's very annoying when you splash all your freezes and bolt zeros on their prey mage because that's the only way you can have a chance to beat the best in the game, really. Yeah. And then you get one side stomped. And I hate it because I'm like, I know I'm good. I know this guy's better than me. I'm happy to admit that. But I don't like how I'm being beaten by like a 250 hit point advantage. I feel I should be able to bring it a bit closer purely because I can't hit with a bolt on his prey mage yeah. and I can't catch a freeze. So he just stomps me into the ground because you look like the biggest noob in the world. You know, when you're there, like when someone catches all their freezes and they're sm smashing you like that, you feel like such a noob. And I hate that, you know, <laughs> no. the ego just gets shattered. You know, you see the name Boaty and people still remember me as a PK. -er. I'm pretty bad compared to the best right now. I'm still OK. I can still beat people, but I get anyone can kill me in lms by the time i finish my 1000 lms grind i guarantee that people watching this you killed me in lms you know i'm very easy to kill yeah. uh, i just have fun with it that's it you know the only time i don't have fun is if i just splash everything or the first fight takes three minutes that's the yeah. only time i wish like my only gripe with lms is that there's they're always on uk worlds which is amazing for people living in the uk but for me like it, the ping is just always so laggy so it's wait, just, is it not? I thought there's a rotation. Does it not go back there, to the US? There is, but nobody's ever on the US worlds because as soon as one world's populated, the other one just dies. That's what it, how it always feels. And even I think the times where the US world has been available, it still is very inconsistent. It's like something with the high population just ruins it for me. I thought, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they changed it because I know they changed the PvP rotors, but I don't know if they did it with the LMS as well because normally it's U UK for one week and then it goes US for one week and it repeats that. Is it now permanently UK? I feel like every time I go, it's in the UK. It's like World 559. It's like every single time. So I'm not exactly sure because I'm not just always doing LMS. I think they've added both then. So there's a US world and a UK world. Yeah, the US oh, world is bad. always dead, it feels like. Yeah, I'll make my grind a bit better then because I was like, I can't do LMS. I'm not LMSing on 200. Like the world <laughs> itself, if there was one thing I genuinely wish for in the game, it is last man standing with zero ping. Oh God, I, I genuinely think I'd be so, everyone would be much better, but I think I'd be so freaking good. The amount of things that I do and my brain wants to do, and then the inventory just doesn't update in time. <laughs> I then stop because I have to readapt to the situation and I just fall apart in the fights. With zero ping, everything, it's like private servers, everything updates instantly. And whatever your brain's telling you to do, you can just do it. Oh, I absolutely kill for it. Yeah, because it's on a UK world, but the ping is still like mm -hmm. seventy to one forty or something. So the game, I I only play RuneScape on like twenty ping, so I'm so adapted to that. Yeah. So when I go PK and things are slower for me, you know, I, I wheel three items, it'll wheel two, then one in the next tick. Yeah, things like that. Because if I was outside of LMS on any other world, everything would wheel. That's just how I play the game. I'm hoping to adapt to it, but I friggin' wish LMS had like zero ping. It'd be so fun. It, the worst thing ever is equipping your DDS. You hit the spec bar, but it just doesn't activate in time. It activates the next six. So you just poke them. I poke people with my DDS probably five times every single LMS game. It's so bad. That yeah, is, it happens. Is worst one for me is like when I wield my tank after a barrage, it wields the tank. Like you barrage and then you're meant to wield the tank immediately. 
I wheeled a tank and then it either wheels one piece then the other the next tick or it wheels <laughs> yeah. both the next tick. Yeah. Things like that. But there's so much time when you just hit things and the game updates so slow that I just sit there like doing nothing for like two seconds and that two seconds is quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain your fitness routine? At the moment, there is none. Uh, I can't exercise. Going back to what I said before, I'm allergic to my own sweat, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, fitness routine, I would normally just go to the gym and kind of just do whatever I wanted. Uh, I'd normally train uh, biceps with back. I'd do triceps with chest. I'd do shoulders by themselves. Maybe shoulders and biceps. Sometimes I'd mix it up at times because sometimes I'd have big back sessions. Uh, legs, normally just do legs alone. I'd normally say legs and core, but I'd never have the energy after legs to do core. And then I'll do core, and then sometimes I'll do, um, I think it's called medium intensity steady state. I don't know if it exists, but I put the treadmill on the highest incline uh, and just walk at a decent speed at the end of most workouts for 15, 20 minutes. It gets a massive sweat on. Not best for cardio, but I think it's good for like fat burn or something. I don't know. Um, other than that, warm up, I don't normally warm up. I normally walk to the gym, which is about 20 minutes, and that's my warm up. I don't really ever stretch. I think that's quite bad. I might do some research now because, again, I'm really healthy at the moment with my diet and, well, not diet, but vitamins after my recovery. I might look into how important stretching is going forth because, again, if I look 20 years in the future, if I stretch in the gym, prevents me having a long term injury or something, then I'd rather start doing that now. Um, but fitness routine, I don't really have one. I just go to the gym. And when I get there, I'll gauge what I want to do. But one of my favorite things, I mean, I like to do pull-ups, so things like that. I like calisthenics. I want to, like, when I get back to a good level, I want to try and train with, like, almost purely calisthenics. I really, I think anyone doing stuff with body weight is just so sick. I think it's all just natural strength because all your stabilizers get hit as well. Yeah, I love calisthenics, but mainly because it still is really nice. You don't get as, like, big. In college, I just loved to lift weights. Like, that was it. I didn't want to do anything that was just body. But, uh, yeah, I think, like, yeah. I don't know if this is a fact, I'm kind of guessing, but I think if you, like, most people have crazy calisthenic stuff, like gymnasts and all that stuff, they don't look big, but they are very strong. Yeah. And that's kind of where I want to get myself. Um, I don't want to look big. I want to look athletic is the word I use. I want to look athletic. I don't look big, muscular. You can see that I train, but I'm not, like, massively, insanely big. Um, but I also want that calisthenic strength, you know. I think being able to move your body weight is the sign of strength, in my opinion. If you can bench your body weight, I guess squat your body weight and all that, that is a sign of strength. With squats, obviously, before I get all the ego people in the chat, yeah, you want to do more than body weight on squats. But once you hit that one rep with your body weight, it's just a good sign of strength, in my opinion. Minus, obviously, overhead press. Um, I just think doing calisthenics and anything to do with body weight is sick because you can look athletic, but you might actually be stronger than you look in a way which doesn't matter again because it would just come down to ego things it's just i only go to the gym for my own fitness my own health really so if i get strong nice but i don't want to get too big yeah okay so this last question i'm going to mix in this one from ron plays games as well he asks when you're on top how do you craft the motivation to stay there and i, I saw a lot of topics kind of like that do you have any words of advice um See, I saw this one as well. This is the only one I replied to. I think I asked Rig or something to go live. But... <laughs> yeah, I, I kept getting notifications about this it's, conversation. <laughs> it's the only question. This is going to be disappointing. It's the only question that I mulled over a bit before I jumped on this call. And in all honesty, I don't know. I don't think I have the motivation to stay there. I was just blessed by the RuneScape community to be given this spot at the top, you know, at the time. Not at the top anymore. I'm like, I mean, I don't stream right now, but if I was streaming, I'm like top 10 at the moment. But I, I don't really, consider, like, again, it might just be my streaming style, but I don't think I worked hard to get there. I just enjoyed playing RuneScape and that reflected on my stream and I kind of knew how to play. The only working hard I'd say is trying to improve at the game. So, like, when I was at the top of streaming, how do I craft the motivation to stay there? I never really wanted to stay there. I never really asked to be on the top. I was just given the position to be on the top. So, um, I don't know. I just, I turned my stream on the next day, and there was no 
thought in my mind of me like right i need to turn my stream on to maintain number one streamer because i know spark mike's catching up i just turned my stream on and then when people came around and let's just say dethroned me you know i had paul dethroned me at one point well deserved i had ice poseidon dethroned me odobox dethroned me at the moment i'm dethroned at the moment by like will i think abyss you know people are much bigger than me now viewer count wise and follower count wise maybe not but like as for genuine stream and all that stuff it depends on what you do because I'm kind of going off subscriber counts here, but mm -hmm. view account wise, I'm not back yet. But the honest answer to the question is I never tried to be on top. You know, I just think the RuneScape community gifted me the ability to be on top. That's why I never take anything for granted. So the motivation to stay there, I don't, I don't think there was any. I just think, again, my stream did not change whether I'm in the first slot on Twitch, like number one or number 10 or number 50. My stream is always the same. You know, I'm not trying to be number one. And I would ha I'm happy when I see people do well. You know, I remember when uh, Sick Nerd was doing better than me. I remember when Paul was doing better than me. I'm usually remember kind of past tense here, but not that I'm saying I'm doing better. Sick Nerd's doing really well right now, though. I know yeah, that. Yeah, he can but, always kill it with anything he plays too, which is insane. Yeah, fantastic streamer. Honestly, after what he's been through in the past like year or so, I think I think it was 2020 maybe. So deserved, and I'm just so happy to see it all the time. Really makes me happy. No, when when someone there's a quote which is like they want to see you do good but never better than you or something like that. And I that quote I don't agree with it. I want to see everyone do better than me. As long as I can still do what I'm doing, I'm happy with that. Simple as that. I could be the 50th streamer on on uh, Twitch. And as long as I can still do what I do, play my techno, play RuneScape and talk to a chat and have VV Cools and all that, don't mind at all where I place in the category. My stream isn't going to change in any way to try and pursue some number one spot or something that doesn't technically exist. So to answer that question, don't, I just don't know. I, I don't think... I mean, they could word it a different way, but I don't think I ever attempted to maintain my number one spot. If someone beat me, I was happy to see it. I was like, you know what? Your stream, I look at them and I see their success. You know, if you were, if I was the number one spot and someone beats me, that stream's booming. You know, and I look at them as an individual. I know what they're going through because I'm obviously loving my stream. I know they're loving their stream. I'm like, you know, what? congratulations, you're doing really, really well for yourself. I'm super happy to see it. There's no jealousy. There's no saltiness. No envy. No nothing. You know, I'd happily take Odebox sub count any day of my life. Though, happy to say that. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I honestly, it's the only question I mulled over, and I don't think there was motivation. I just enjoyed what I did and that was the motivation, just going live and enjoying with my audience. That gave me everything I've got and it maintains what I've got today. I've not changed anything really. Very cool. Okay. We got some questions from Friend Zones. He asks What was your favorite era of RuneScape? For the people that don't know, can you explain seventy three? I can't yeah, we haven't even explained that yet. You are on episode seventy three. What are some of your favorite moments you've had in your content creation journey? And if you could design a skill, what would it be? Oh, favorite era of RuneScape? Uh, probably the first six months of Old School's release. As a player of since 2003, there is something completely different about being able to play a game that I knew everything about. Like when it came out in 2007, I'd played 03 to 07. I knew everything about the game at that time. I don't know anything about the game anymore. I don't know shit on Zaya. <laughs> All that stuff, my game knowledge and all that stuff has dropped drastically because I'm not keeping up with things. Because um, I think when a new update comes out, if I did it on a main, I'd know things still. But playing Iron Man for so long, I've not touched a lot of the game. There's a lot yeah. of things that I get to do, which is going to be fun. Uh, but on you with no economy and seeing Rune Full Helms 100k, Rune Simi's 100k, all that stuff was one of the most unique experiences ever. And I don't think we'll ever see it again. I can't see them ever doing a reset of RuneScape ever again. Yeah. That was a once in a lifetime enjoyment for people who've played RuneScape to be able to restart the game on even footing with a brand new economy. And I think it's, I honestly, I, if I could choose any time to go back to, it'd just be that first six months, just everyone kind of knowing what to do, but nothing being in the game. It's so unique. You can kind of get it with Dead Man and the game modes because of um, obviously the economy, but most game modes have Iron Man, so it doesn't matter with the economy. Mm -hmm. But with Dead Man mode, you kind of get it with Dead Man because the economy is always reset immediately. But Dead Man's a bit different. That's your only respark there, I'd say. But no, definitely the first six months of old school for me. Yeah, I didn't. I I wish I had played then. I just didn't even really know about the game. I didn't keep up with it until 2015. But yeah, that first six 
months to a year ish and like i remember like draconic visages weren't they like 90 mil or something just ridiculous that was like well, the no, best no, they, were, they, were, they were like two mil because there was no money in the game this is why it was so <laughs> good when, when whips came out whips were 8.5 mil i remember that but like initially gold was there wasn't so any valuable. in the game you know like the most expensive item like dragon chains i like 20 mil again back then Damn. and stuff like that but that's why it was so interesting because even though prices were high, like Rune Fulhelms were 100k and all that stuff, there wasn't any gold in the game. Then people started high alking like you longbows and stuff, and then gold mm. starts printing into the game. Yeah, that was a that just sounds like a fun time. I've talked to so many people that are they're talking about the early 2013 grind and like going for certain 99s and 99s back then were like so cool. <laughs> you get a 99 well, now, you just on. don't even care. Someone got fevered on like the fourth day of release, which is fine because they blackjacked and all that. I was actually still in school when old school came out. I was lucky because I I done I resat a year, and when I resat a year, I did five AS levels, I think. So when I finished, I only had two A levels to do for my next one. No, when I say so, four AS and one A level. So when I finished all that, I nailed my A levels. So therefore, I got two A levels. I had a half day every day, so I'd be in school at like nine a.m. and I'd leave at midday, and I'd literally power walk home to the Metro Link to get home, get on old school Ridge Camp, would like turn my stream on and get blasting for twelve hours straight or something. I got really, really lucky it came out then, because otherwise I'd be in till half four or something, and then half my day is gone. Yeah. Oh, the good old days back when and no and everybody was a noob, you know, like. It, I think, um, so I started playing in 2015, and that was after the whole Nightmare Zone bug where just everyone was six-hour guffins, guffinsing overnight, and uh, that really upset me because I joined, and I remember seeing people, anybody that was above level 100 combat was just like, damn, you're a king, but then I would just see all these level 120 accounts that had like five Slayer. I'm like, what is going on? And then I realized that people are just actively botting. I'm like, that is depressing that was really depressing for me because uh it was nostalgic to me to see high combat levels and knowing that they are very good at the game and then it was just completely taken yeah i, I had um because i remember when i actually went to max boaty i was one of those two types of account there's the nightmare zone account that's just trash but then there's the slayer account which is what i had is where your account's like 1500 total and you've got 99 slayer and max combat and everything else is like 35 herb or quest yeah. cape basically requirements for everything that's what I look back onto a Boaty around when I think it was, I think it was a bit before Chambers was released because that's when I started maxing. But when Chambers released, I was close to max, so somewhere around there, but that's all I can remember. I, I, had, I had the Slayer account, like 99 Slayer, Max Melee, 61 Mining for Lunar Diplomacy, all that garbage. <laughs> yeah. And, okay, let me ask you this, actually. So what did the Max Cape do to the game with perks and everything? Did that make... Did that ruin the game somewhat? Did that cause a detriment to the game, incentivizing people that hate scaling to skill? I can't really truly answer this uh, because I my game time before me coming back to my main and dying on my last hardcore, I basically didn't really play the game outside of the new updates on the, this one. I always played the Iron Man, and I never had a Max Cape on a Nightmare. So even today, I need items on Boaty or teleports on Boaty, and my Max Cape can do it, and I just haven't fully learned everything about my Max Cape mm -hmm. yet. So I can't really answer that question. It's obviously a very, very powerful item. Is it overpowered? <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, really everything's overpowered, so it's just like, eh. But yeah, it's, it's really. I wonder because I wonder if they'll ever bring a completionist cape out in the future. It's something I could see being Paul, but not passing. Uh, and how you would gauge what is completionist in the game. So I don't think they'll like Castle Ward, but maybe it's going to be like the whole mini games log or something. So yeah, I'll be done with it. Nice. Um, oh, it'd be so good that I'd have a thousand LMS wins. No one have one except me. It'd be good. Uh, I don't know. I can't answer that just purely because I didn't play much with the Mats cape. Most of the time, I'd be using an Inferno Cape or an Assembler or Major Inner 2 Cape when doing PVM that released. Yeah. Okay. For the people that don't know, can you explain 73? All right. So 73, um, I, I don't think I can go on YouTube and check so my algorithm might pull it up. But 73, uh, basically me and Skill Specs, who's another streamer, who's also doing really well right now. And I'm so happy to see him doing well because I think Skill Specs is the best streamer personally. His schedule's a bit eh if his schedule's on point whatever but content wise and entertainment wise there's no streamer that can make me laugh as much as skills box literally no one even comes close 
The 73 happened where it was a long time ago. Me and Skill Specs had a hybrid fight in Edgeville, 2014 or something like that, forever ago. And back then, there was a certain point in the fight where I think I had my tank gear on and I had 76 hit points. And obviously, we were in live commentary in Discord or Skype or whatever the hell it was back then. Um, <laughs> it's the one that says user disconnected from your channel. <laughs> Whatever whatever audio program that was, I actually disconnect halfway through. I can't remember what it was, but we're in that. Um, basically, he's in certain gear. This is when the max hit of an AGS was 78. So I'm in 76 hit points, and I'm in my Torag, and I'm like, you can't hit a 76 because you can't hit a 76. It's physically impossible. And then he hits a three on me. And then because I know in that gear he can hit a 73, I say 73, <laughs> I'll risk it for you. And then he AGSs me a 73. <laughs> the max hit in his gear at the time was literally probably 74 or something like that. So he basically hit that perfect max hit on me. Pretty rare to hit a max on max unless you're using magic or something. But it's the whole aspect of me saying that I ca you can't hit kill a 70. You can't kill me with a 76. It's not possible. You can kill me with a 73. I'll risk it for you. And then he hits the 73. Had I not risked it, that clip would not exist. <laughs> Had he not hit the 73, that clip would not exist. So basically a question to ask everyone watching this is, what if skill specs did not hit that 73? How would things be different? If you hit like a 39, you know, no one cares about a 39. Yeah, shit. What would have happened? What What are the, like, what what, what is 73 caused in uh, your community? Because I know 73 is just the, it is just the meme number of the OSR's community. Something, I, I think... I, was, I think it's a global yeah, meme. I think a lot of, I, I don't think people know the origin, but you see 73s anyway, you'll see joys. <laughs> now, I don't know if they're all all RuneScape players, let's say, but you go around, no matter where, if I hear a 73 regardless, obviously in the RuneScape community, it's shouted way louder. Yeah. But I feel um, people, anywhere, 73, boom, joy. It, it's a global meme. You type it on yeah. Google and stuff, it will tell you how it all works. And what difference having it made? I, I don't know. I think it's kind of a dead meme most of the time until you have to refer to something as 73. <laughs> I think off the top of my head, it's a prime number, so it doesn't pop up too much like day to day. Mm -hmm. But then um, it's kind of like if you do damage with a weapon or get hit with a weapon, 73. It's mainly seen in PKing, I think, when somebody literally just AGS is a 73 on someone. You see a clip, probably every month you'll see a clip of somebody dying to a 73 or something like that. Everyone spams joys, yep. And then everyone will be like joys and all that. And people will always put more attention towards the 73. If it's a 74, you don't care. 72, yeah. you don't really care. If it's a max hit, like an 85 or something ridiculous, then maybe as well. But most of the time, it's, you know, 73. Attention will be towards the damage. Yeah. All right. What are your some of your favorite moments you've had content creation journey? We might have already kind of covered this, but if you have any particular well, ones. My favorite moment of all time in streaming, and I don't think it will ever be beaten, was when I got my Armadil hilt on Peckish Whale. And I think most people know that because I say it all the time when I stream. I was doing my um solo runescape before I am I think Iron Man might have existed, but it recently released. I, I was doing that on Peckish Whale and I was doing Armadil God Wars. And I pulled the final shard I needed for my blade. And I was Iron Man at the time. This is back when an Armadil God so it was like 100 mil. And I pulled the blade in the trip. And I was like, oh, that's the blade, guys. If I get a hilt now, because I'm killing Armadil for the hilt, not the armor. Because, I, yeah, I was like, I could have won it. but And I was like, oh, if I get the hilt now, I've got the Armadil God sword. And then I had like 7,000 viewers at this time. Like RuneScape on Twitch back in like 2015 was massive. Like Jesus. way bigger than it is now. I think just more games have come out to take away the spotlight from RuneScape, which is unfortunate, but again, everyone's happy with what we've got right now. I think the actual RuneScape community on a, a level of financial stability to be a profitable streamer or a not a successful stream or financial, basically to pursue streaming as a career is all time high right now. So there's so many full time RuneScape streamers out there. The community is super generous and everyone can do well. But I just said, if I get an Armadil Hilt now, guys, I've got the Armadil God Sword. And then like two kills later, I got an Armadil Hilt. And there's not many things that have ever happened to me that make me jump out my chair when playing RuneScape. I don't fake reactions or anything. When I got this Hilt drop, I, if I remember correctly, I was in my parents' house. I literally jumped out my chair and I was halfway across my room with my face in my hands because I was in disbelief. <laughs> And the only time I can think of of me getting out of my chair playing was when I got the Inferno Cape as well, and that was nothing compared to this. So, Damn. I think my favorite favorite uh, moment was that Armadil God Sword on, and then I went PKing with it and killed like so many people back then because everyone was so bad at PKing, myself included, <laughs> of course. But AGS, like people would sit on fifty five hit points and wouldn't eat. You just they just spec them randomly and they just die. So, 
when it killed a few people, which was good. Um, other than that, that's my first personal favorite moment individually, but I'm a massive fan. My favorite moments are, again, going back, the Rig, Jason, Zulu growth on Twitch. One of my favorite things to ever spectate. I'm watching it again now with Zoe, Quinique's, um Tasty as well. Tasty's doing really well. I'm yeah. really, I think Tasty is a fantastic streamer. I, I see more to come with him. He, he's barely scratched the surface. He'll be much bigger in a few years let's say it's a long time for him to put down but i'm enjoying watching people grow with other people it's not like leeching off someone the same size i don't see it that way i see them making friends with the streamers and growing their channels yep. simultaneously and it's just so nice to watch plus they're all great streamers and all great people i think i'm going to meet them all at twitchcon i'm so excited to meet that group um but i like that and then i think outside of that and moments with everyone else it was the inferno release and stream hop i was streaming at the time but hearing about how everyone would just stream hop everywhere and i was doing it myself before i go live that again i will wait for the day we get another runescape update that brings us something like that and i think they mentioned there might be these waves of the tasakal or something that might come out that it's not gonna be inferno i think it's gonna be inferno difficulty to the very last stage that update has the potential to repeat that but runescape players and streamers now are so talented at the game that anything that jaggets through in front of us is going to be beaten fast because people are just too intelligent to break things down these days yep now they'd have to do something okay so one thing is i don't know if you've noticed but over the past few weeks the inventory has been a little wonky and there's been problems with it um a cold the, one inventory in the game yeah in the game there's problems with oh, it extreme. Right, well, I'm staring at it right now. I don't know if I'm getting baited here. All right, it's look normal. at this. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you to do something. Drag an item. Drag one. You're fishing sharks, right? Yes. Drag a shark into an empty inventory spot, and then right click where the shark originally was. Does it pop up as null? You see no. that? No. Like if you drag a shark oh, and then click uh, where the in, shark. In, in the top left. In the top left, I got a null, yes, but right-clicking, no. Oh, let me try to do it fast. Yeah, got it. Okay, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, so that's a problem. And now here's another thing that happens. If you, cl- So I've uh, I've had some people come into my stream, and they said they've lost dragon claws to Fasanis because they accidentally dropped them. Now that's on them for not having price warnings. But if you hold shift, so like if you hold shift while you're in your inventory screen, and then F key to a different tab, so I'll click F3 to my prayer tab, then I release shift and go back to F2 to my inventory. Um, well, it's not happening now, of course. It's inconsistent, but, but generally, some of the time, what'll happen is when you go back to the inventory, everything's on shift drop, which is a huge problem, and it, it only happens occasionally, but this has been happening for the past few weeks. Anyway, oh. Uh- it's kind of weird you say that because I was playing. I've been playing LMS, and there was a point when I accidentally dropped all my gear yep. on the ground, yep. and I don't know how I've done it because I can't ever. Hit, I, can, I can hit control, and control. I think I can't remember what control does when I hit it, but I randomly dropped all my gear in a fight, and I was like, "What?" Yeah, that was happening to me nonstop two weeks ago when I was doing LMS. I just kept dropping my gear. I'm like, "What is going on?" Somebody told me. Um, and it happens kind of inconsistently. I think you have to do it somewhat quickly, or else if you, if you do it too slowly, it just kind of cancels oh, out. But when you play LMS, everything's zipping all over. Oh, yeah, so. it's awful. I would just be prepared to cast a barrage, and then all my mystics is on the ground. I'm like, what is going on? Um, the reason I brought that up is because a cold one, apparently somebody told me, I haven't actually heard from a cold one, but he said, apparently according to somebody else, that they are messing with the inventory because in Raids 3, there's going to be a punishing mechanic that swaps your inventory. That just moves items around. Oh, and, what, a bit like a Chaos Elemental taking all your stuff yeah, off? Yeah, something crazy oh, like that, which sounds... That's ex- going to be so annoying now, I think, <laughs> yeah. about it more. As long as it's, like, not something that's, like, guaranteed, if it can be avoided. Yes, Because that's going to be avoided. Cool. Yeah. But I can see things becoming very challenging for Raids 3. I love... I don't think Raids 3 will be, like, Inferno, because Inferno is just one set difficulty. With this, you can set Invocations. But I'm pretty sure yes. if you turn on every invocation, it's gonna be a bitch to do. That's yeah, that's where that's why I like the update because it brings it out and I don't know the difficulty. I think they've mentioned it's like TOB level below solo chambers level or something. So it's gonna be viable for most people to do. Mm-hmm. But then if you put the invocations on, there's better loots and all that. Yeah. So you can make you can optionally tweak it to be as hard as you want, but it caters to more of the game on the day of release. Yeah. So the easiest one you might be able to blitz through it with like armor or crossbows, let's say. But then obviously if you want to stick some inv- invocations on, no chance at all. And then the gear obviously gear advantage, you'll fly through everything anyway, but mm-hmm. 
We'll see. I'm excited for it. I think it comes out in August. I'm really hoping I'm back to streaming by then. I'd like to think I'm back to streaming. Um, but I'll give you the inside information. I'm hoping to be back to streaming on the 10th of June, if I'm honest. That's the plan right now. Um, so I'm still dealing with the recovery, but I'm going to attempt to go to a rave on the 2nd of June, which will be very sweaty. And if I can, it's an outside one, though, so I might try that. And if I can do that, I'm going on holiday with Jesse, and that's to test because, again, a foreign heat is good um for the like the sun on my skin mm -hmm. test that and if i don't get any relapse or anything from my recovery 10th of june is the time rough day it's not set in stone it might even is it a week i think it's a weekend but i just made that day oh yeah 10th of friday friday night or something i'm really hoping i can get back to streaming then that's my current plan but i don't know so the say bay cast can have the inside information there <laughs> well i'm excited it's it feels strange because I've been streaming for three and a half years, and every time, every single day, you would be live up in the category, pretty much first or second streamer on my following list, and it's just been so strange not seeing, you know, the Bodhi VV just sitting there. I mean, it's, it's weird for me because I was variety for three months, and then I played like a week of leagues, and then I had to begin my recovery, so I feel like I've not streamed RuneScape in going to be over half a year by the time I actually start Jesus. again. Which is kind of crazy. I mean, right now, like I said, it's the longest break I've had from streaming. I think I'm on day 115 of recovery right now. My longest break previously was when I died on Aussie, and I want to say that was like 76 day break. Right. So sailing. Um, there's something in the game with the polling system that basically the players already know everything that's coming to the game whenever it releases. So there's not really that hype or unexpected reward or something that can ever be achieved everyone knows everything now i think as well even if something invisible was added to the game i think rune light can find it or something like that we should ruin it mm -hmm. but the concept of sailing is if it was released as a skill you would have different islands you can sail to and that means that there's certain islands in the game that are locked behind a sailing skill that can't be accessed on day one as a rough idea so my example is you have raids four or raids five or something like that, which is at the final island, which requires 90 sailing to get to. So on the day of sailing's release, raids five is also in the game at the same time, but nobody can do it. So all the items from raids five do not enter the game. Everyone's racing to get their sailing skill to 90 to go through this raid, where you also need a team to go and do it. And it's like, I imagine someone streaming and they get 90 and go check the raid out and no one knows what it looks like. And he has like 50K viewers or something. <laughs> and then you get a team you can start grinding it and then finally the items come in the game and all that and these items like they're in the game from day one of this update but they don't come into the game till day 14 let's just say yeah. as an example so there's loads of hype around that because it kind of gives us a slight feeling of an item in the game that you can't get and you have to in in a way oh that's well the whole concept of sailing is it have like ten, no, nine different islands it would be a free to play and a pay to play skill, but free to play would cap at like level 30 or something. Um, and then obviously if you subscribe, you can continue. So the first two islands would be free to play. One could be like a training dungeon, moss giants or whatever. The second one I thought of a really good boss, which was kind of like Hespori and Zora combined. Sorry, Chronazon and Hespori combined where you have to cast like uh, wind, uh, wind, water, earth and fire blast on mm. things around it. But the only way to successfully do it is to have the max mage bonus in the game. There's no leggings that give you mage bonus. So if you're wearing chaps, you have to take the chaps off to get this attack. So it adds a bit of mechanics to it. And then you kill the boss. I was thinking of some giant toad or something that just licks you or whatnot. <laughs> um, but then the boss could drop you some mage gear that allows you to keep your chaps on or your rune plate legs. Just, it's a major range boss. Uh, keep the chaps on without you dropping below the mage bonus required. Now, I'm not a free to play PK player, sorry. I don't know if the free-to-play community wants any updates, so that's me saying this, that I don't know what they want, but I just thought that'd be a decent concept for a boss where you, it's like the the clues, the master clues, you need a magic bonus level high to have a 100% success rate. Otherwise, you can't do it, let's say, because Max Mage in free-to-play is literally, I want to say it's a wizard hat, wizard top, mag amulet of magic, and a staff. I don't know if there's anything else that gives any mage bonus. I might be missing something random, but... yeah. But then if you have that, you have to take off your chaps and maybe your shield to get that mage bonus high enough. And it could drop a set that maybe you can just keep wearing or something. I don't know. 
But yeah. those islands are available to free to play. Um, and then after that, their, their skill caps. They can't tra- they can train it, but they won't get any experience. It just gives you the invisible XP drop and says you need to be pay to play. Don't know if Jagets would get more members from that. It doesn't lock them out of anything because obviously they could release the skill just as pay to play skill only and they don't even get it at all. Maybe they prefer that. But you can release it where you've got islands and you've got random events that can occur while you're training sailing between the islands and when you get to the islands there's things on it like we can have a new herb patch we can have slayer dungeons new slayer bosses new bosses we can have islands catered to each region we can have a karamja island like a tazar island a volcano island all that stuff um personally i'd like to see raids whatever raid you put on the last one be like a volcanic vibe and just make it really really difficult like tecton looking room area but not the defense bonus of tecton yeah but the way it would work is training the skill on day one if you use charter boats you can charter boat everywhere you get sailing experience to charter boat around the game capped once you can only do it once i give you a bit you get sailing experience from cabin fever um maybe the pirate's treasure i think would be a good one because that helped the free to play out it's a very small experience but there's just those if you've already beat the quest then you can talk to an npc to optionally get it depending if you don't want to train sailing um but it's just that's just the rough concept i don't really know how you train it but you can also sail out to the middle of the ocean you could dive down underwater you can have a shark boss an underwater agility course underwater like treasure hunt or something like you can have a timer similar to the sepulchre where if you fail it you drown and you just die and you go back somewhere or something so you can have things like that with like treasure at the end similar to the camdos or vault loads of things like that that can go underwater and you boss underwater where if you get an item it attaches to the max cape or something that also works as a fishbowl so you can wear full barrows or whatnot you could have mini games under that i don't know mini games would be dead on release but and I then think, you get the final island to have like raids or bosses or slayer dungeons, maybe a PvP island or something that'll yeah. probably be dead. But the concept is sailing releases 25th of December, Merry Christmas, everyone. No one can access all the content I just said instantly. Yeah. They have to level the sailing skill up first and then explore everything. It's like getting Zaya again, but better in my opinion. And it, because it's locked, it has this permanent hype around it. I think it'd be really successful on Twitch biased obviously because i think i'd benefit from it but anything successful on twitch is advertisement for the game i think a lot of veterans would return to train sailing to test out these new islands or the new raid at the end of the game and as long as you built the skill to be enjoyable there's so much you can do you know you can have a random event where you run into a pirate ship and you've got something like cabin fever or something to do and then if you beat them you get some pirate stuff or whatnot or some gold doubloons that trade in for some coins or something it, there's an infinite amount of things you can do because with sailing you've got the ocean you've got everything under the ocean you've got islands you can put anything on and you've got you know you can have a freaking random event of a tsunami comes and kills you if you're not ready for it or something like that and you can things act- like that there's so much concept but that's my sailing concept roughly word of mouth I was going to say, you could even have an actual flying dragon now. Every every dragon we have in the game right now is just a drake, basically. But you could have, like, a legit flying thing in the middle of the ocean attacking your ship. I was also... I was talking to BC Guppy. Um, he's one of, like, the OGs that was, like, up with Lake at the time, Iron Man-wise. Um, back in early Iron Man days. But we were talking about sailing and talking about how you actually get a fresh... Like, the team could have a fresh slate at PvP. They could make sailing... They could make a PvP-based sailing, and they could balance it perfectly. Well, that's, I mean, obviously very hard, but you don't have any, like, dogma behind PvP where things need to be that because of nostalgia or anything. You could just create a fresh slate. I think that would be incredible. Yeah, it'd be very hard. Most people would obviously just want to train the skill to get places rather than PvP, mm-hmm. but you don't want to try and compete and make it like Sea of Thieves or something because it would probably always be inferior to that game. So yeah, you don't want to true. have a beat budget Sea of Thieves out there. So PvP-wise, I think you could maybe add an island that might extend to the wilderness. So it can be, I don't know, you dock off this island or something and then you can step into the wildy and then they've always talked about this mage bank expansion so you could step off and the island could be connected to a new upper level of the wilderness or something yeah. but or maybe because you could probably get the entrance camp to something by people so as soon as you sail off you get caught but because that'd be the hot spot people would pop there basically for the fights but things like that there's an infinite amount of potential that you could truly do with it as for training the skill you can get some experience by just doing some quests and doing some charter boats can get you some easy levels at the beginning and then the way to train it i think you just have to sail to an island and 
from there i don't know if you have to repeat the cabin fever quest and beat some pirate ship or something because it might be boring or you make it a really fast skill you do a sailing and get like a dungeoneering experience drop or something but that's my kind of idea i feel like everyone's down for sailing too well anybody that's down for a new skill is totally cool with sailing i feel like that's just the best overall skill that everybody wants there's there's some people that lean toward art first of all i think artisan's one of the worst skill ideas of all time because it just traps you 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 can't skill unless you're doing artisan which is just like ugh. but um i know bard i know caveman only was uh talking about bard bard's a really cool concept it's very fleshed out but i think people want the adventure and they want the combat mixed in with a new skill which sailing would just excel at with what i said i think if that was polled it would pass but it's the dev time taken to create everything i just said it's like 20 plus updates in one yeah for sure But it's one of those updates that in my opinion if they created that and it released it would be like day one of old school again the hype would be insane everyone's doing it you're not doing it because you have to do it you're doing it because you want to do it you want to unlock everything that's just come with and then all the new methods come out and everyone has to work things out and all this stuff and we get a new we get a new hair patch so all the iron men are happy okay i have a couple topics that i'm just browsing around no specific one i'll link but uh people have been asking for a funny irl story about torvesta and a funny story about wooks if you have any yeah. Funny story about Torvesta. Um, I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind is when I think he drove Rig back after an event and he accidentally, like, bumped his car on something <laughs> yeah. and, like, the entire car fell off and he's in the middle of nowhere. So I don't drive at the moment, so I don't know how that is actually bad. I think he put it on, like, with sellotape or something. He put it back on with. I really can't remember. Um, Other than that, the first time I went for a meal with Torvesta, he ordered his steak well done. Oh, God. He ordered it well done. Oh, my God. What is... What? Torvesta, of all people, he really does that. Yeah, yeah. I won't speak much, obviously, when he's not here. He's a bit of a picky eater, though, but he still goes (laughs) out. He gets done that medium and medium well now, so he's converted. But, no, I mean, there's not much funny to say about Torvesta. He's, again, he's pretty well grounded. He's very successful for his age. I'm obviously good friends with him. I see him more than any of the content creator, I think, right now. Yeah, I think so, because him, we basically, he lives near me, and we just go for steaks out in town and talk about stuff and all that business and chat about whatever the hell we've been doing recently. He's a so no, fantastic creator, by the way. His recent videos have just been so incredibly done. Like, his, Yeah, his so style well is... I feel the style of YouTube follows Torvester and Settled very much. Yes, yes. And then you get some people who are crazy talented, like Ingus is out there and Guns Chili with their edits mm-hmm. and such a fantastic... There's a lot of brilliant YouTubers. And then you get people like me and Alkin where we just talk and chat <laughs> shit the whole time. Yeah. But, I love my yeah. style, man. Yeah, no, it's it's cool when you've made your YouTube kind of catered toward just quick uploads, you know? I mean, you could just, like you said, pop out a video in five days, just record some clips, and it just pops off because, you know, people want to yeah, know what I you're doing. Yeah, I don't know if I'll ever learn to edit because I kind of just like my style again, and it's like I ask myself, why do I want to edit? And there's there's no there's no nothing inside me that wants to try and compete with other YouTubers really mm-hmm. in a way via the editing styles. I actually edited a video recently, and I have talked. I'll call it the Torvester style, where you just basically put a RuneScape backing track and then edit a sound on top and then cut to live commentary. It's a PK video. It's impossible to make a PK video good without doing something like that. I've realized. So I edited it, and I'm really happy with it. Comes out way later though. Um, but oh, I was about to say it and I forgot. Yeah, so with my videos, we had the conversation as well. Torvest was saying, like, why don't you use more clickbait titles and use like thumbnails or something? I use a thumbnail every now and then. I might have a, I mean, all my titles are just gibberish. You can say they're all clickbait to be. <laughs> true and all that but i think the reason is it's just it's just how i started youtube is again and i never cared for the paycheck or anything the money comes with my videos i want to title my video what i want i don't really care for a thumbnail i can put it there if i want to it takes five seconds for me to make one so it's not like i'm being lazy or anything i just can't really be bothered sometimes i do but the way i saw it as well is with my youtube channel one my channel should be dead like someone <laughs> who's as many breaks from YouTube as I have and kind of recycled the hardcore content for the time I have, it should be dead. And I don't know how it's not, but I think it's just something to do with how I style my videos. And I've realized recently with my videos, 
my style is what I call a chronological order clip dump. I basically record a video in chronological order, put it all in, boom, video's done. Maybe had a tiny bit of editing. But what I've also realized I've actually done over time is I've kind of stress test my channel so much. And because I don't really mind about growing, I'm happy with what I've got with the channel. I feel like I haven't really set a bar with any videos. I'm at the floor, if anything, I'm at a foundation. There's no real expectation that people have for one of my videos. They are literally just me and my pure enjoyment of the game and what I've done. That is it. It's kind of just an update video at the end of the day. My only bar or ceiling would be one man army that I did so long ago that that's just kind of gone. That's what grew the channel. But the fact that I don't have like this bar or anything that I need to deal with again is just less stress on me. And you know, that's why I think YouTube's the easiest thing in the world. If I wanted to edit, I could. It took me an hour, maybe two to edit a video because they have K Sharks or something and get stuff done. But I just like my style of video. I watch my own videos back before I even put them out and I can actually enjoy my own video. And I don't know like how many people watch their own videos and enjoy them. But some, like I, sometimes I can watch my video and something happens. And the way I do it is obviously I try and I do my own kind of humor. Like my humor is what I like. I'm watching my own video and I can laugh at my own video <laughs> at times. I don't know if that's bad to say, but... <laughs> no, I think it's, it's honest. Cool it is. I think it's cool. It's like I randomly, I randomly caught a scream after I opened a clue with nothing in and just things like that. I just find them funny. So even yeah. though it's my own video, my own content, <laughs> I can enjoy them. But no, I like what I do on YouTube. I feel like if I ever wanted to actually put in some effort, I could probably increase it a lot. I won't have a match like Torvesta framed and settled and their big yeah. YouTubes out there. But in all honesty, there are some people like Gunj Tilly and Ingus. They should be far surpassed me. My channel should be just... I mean, obviously, I've been doing it for years, so I'm a bit ahead of them in that way. But the mm -hmm. talent on RuneScape YouTube... We are in the golden age of RuneScape YouTube. Yeah. The only downside is everyone has to wait for a stupid sponsor to upload their videos. So they're all yeah. sat on like 20 videos. And like, <laughs> as soon as they sign the sponsor, they're like, all right, fine, I'll release the video. I'm like, bro, you didn't upload a video for 40 days. Give me my damn video. <laughs> I'm the last person to say that because I take like a month to make a video half the time. Oh, but the talent on RuneScape YouTube right now is incredible. You know, we've got Soup, we've got Framed. Yeah. Um, we've literally got Settled, completely leading everybody of Settled. Torvesta, I like Torvesta's style as well. I think it's all brilliant. It's real. I'm speaking about Settled, it's cool to go back. I think it was like a year or so ago. I went back to his super old videos of him just making UIM progress videos. And just everything about him, like his voice and everything. I know he was a lot younger back then, but... He's just fit into who he is now, and it's just so cool. Like, just now, the, now we have the settled who is settled. You know, back then you're a little timid. You're kind of uh, not really sure your style of video, but it's so cool to see when a person just blooms, and it's just like, all right, this is. Yeah, settled won't pave the way though, because I mean, again, you can see now he started the tile man series, and then every YouTuber was like, oh, let's do the tile <laughs> thing because it's I mean, that's the popular thing. If there's anything wrong with copying another YouTuber? when it's the popular thing, because you can put your own spin on it and your mm -hmm. audience will like it. You know, when I made my bow tile account and just suicided it straight away, everyone was like, damn it, I actually kind of wanted to see this. I have no plans, it's one of those I'd rather watch. Uh, but we've settled, Eve, I think I want to go back, but with his Swampletic series, he kind of paved the way for the whole storytelling transitions yeah. through the clip. Because with me, I look back at what I did with One Man Army and I don't really know if there's anything that I paved the way for, except for maybe just doing RuneScape series or something. I know that Framed made some good ones out there, but I don't think there's anything I did on YouTube that's done it. Settled has just stamped his... Every video you watch, you just feel there's a bit of Settled in the video from what he's done. Torvesta, both of those two, I feel... I watch a video and I have this... I feel this, like aura that there's a bit of settled in this video inspiration there's a bit of torvester in this video both of them's leading the charge right now for content creators yeah it's really crazy because when i watch a torvesta video i think nothing really is special about this it, at least at first glance you're just seeing it and you're just enjoying the whole thing but you don't see anything in particular that just like sticks out like wow that was crazy but everything together is so well done because when you I've tried to edit my own videos every time. It just turns out like, uh, it, at least in my opinion, like this is nowhere near any of the top OSRS creators. And then you start realizing how much talent is really going into this and how much practice and just effort they're putting into these videos, even though it seems effortless to them or to us seeing what they do. It's pretty crazy. Torves's videos yeah. are insane right now. And they seem so simple. Yeah, the thing with Torves's videos as well is it is... 
so basic and all that but it's the way he edits his transitions yeah. and how it, the, the pacing i'd use the pacing of the video yeah is what makes one of tall vesta's videos really really good in my opinion yeah exactly. and then you have settled and right now i think the the tile man series he currently has is the fastest passing time videos i watch i watch a 20 20 minute video and it just ends and i'm like that was 20 minutes it completely flies by so i'm really enjoying that series it was pretty fresh for him as well because he has access to like the whole game now well not yet but he will have access to the whole game yeah yeah okay i see a topic from let me just make sure we didn't okay um Topic from a cold one. He asks, best advice you can give to any streamer other than if someone's bothering you, just ban them. It'll sort itself out. I, I, this is, I'm going to be honest, this is my least favorite question ever. Um, <laughs> the whole, can you give advice to a new streamer? Yeah. You want my advice? Go find the Twitch etiquettes on YouTube or Google or Twitter that get 20,000 retweets. And don't do any of them unless they're generally <laughs> just like good manners or something like and respect. Do your own stream, you know. My stream's like my stream's just the biggest like I don't know, just like go in there and every like it's will look at it's will it's will so successful and there's no rule he follows that's on there. He just goes in, it's chaos every stream. That's enjoyable. If you follow these etiquettes and all that, you're just blending in with everyone. Now, I want to say don't go against them because some of them are generally polite. Like, don't go to another stream and link your stream. Like, don't do things like that. Don't mm -hmm. tell someone you're going live. They are, like, just genuine human being manners. But as for advice for a new streamer, turn your stream on and do you. Literally just do you. Don't really... I mean, you could take some traits from other streamers and put twists on them, but again, don't go live. I mean, like, speaking with Z's as your vocabulary and dropping Waller and 20 packs and all that. You're just copying other streamers, and if you copy them, you're always in their shadow. Do your own thing. Throw twists on it if you want. But other than that, anyone that says, like, the whole, like, be consistent and all that, I don't know, man. Like, just... Turn your stream on when you want to have a good time and that will reflect on your audience. Whoever wants to watch you is going to be there. But I don't really know. Another reason why I hate this question is because I'm not a new streamer and I've not been a new streamer for 11 years. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to be a new streamer right now. What you should is take this question and ask someone with 50 viewers or 100 viewers because they, one, will be super happy that you asked them that because it's kind of like, oh, I'm doing well. This guy wants advice from me and not freaking Boaty or something. But <laughs> yeah. big streamers, like they're all like, yeah, just be consistent, you know, have a schedule. It's all bullshit, mate. Honestly, just do you, <laughs> have fun, go live whenever you want. And if you generally want to answer that question, go and ask a streamer with 50 or 100 viewers. They will have a better answer for you because they might tell you what they did to do their success. Yeah. Now, there is a lot of luck in streaming as well. They could have got that look as well. But you'll be able to tell as well that any streamer that has 50 plus viewers is technically, in my opinion, a good streamer. And obviously, if you don't have 50 yet, keyword is yet, you will get there eventually. If you're on one or two right now, you have to keep at it, you know. So there you go. Keep at it. Nice. All right. Here's a here's an interesting question from Uwu Amy. And she asks, do you ever get imposter syndrome about your importance as an OSRS OG? If so, how do you deal with this? Also, she asks, do you ever see yourself moving away from OSRS for different content in the future? May I ask what imposter syndrome is? That is like when you don't think you're doing anything special and like you're people think you're more talented than you really are. Like um it happens a lot with uh like photography. Well, at least my brother it deals with imposter syndrome. He he'll, he'll make advertisement, he'll make videos and stuff and he just doesn't see anything special about it. He feels like anybody can do it, but he's wrong cuz he's actually gotten really good at it, but he just thinks everyone can do it cuz he can do it. And so it's. I mean, yeah. uh, what's the question? Do you ever get imposter syndrome? I mean, I think I have it in general. I consider myself personally overrated. Mm -hmm. I think um, I might be considered like overrated at the game. Uh, actually, I don't want to say anymore because I think now there's so much more talent out there that no one talks about me to actually be a good player. So that's gone now. But, uh, you know, I mean, maybe overrated as a streamer, there's overrated as a YouTuber. There's a lot more talent out there than myself. So if you get an imposter syndrome, I don't let it bother me because I just do my thing and that's all I care about, you know. I don't care what other people... Oh, it doesn't bother me because I'm having fun every single day, really. Um, so do I get it? I don't think I get it. 
uh, to be honest. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Uh, how do I deal with it? Again, I just do my own thing. I don't really care about anything else or all that stuff. Um, I did say that it's like, you think you're a fraud or all that. Again, the, the RuneScape community put me on the top um, just by supporting me. And I'd like to think that while I was on the top, I've done some good deeds and all that to show that thank you for putting me here. This is physical, real things I'm doing to say thank you. I'm not just going to be like, hey, guys, thanks for supporting me. Cheers for everything, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm actually doing to show that a lot. Uh, do I see myself ever moving away from old school for different content in the future? No, I do not. Uh, I, going back to what I said before, this game, I love it. And now I'm doing this collection log. <laughs> Ten years in the future, I've not completed this collection log. Um I got myself into a stage where when I have a late game hardcore Iron Man, I'm completely happy and content with everything I've got and then I die and lose it. Now I've got this collection log, I'm enjoying this about, I'm going to say a fraction less than a late game hardcore. I love the hardcore game mode when it's late game. It's so fun to just have to pay attention and quickly math out if I can survive situations and then panic teleport. I love panic teleporting. There's something about messing up and knowing I've messed up and teleporting instantly that I just knew in my heart I was playing hardcore really well. Minus the messed up, but that's human error yeah. against my reaction I was happy with. But no, now I started this collection log. I can put time into other games. I've got my roller coaster tycoon playthrough. I've got a Valheim playthrough as well. I might play some games like Elden Ring and all that eventually. But as for moving away from old school permanently, no. It would there's absolutely no way it'd ever happen. Even if I played some new game a year from now and I was number one on Twitch, like bazillions of subs and all that. As soon as I'm done with the game, I'm back on RuneScape and I'll bring my bazillion of subs to RuneScape to comply. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I've always uh I, I I think I knew the answer. I think you've always been the forefront of just you are actually very passionate about this game and it just shows every time and i I even remember back when like a friend kind of sold out briefly to some stuff and you i just remember you were just saying like it just sucks when like people move on from the game sort of but like i don't know it always felt like you are really just the pinnacle of osrs content creation so that's just cool to hear and you help. Oh, thank you very much. And you help other content creators grow, and I've seen it. And I've talked to a lot of people that are absolutely just over the moon that you've supported them personally. And uh, I know BF Rocket is one of the biggest examples of that. He loves you, and like I love him as a content creator. And the fact that you like helped him out when you obviously, you know, you don't need to do this stuff. I know you're showing your support, but it's just amazing to see what you've done. So many people have so much good stuff to talk about to say about you and it's just really cool well i just enjoy it you know like again the way i see it is the runescape community again going back to that question of how, how do i stay motivated on the top i don't i just i just got given the top spot by the runescape community and again i don't take that for granted so i'm there like how can i prove i don't take to, for, take it for granted i don't have to prove anything but i'm like you've trusted me with this I'm living the dream. You know, I've got everything I could ever want in life because of everything the RuneScape community has given me. It's simple as that. So I give back to the RuneScape community to the best of my ability where I can, you know, and that's just kind of why I did all that stuff. It wasn't to prove anything. I just simply wanted to do it straight up and I enjoyed it a lot as well. So it's good. But again, most of that is just, I, I'm, I want to try and help other people's streams grow. I know as a person how enjoyable it is to stream as a full-time job, as a full-time career, it's enjoyable. If I can help push someone and get them to that point, this person is now living their one life on this planet, living a potential dream that cost me some money that I get from my Twitch subs, you know? At the end of the day, that's like, I wouldn't really say I've changed anyone's life. I, I might have changed someone's life by like who I am, but from like donating them some money or something, I can't see it. But if I gave them that tiny little nudge of, nudge of motivation or gave them that little thing that maybe pushed them to a breakthrough maybe let's say then i don't take any what's the word credit for that because obviously anyone i go to is a talented streamer and just an all-around good guy there's no one i've ever donated to that is not a good person at heart and anyone like that is someone i want to see succeed personally it's definitely within runescape as well so no if anyone's ever done any success from something i did for them there's no credit for me it is the fact that whoever they are is either a talented creator or simply just a good person nice Okay, we got a topic from UNTC, and he asks, what is one of your proudest achievements outside of RS and streaming? And then, what do you wish you had done differently in your career? 
Uh, right, so when this proudest achievement thing, can it be not related to RuneScape Plus streaming in any way? Yep. Oh, God, do I even have one? Uh, I know the proudest moment of my life, It was it's RuneScape related, but I'll say it quickly because it's good, but it's when I did my first charity stream, I got interviewed by people, and my, it was at my parents' house, and my, my dad got interviewed, and I was there watching, and my dad basically said that he was proud of me, and I watched that live, and Aww. that's probably the proudest moment of my life, I think, currently. Um, however, RuneScape related. Going away from that, what is the proudest moment of my life? I don't think I've got any, mate. I'm not gonna lie. Um, because your whole twenties has been RuneScape centered, so it's hard to my, even. My RuneScape is my life. Yeah. Like I've played it since I was eight. Is there anything? Like I mean, I'm going back to when I won a gold medal doing like the hurdles or something in Sports <laughs> Day Year Eight. Right at this point. Um, pro oh, I could say this actually. So when I was going back to my interviews that I mentioned before, I nailed all my interviews from streaming talents, but it wasn't streaming related. Um, when I went to university, I was offered a course where 17,000 people applied for the course and only 17 actually got in. I was one of the 17. So wow. one of the thousand success rate is like dentistry level as far as well, which is one of the hardest things to do. But this university course that I was doing was a paid course, so I didn't have any tuition fees. So I saved like 36,000, I think it was. They paid for it, 27. Um, and I, again, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd use the word proud. I think if I, I think now if I had to explain something, I think obviously I'd be quite proud that I was one out of the 17. But I never thought of it that way when I actually managed to get it. But maybe it was the fact that when I got onto, because I dropped out of university, but I dropped out of a degree that 17 out of 17,000 people got onto. Mm -hmm. And also it was completely paid for. So I, it makes me ask myself the question, how many people that ever got this ever dropped out? Am I the only one ever who did it? Because I had something better going for me. Yeah. So I don't really know, but maybe that, because that's quite impressive. I think now I think about it. Um, other than that, the proudest moment, I don't know, mate. Friggin', I didn't graduate university, you know. I got, I got an A in some A levels or something. <laughs> I think that's probably it, to be honest. There really isn't anything I'm too proud of that is not going to be related to RuneScape in any way. Yeah. Okay, what do you wish you had done differently in your career? Um. Okay, I wish I took the de Deadman donations from day one. Uh, so, <laughs> Deadman mode, I was so adamant that I tried my best to not take donations. I always took a D C me. But I was trying to play the game mode fair as if I was a normal player to prove it was possible. And I basically bled like eight deadman modes where I just quit them all because I got killed by PKs because it's impossible to actually play. Plus, it's even harder as a streamer. I wish I just took donations and just PK'd all the time and killed the game mode myself. It's one of my regrets. The game mode's so busted. It's so flawed. I wish I was part of the problem, personally. I would have had good streams. Um, people would say that I fell off in Deadman mode. I fell off because I tried to play fair. Every other content creator would take big donations like Alfie and all that. I don't want to obviously bring them down, but they take donations and go rush the best content in the game. Yep. Obviously, I've got to compete against that and I've got to ruin Simi on day two or something. So that's one of my regrets, I think, because I should have abused all the dead mans. Not from a business-related point of view, but I look back and I kind of wish I'd just done more out of Deadman. Yeah. Um, anything else I wish I'd have done differently? I don't really know, to be honest. I think, I think I've been quite happy with most of my decisions and how I've done things. Most answers to that, I'd be looking back in full hindsight, which is things like, I kind of wish, obviously, I moved on from hardcore to do collection log earlier because I knew how my hardcores would all die, but I obviously don't know that in the moment. Plus, I enjoyed all my hardcores, so maybe not, but there's an example of that. But... I don't really know, to be honest. I think um, another one could have been towards the end of my one-year marathon. I didn't really hype the marathon up that much. Um, so the one-year marathon just kind of ended and no one really cared. So, you know, people probably forgot I even did it. And a one-year marathon on Twitch is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. I don't. I think there's only one other RuneScape streamer who did it, and that was Death Reaper 7. He did a one-year marathon and succeeded it. Uh, I know Sick Nerd recently did it. He stopped because he just wanted a day off. Good. If you want to do a one-year marathon, my advice is one, don't. But if you're going to, <laughs> the day you hit the point where you don't want to do it anymore, just stop. Because what will happen is you will now stream because you have to and not because you want to. Yeah. And that happened to me in Q4. I think it's like November and December. First 10 months I was there, like, it's fine. But then it's like your whole social life kind of gets hit. You know, you can't really go out or do anything because you've got to stream the next day. I actually went out to a, um, I was on like this party with my friends and I was so hungover the next day. 
But then I was at Warehouse Project, which is like a techno or just a rave club in the UK the same night. So I had to go to this party and then I woke up so hungover the next day because I was apparently drinking gin from a bottle. <laughs> I had to stream five hours before I went out to my other one. And that, that, that was horrible. But that's obviously me self-inflicting that to myself. Yeah. No, but, they sound extreme. I'm, I'm doing a month marathon right now. I'm 17 days in. So right after this recording, I'll, I'll stream for a few hours. But I don't set myself a certain time. I just have to go live every day, which is good for me. But yeah, every single day for a year, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could ever do that, actually. Just I would want to yeah, take Yeah, when off. I did it as well, I made it harder. So I had to also stream five hours minimum oh, every single God. day or two hours minimum if I was away from my setup. Yeah. Just so I can't be like, hey guys, I'm live, the day counts, peace off, you know? So yeah. I did it properly. It was hard and I don't recommend anyone does a one year marathon personally. It's, in all honesty, I don't think people would do it because they saw what happened with, I can't remember his name, but there's a streamer that streamed like every day for five years. I should know his name, but in this moment I can't. No need to put it in the comments if anyone's listening. I know who it is, but people kind of like, oh, this guy blew up on Twitch. He got his, all his success from this massive marathon he did. And he took breaks now, and now he actually streams normally, but he built his career from that. I don't think streaming every day for a year is a good way to grow yeah. on Twitch. It would be far better for you to stream less and have more energy in your shorter streams than forcing yourself to go live every year. I don't think it's a way to grow to do something like that. Um, I'm seeing the subathons nowadays. Subathons are a bit worrying to me. I think eventually, small to mid tier streamers, again, not to bring anyone down, when is the point going to happen that they need to rely on doing a subathon once a month or once every other month in order to find, stay financially stable with streaming? You know, yeah. if a streamers are announcing subathons every single month, it defeats the purpose, in my opinion. Subathon. If I ever did one, I, I, I actually want to do one for charity, for a, a topical steroid withdrawal charity. Um, I don't know how to do it, though, because, again, I've just got through my recovery. I want to get outside and go live some life rather than shut myself in for two months in a subathon. But I think I could probably, if it's a charity subathon, I could probably make a massive difference. I don't think I'd get, like, massive money like Ludwig or any of that, but even if I managed to, like, double my sub count for three weeks, let's say, it's still a good chunk that I could maybe donate away. I'd like to do that, but one, I don't know if there's any TSW charities out there currently. Um, and two, again, I don't, I, I'm someone that likes to get out. I, I like the reason I enjoy the game and everything so much is I get outside a lot, you know, I'm yeah. constantly doing things. I don't even know if I can go to the gym during a subathon. Um, I can't go out to see my friends. It's basically you sign this unofficial contract that you have to stream for this amount of time. And because of the financial incentive included, you've got to do it. Yeah. And the whole concept of being forced to do something you can't get out of i don't like that yeah. so if it's for charity i've got a reason but i'd probably end up capping on it like maybe 30 days or 45 days or something and just do it in the middle of february when nothing happens something <laughs> like that but i don't know but it worries me a touch on subathons because it's a thing to do if you're a streamer give it a go you can make some good money from it and get supported quite a bit and hopefully have a good time but if it becomes the point where you're streaming and you have to rely on a monthly subathon or a bi-monthly one to kind of be financially stable, it's a little scary at that point, I think. So yeah. by all means, do it. If it keeps you streaming and living the dream, do it by all means. But a little scary for thinking that concept that you have to kind of resort to that in a way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Those for sure. like ones where you sleep on stream, it's a little bit intimidating. I I, I struggle with sleep. I, I I like I'd be sleeping on stream, tossing and turning all over <laughs> yeah. the place. Like I don't think I can even do it. I, when I think of a subathon, I think of just like a a thirty hour cap one day event sort of thing, not like a just record myself sleep i don't even know i would need to like pre-record myself sleeping just so i don't do anything weird q neeks by the way was doing that he did like a i think it was almost like half a month or something like that of a stream -a yeah, really really good so i said though again like if you're a good streamer and quinique's is a great streamer uh, he's got a supportive community he pulls 15 days out and his stream is again not to bring him down it's a small stream to have a 15 day subathon on a small stream that is that's good you know that's a, a bit of money in his bank account everybody had fun my guess is that he'll do it again but let's just say that he needed that subathon to pay all the bills yeah. he now has to do a subathon let's say every month and it's 15 days of his life like 
you know, getting there and doing, not saying that's his situation, but that's a situation where some streamers might find themselves. And it's a great technique. If you want, you want, you want the 500 IQ one, this is how you do it. You do a subathon on the first of every single month, every single month, <laughs> cap it for two weeks. That's when everyone gets paid. So everyone's going to donate your shitload of money. But everyone that subscribes to you, when they come back to your stream, it says, do you want to sub again? So they're like, oh yeah, I might as well sub again for the next subathon. And yeah. then you retain the sub. 500 <laughs> IQ one. That's how I do it, you know. I have so many like slimy mindsets of how to genuinely maximize revenue on Twitch. If I did them, I'd be a genius, but I think my channel would probably be dead because everyone would be like, yeah, this guy's just scraping so all the money from the, but like my viewer has literally like a penny, like it's like stuck between his sofa and I'm coming for that penny basically. That's where I'd be. <laughs> the reason I brought up Nick was just like when he was sleeping, you just had this weird like, moment he, he would just have these weird moments every 15 minutes when he's sleeping and he would just like almost start like waving his arms sort of I'm like what is going on that's why i need to pre-record myself and just in case i'm doing some weird like snorting and moving my arms and stuff because who knows i've never recorded oh, myself my, sleep. I, I would be like i don't like sleep par i get sleep paralysis all the time i love it but i wonder what that looks like from the outside <laughs> yeah yeah it's it was scary. Everyone is monk of Christing in uh, in his stream when ah. we were there, just watching him sleep. That is, by the way, that is like so weird to think about. You're in a chat room with 150 people watching somebody sleep. Like, what is going on? That's so. I think strange. it's more the chat activity there. I don't know if you have text to speech or if they leave you uh, sorry videos up or something for people to watch, but. I think most subathons lose viewers during sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, but again, obviously, the community is there. You know, I, I have people in my Twitch chat today. I've not streamed in almost four months, and there's people still in there, you know. So if I was sleeping, I'm sure they'd be there just chatting to each other and hoping I'm having a nightmare <laughs> or something like that. It's my biggest fear. Like, you know, you know when you're like trying to sleep and you're hit by the train or you fall off and you suddenly jerk awake? <laughs> that just happens yeah. on the subathon. Everyone's there laughing at you. The worst thing ever is where your just legs just jolt and your entire body wakes up. You're like, what the oh. hell just happened? You get, you get the. Um, have you ever had the calf cramp? <laughs> no. Uh, oh yes, like the Charlie you horse kind of. It's just like you get yeah your, your calf cramps and it's the worst thing oh. ever and you just got that you're trying to stretch your whole chest just feels good man clapping like pain and all that stuff i've not had that calf cramp in ages but good god it's horrible i have this thing that occasionally happens when i'm sleeping i'll sleep on my arm and then my it's like in the inner bicep has this heat sort of like this sharp pain sort of that lasts for like eight seconds and it's like oh god i'm just like squeezing my arm that sounds like a medical issue, but like it happens occasionally. And it's just like the worst pain. It reminds me of the calf sharp pain, the lower part of your oh, calf. I've had uh, times when I sleep and I can like rest on my arm in a certain way that like takes all the blood flow away or something. I wake up and I cannot feel my arm yeah. completely <laughs> numb. You cannot can lift it. My... It's just dead. Yeah. completely but i can take <laughs> hold of it with my other hand and i feel it and it's literally just a lifeless arm yes and you, the best way to do that is you get up and you literally just relax your arm you don't you don't do anything you just relax it and the blood flow will come back and then obviously you start moving it around and stuff but that's yeah. always a weird one. Oh, it's so weird because you're feeling it it feels like somebody else's arm because you just can't feel it you're like what is going on i don't feel anything and you're there like is you're just hoping that feeling's gonna come by it always does in like 10 20 seconds yeah. you know what it is but first time i got that was terrifying i was like my arms died like i've literally <laughs> blocked the blood flow and it's just died all right um we got some good questions from fetal so i'll link this to you he asks, Quest speedrunning is coming soon. Opinion? I personally think Sepulchre is one of the greatest skilling updates in OSRS. What kind of skilling updates would you like to see? Thoughts on Jagex making Winter Todd type minigames? Cox is scuffed as fuck. Should they rework it? I'm not sure about that. I think Chambers of Zarek is amazing. Except for scuffed crystals. I think the crystals, just Ulm in general is a little wonky, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know about Chambers. I think Chambers... Let me think of everything. I mean, Tekton can be annoying if you miss your hammers and shit. It can take a long time. Mm -hmm. Vanguard's are the sickest room. Vespula's great. Um, Thieving sucks. I could. I mean, they've improved Mystics. it drastically, but yeah. The defense bonus of Mystics can be piss annoying when you hit zero every time. Thieving room sucks. Ice Demon's kind of okay now. Um, yeah, the Thieving room. They should change the Thieving room. I think that is just trash. What's the other one? The Ice Demon's fine. The Rope's obviously fine. The Crystals are great. One of the best rooms is the Crystals, I think. Uh, then the Combat Rooms. I think they're all fine. I'd say, if anything, maybe Tecton's defense is just annoying as hell. Yeah. The Mystic's defense can be annoying as hell. 
scuffed crystals i can understand yeah i don't know too much of a how you fix that though on that i think everything's basically fine um i've not done chambers in a while though so i think the update itself is brilliant apart from those minor things that i just said so i'd say change the thieving room and that's about it uh quest speed running i actually wanted this i remember requesting it at some point a while ago and i really wanted it because i like to speed run quests i realize now that if it came out i'd have literally zero rank ones Except if I was the first person to beat Dark's quest because you can't go any faster. But then even then, freaking Port Cazard or G Challenge Gem will find a way to save a game tick or something. So yeah. no record. But now that I've started the collection log, I don't really know if I have much interest in quest speedrunning now. I've managed to, with the collection log, I've just managed to rekindle myself, my pure love for the game. I play RuneScape. There's no separate mode. It's not Iron Man. It's not Hardcore Iron Man. It's not quest speedruns. It's not Deadman mode. It's not leagues. It's RuneScape. And I've just rekindled it so completely. When the next league comes out, I don't even know if I'm going to play it, to be honest. I feel like the only reason I'd play it might be a business-related one to just get the viewers that's there. I think I'm enjoying the main game too much to actually potentially want to play it. However, I wait for the concept because... Um, I didn't really get very far in the Shattered Relics, but I did enjoy the theory crafting I did throughout playing it. The thing with the, the actual things is I, I don't really ever have anything I'm interested in going for. I think with Shattered Relics, I think I wanted to get full Infinity, which I did, and then I wanted to go Tiki Grada with full Guthans, and then unfortunately I, had to, I was ill. So I don't really know. I think for me as a person, I enjoy the main game so much now and when I play hardcore that I don't need these leagues to come out. I think the leagues are coming out basically to have people resub and for people who are burnt from the game to come and play for two months. So when the league comes out, I think I will always play the first few days or weeks maybe of an update to see if I get into it, which is obviously also good because the viewer count's always way higher on the first day unless you're doing a big thing like Wooks when he did the Twisted League um, raids. Yeah. Um, but preparing right now, I think I'm not going to play. But I think I say this about every league and every dead man. And when it comes closer, I get more interested in that stuff. So see how it goes. But I'm enjoying the collection look so much. Uh, as for the Sepulchre, see, I, the Sepulchre is a strange one for me. I've greened the log, so I've completed the whole thing. But the Sepulchre is one of those updates where I really, really think that you plugins are basically mandatory now. So I like to play runescape without plugins you know i've played runescape my whole life i've played before plugins was even anything considered to it and i enjoy playing without them i just like to see the screen for what it is and i like to know the game rather than being like told the game or something the sepulcher is one of those where i told myself when i can finally beat floor five and loot that hallowed coffin i will choose then if i want to use plugins and it took me like seven hours to get one one run because I can't see shit in fixed screen and those stupid floor five final moments. Oh my God, it was so annoying. But then I turned the plugin on to dodge the actual arrows and the sepulcher is fantastic. I really wish Jagex would like kind of add an ability to just buy it with hallowed marks, like highlight arrows or something. Yeah. It gives people the play the game on vanilla, the ability to turn a plugin on. And obviously, if you've got the plugin on Runelight, you can just use it for free and not need to buy it, you know? I personally wouldn't mind, like, being able to buy something like that and use it instead. Or I could just turn the plugin on, which is obviously what I decided to do. Mm -hmm. So the support is one of the few places in the game where I prefer playing with a plugin actually turned on, to be honest. As for one of the greatest skilling updates in old school, I completely agree. I think the Sepulchre is fantastic. Yeah. I think it's better than the... Um, Apart from the sight issues, maybe I'm just blind. Maybe I'm just garbage at the game, but I can't dodge fire arrows and shitty lightning and garbage. I could now. I could probably blitz right now because I've done like 500... Well, I've done like 200 runs. Um, but no, I think the Sepulchre is probably the best one. It's great for agility because it feels like true agility, in yeah. my opinion. Um, the Guardians of the Rift is a close follow-up, but again, runecrafting, I already enjoy runecrafting. Agility's kind of... I consider agility borderline AFK skill. It's just so boring. It's a great one to watch movies and streams too, but again, it's slow. The Sepulchre, it has you completely locked in when you do it. That still being said, I don't know if I had to go for 99 agility on a new account. Would I do Sepulchre 92 to 99, or would I do RD? I'd probably do both. I think a bit of both. It'd be a nice break. But uh, thoughts on my Jagex making Winter Toad type minigames? Oh, what kind of skilling updates would I like to see? I'm neutral on that. I'll wait and see what they create. After Guardians of the Rift, I have very high trust in them creating Same. a good minigame. Whoever designed that, they did it well. And I think they'll design things very similar. And if there's anything bad, they'll patch it. 
uh, thoughts on Giants making winter toad type mini games. I like the social aspect. I wasn't streaming and I'd just come off my, or just been able to play the game again. And I was talking a lot at Winter Toad. I like chatting to people uh, in game. So I like those social aspects. One of my favorites was Twisted League as well. When everyone was fishing by the raids to get 15 agility, everyone was chatting to each other. I liked that uh, quite a bit, to be honest. So that's my thought there. It just depends on how much they change about the true skills, to be honest. I can't really think about it right now. I think the Guardians did not ruin runecrafting. I think the Sepulchre did not ruin agility. Winter Toad technically ruined fire making, but fire making is just <laughs> burning logs anyway, so it's yeah. pretty dead regardless. Um, I don't know if you've put the, the Zalcano in there or anything. I'm not too sure about that one, but I've never actually done that. But I, I like the social aspect to those mini games. But I'll wait and see. I have a uh, high, not high expectations, but high trust in Jagex after they've created Guardians of the Rift. Same. The J mods are honestly so competent right now. We have such a great team. They understand. It was they went through the whole phase of messing them on. Like, I, if you want to, if you want an update that I think ruined the game, Zulra initial releases, in my opinion, the point where everything started going downhill. Yeah, that thing's drop table was so disgusting. Yep. Other than that, obviously, there's still, whenever there's a system update, there's always, like, well, not always a rollback, but there's rollbacks here and there, mm -hmm. and things can go wrong quite a lot, if not almost every update right now. Yep. But I think on a level of actual content created, they're nailing the drop tables recently, I think, and overall, I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're starting to get clued more in of what's good for the future of the game, because things like Zora and Vorkaf, they're not, they're not viable in a way for the future of the game so the fact that they're now catered around things like god wars like cerberus drop table obviously ages ago on point straight away they release fantastic yeah. drop table sire was great too i love i it love things i love things like sire and like mithril dragons where you get a little piece and then that is the thing you turn in for the big the big boy drop you know mithril dragon grind was fucking awesome i love that i love going oh, for I a did, dragon full home i did it back in 2014 or probably even early, no, probably about 2014, and I got the Dragon Full Helm on Tude Bone number, I don't know, I, don't know, I killed 5,000 Myth Dragons. Um, it's not on my collection log. I did it so long ago, it's not counted on my collection log, yep. so I've got to do it again. But I'm it's quite a excited. Cool grind. Yeah, it's, it would be very nostalgic for you. You did that on uh, your one-man army series, right? Um, Is that what it was? No, I did it, I did it on Boaty because I just decided to kill 5K Myth Dragons because they were like, the, the Dragon Full Helm was like the rarest item in the game probably maybe rarer than third age i'm not too sure actually so i was like right i'm gonna kill five thousand mythical dragons i think i did it in like carols and a haster as well so it took a long time but if i do it now again i can play more because i'm full time now mm -hmm. and i'd have a lance and bandos or whatever the hell the best gear is yeah. i don't plan to use i think trident might be best but i'm an emilium so but i'm quite excited to do that now. that new uh staff they're coming out with a two-handed staff now from uh raids three they're they're replacing the two tick wand with it so that staff is just gonna dominate but you would need to drink super anti-fires i guess but oh if it deletes them from the game then that probably my go-to but again i with runescape i like melee more than any combat yep, style I, in a community. I agree with you i love being up in front in the boss that i've really i know we already kind of talked about it but yeah the whole bofa god wars every single god wars dungeon boss now is ranged every single one even next like just everything's ranged and it's like damn this is just boring like i want to just stab something you know yeah i think you could actually use melee on next and again when you say range it goes back to what i said before it's optional to use range if you follow the efficient methods to kill everything then yes it's range but you don't have to follow the efficient methods you can just gear up in melee like my zami grind i'm going to do the whole thing with an arc light and probably carols my grotto grind i'll use a scythe the whole time kree hour is all right crossbow and chins and then uh zillian is going to be twisted bow and then next is well whatever the hell next actually is these days but people can always choose you don't have to do the efficient methods or learn them if you don't want to you can go do what you want they are still viable they're just a bit less efficient technically true true okay so i actually made a community post on my youtube and we got some topics and i see one that is talking about um what collection log grind are you least looking forward to uh, I know the answer, but I've, my brain's gone blank. Is it a mini game? Uh, or is it... Let me open it. And yeah. I'm not looking forward to Court Beast because I think it's a long one and I can't viably solo the whole thing. It yeah. would take way too long. 
So I have to get some friends to do it with, which will be fun because I can meet some friends. But again, they've got to give me the drops and I've got to get every kill. I just feel like I'm using people. I don't know if you paid them splits from the Ellie's, but I want to make some money from Corp as well. So yeah. I'm not looking forward to Corp that much. Otherwise, let me go down all these. Uh, these are all fine. That's all good. Um, I'm not looking forward to the Tazar log, to be honest, because I kind of just want to get to Jad's and Inferno's. I have to go kill Tazar to get all the armor drops and weapons. So I'll get that out of the way though pretty fast, so it should be fine. The Tazar uh, mages are like the worst thing, because I think there's a 1 in 4k drop for that mage weapon thing. And oh, killing shit. mages sucks. Like I When I get to it, it should be fine. Um... Chambers of Light Challenge Mode, Theater of Blood, both are fine. I'll speedrun them. Clue Scrolls should be fine. Mini games, I've almost done them all. I think, in all honesty, I have to say Barbarian Assault right now. The reason why is because I'm off putting it at the moment. I'm basically up to a point where I can do it. But because I've got to get a team together and I have to grind, it's like on average a 200 hour pet. Yeah. But I'm going to learn. The thing I'm excited for in Barbarian Assault is I'm going to learn. Um, attacker roll and i've watched videos i think I, I think i mentioned before i've been talking for a while but i think i mentioned how they're gonna shave off the last two seconds of the minute barrier but i've been watching attacker roll and it looks friggin' awesome and i really like learning mechanics that deep and when i make mistakes realizing what i did and perfecting it but the whole concept of having to get teams together to go do it kind of puts me off a bit yep other than that let me go to the final one other aerial fishing no problem all pets okay camdozel champion i'm really looking forward to the champions challenge uh, I mean, things like monkey backpacks. i got to get 2,000 laps. It's not exciting, but it's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Random events is fine. Revenants is questionable. I think I'm going to enjoy that because I know how to tank PKers, so I should be fine. Um, Slayer. Slayer. What about Konar? Um, Getting full dusk. Yeah, that's fine. I, I want to get 200 more Slayer as well, so I have a reason to go do that the whole time. I don't know about this Dragonstone rune or something that's here, but... That's just a buyable if you're a main. You just buy a bunch of crystal shards and crystal keys. Oh, okay. uh, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, Evil Chicken obviously is so rare, but it's so passive over time. I don't know. I think I think if I had to answer the question, Barbarian Assault, because I could go so disgustingly dry on yeah. the pet there. It takes ages for me to green that log. Otherwise, on boss-wise, I think Court Beast, because also I kind of can't really justify soloing. And if I want to do it, I can either do it with a team where we free-for-all everything, but I think the time would increase exponentially per person, so I kind of need to be boosted. And then I just have to ask people to boost me, and it's kind of like, you know, I'm only asking them for this because I need them to help me out. So I think that's probably my answer would be Corporeal Beast. Is worries me a bit. Okay, we got two topics here and uh one of them is in the history of runescape what player or content creator did you look up to and why and then the other question was would you ever consider taking a position at jagex i'll answer the second one quickly because i'll forget the first one uh would I ever take a position at jagex i was is when i got uh, accepted to university i was going to apply for what mod ronin actually was doing which is the junior community engagement specialist i was going to apply for that job outside of that no, I would love to go to Jagex for maybe a day, maybe two days and brainstorm some updates. I've got ideas for game modes. I've got ideas for bosses, sailing, loads of ideas where I can throw down the ins and outs of everything and just let them design the mechanics. I just tell them what to do. Again, easier said than done if they can code it. But actually working at Jagex, again, I don't think there's any reason why. I think it would be a downgrade to streaming and YouTube content creation, which I could obviously do simultaneous, but I do lose a chunk of my day. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I don't really think. Uh, I don't think I'd, unless something popped up that was like insane, perfect for me, and maybe they paid really well. But I don't really see that yeah. to be honest. So no, I don't think I'll ever be a Jagex mod. Um, first question was what again? In the history of RuneScape, what player or content creator did you look up to the most, and why? Uh, oh man. There's not really that many. I think I think I'd have to answer Wooks uh, initially. Wooks is again going back to what I said. I think Wooks is the best RuneScape player of all time. Again, I love this game. So the fact that I can play along with at times, like sometimes I'm lucky enough to have him on my team. I've met him in real life, and just knowing that this is the person who I consider the best at the game I play is awesome. I look up to Wooks a lot as well because he's just naturally, he's just you know normal. Like he's just a god at the game. 
His streams are just him playing the game. And I can tell Wooks is also so passionate. Maybe not as much anymore, but I can tell Wooks is so passionate about RuneScape as well. I can't speak on behalf of him, of course, but he is just, you know, I feel like, again, he's played it his whole life. He's got the same thing as me, where if he gets something, he's, he's buzzing. You know, he gets a drop, he's got a smile on his face. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. But no, Wooks taught me, like, everything I know. Just watching him play teaches me or how to improve if he, if, he, if he didn't stream i think i'd be a garbage runescape player like when he streamed his bandos and sarah i went and learned it because i thought it was the coolest thing i'd ever seen and then i learned how to do it and i got my record unofficial records so things like that i definitely put wooks as the absolute number one for me to be honest i don't think there's anyone else that would actually even come close now i think about it yeah i look up to a lot of players that are like my friends but for play style and everything it would probably be wooks yeah, he's a king. I remember there was a point where I feel like he was trying to almost see if he could enjoy just streaming casually instead of just doing it updates. Because I remember he was streaming like Thermy. He was just doing a, a Thermy Slayer task and doing other stuff like that. It would only last like two or three days, I think. And yeah, you could just tell. Wooks is there for the hype. He's not... He He's... He's a bright individual. He doesn't need to stream RuneScape. I, I don't know what he does in real life, but um, I know he's I really he, smart. He's, yeah. He's do something with computers, Cyber I think. Security, maybe? Okay. I'm not too sure. I think he's quite well off, though. I've, yeah. Again, I don't know how much he earns, nor what I ask, but I think he's doing quite well off for himself, where streaming would actually be a downgrade. Plus, yeah. I think he loves his job because he's mm -hmm. very passionate about He's more passionate about coding than RuneScape. I think there is words, so he's mentioned that before in his stream. But no, I actually do like the idea that Wooks only comes back for the big updates. Yep. Not because if he did stream, I'd have no viewers left because it'd all be there. But it still creates that mystery around how Wooks, you know, best player, he's back. And it's just how he logs into the game for the first time in like a year and just bosses everyone. He's just the, instantly, he's just the best again, straight away. I really like that. It builds hype around his stream as well. You'll never see him on low view account with a new update ever. He's always top of the category and it's always well deserved not because obviously of who he is but he also performs so well in any game mode that comes out he's basically ahead of everyone except for like alfie maybe but he's almost always there i think like the previous leagues he's almost always the first person to unlock all of like the sigils or the relics or something like that so he performs fantastically um in the new updates and then obviously the hype of his return combined with him basically being quotation rank one yep. it goes hand in hand i love it yeah he's nailed it kuwaga asks what's the most memorable rave concert experience you've had uh, oh god um see this one I, I didn't have this but this happened recently uh my girlfriend and my friend we're like owner not sorry not owners we're friends with the owner of the person who actually does all the events in manchester it's known as teletac the label and my girlfriend sends me an, a video of her dancing behind rebecca and rebecca in my opinion is one of the absolute best techno djs out there and the fact that she was backstage with rebecca made me incredibly envious i would have been there had i not had my obviously my condition yeah so that was like oh that was bad um i've got one as well though we ended up backstage at one last year at xxl uh, warehouse project and i've never been back i've been warehouse project like 10 20 times in my life and i ended up backstage where all the djs were and i remember when i got there looking around and seeing all these djs i knew the name of and all that and i was like no way am i here and then a techno dj called charlotte dewitt just walked past me i know who she is i don't really listen to her i don't rate her that much she's good but i, I think there's a lot better out there and she just walked past me and obviously I recognized her and I was just there like, is this real right now? I was just like, how am I actually here behind stage of the warehouse project during this event? It was absolutely ridiculous, but there's that one. Other than that, the best events I've ever been to, um, the second time I ever saw Boris Brescia, it was a three hour Boris set and I listened to Boris all day, every day. And I remember IDing six tracks that night because everything else he played was unreleased. And when you see Boris live, most of the time you might know every song he plays and it really kills the hype, in my opinion, because I saw him again next year and it wasn't that good because I knew every song. When you don't know a song and you're at a live concert, I think it's so much better for that one. I think it's a much better time. Uh, but the second time I saw him, I only ID'd six tracks out of a three-hour set because everything else he played was unreleased at the time and it was absolutely incredible. 
Otherwise, um, the first time I saw Kanda was probably the best, one of the best I've been to. I saw Dax J last year, and it was, I think, the fastest passing set ever. I think it was a two-hour Dax J set, and it literally was over in the click of a finger because it was just constant. Like, his style's fantastic. I saw D-Dan at a venue called White Hotel, which is like an aircon venue. That was really good. Similar style, but it was like a, I think I was streaming the next day, and the whole the night was like a, a 10 a.m. finish, and I just left at like 4 or something. Um, any others? No, I don't really know. I remember there was an event called Telly House and it was the first time I saw Rebecca live. She had a three hour set and that was the first time I experienced very heavy techno. And I just remember these bass kicks completely rattling me. Like I've never, never experienced the bass kick that hard. And it was three hours straight of it. So it was ridiculous. Um, but no, I think they're all the ones I can think of. Um, I've seen other, I've seen tons live, but most of those are like the exceptional ones that I can actually remember going to. I'm trying to think if I've missed any. I've seen Clan Coensler a few times, but Clan Coensler, I pronounced his name wrong, but it's like Clan Coensler or something. He doesn't play much of his production. He plays like three of three, four, five of his own tracks in like a 90 minute set. I pray he does a night where he plays only his own tracks and he announces that I would I would literally fly to a different country to witness that set. <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like I uh... I would go to concerts, so I was more into alternative indie music in high school and stuff. And I went to a few different concerts that were, like, all small venues generally. And I actually miss that, but I'm just not into that music anymore. I'm more into, like, trance now. And I've never actually been to a trance, con uh, a trance concert or any sort of set like that. So maybe I'm missing out. Yeah, I, I went to, I've been to only one trance night. And it was a venue that's quite good, Victoria Warehouse in Manchester, for anyone we're trying to pinpoint these very venues I'm talking about. And the main stage was a massive room and you could hear like all the people talking resonating and it was drowning out the melodies of trance, oh. which is some of the important part. Like yeah. I think either I've not witnessed trance properly or I think trance is actually better on headphones personally. Okay. Some music I think is better on headphones than live and I think trance might be one of them. I think I had a bad experience though, so it's not like I'm writing that off permanently. But we went to a different room, there was three rooms, and we saw an artist called, I think it was like David Rush and Shugs or something like that. And it was like heavy hitting trance, and it was so, it's like a techno trance kind of thing. I had to listen to some sets, it's not stream music because it gets a bit weird, but it was so good when we did that. But the idea of going to this event that was headlined by like Ali and Fila, Paul Van Dyke, and Giuseppe Tiviani yeah. and all that. And then we ended up in some side room. It kind of, like, I should be in the main stage, really. Nothing wrong with going to the side room to see an artist, but the fact that the melodies were drowned out in the main room, I just went to one that was having hard-hitting kicks, really. Like, the bass was the main part there. So, Trance, I will see it again, but not in that venue. Really good live, though. Um, I think you have to witness Trance live. I wonder if Trance is better at festivals, though, is the thing. So, I think I have a lot to learn with Trance. I've only ever seen it live once. Yeah, I I would really like to go to one. I I have a few uh, favorite trance artists. I would love to go to a um. I don't actually know which one. I, I don't know. Well, all honestly, any trance concert. I think I, if it was close enough to me, I think I would just go just to experience it because it's just been a year since I've been to a concert. I think I've missed what the experience is all about. But I had a lot of expectations when I went there. That's why I was a bit disappointed. Yeah, so okay, I, I'll, I, I'll lower my hopes. More, but... Well, again, I'm, I'm in a venue that I think I've been to the venue before and the venue is quite good, but I think it isn't good for trance. So I need to experience trance in a venue, more venues. You can't judge music by one venue. You've got to try others. Um, so I'm hoping that when I see trance in different venues, maybe at a festival abroad, I don't know. I have a different opinion because trance is, I always say that trance isn't music. I consider trance to be like artistic. Mm -hmm. Like it's so good. And most trance has like story, even though there's no story, the songs feel like the stories. I, I, that's how I see some music and, trance especially the build-ups as well are just so euphoric i mean euphoric trance is a genre the euphoric the amount of emotion that can just be in in audio if anybody wants a trance track um what is it heaven sure new world order remix incredible in my opinion one of the best trance songs ever made super underground the build-up in that has so much emotion it's fantastic very nice okay i am looking at this topic uh by duck chris and um, he asks, as a veteran creator, you've seen a lot of people leave RuneScape and or Twitch. What do you think about that? I know we've kind of covered that, but his last question is, is there anyone in particular you'd like to see make a comeback? 
Pionero, man. I don't know how many people remember Pionero. Uh, he I was don't. a streamer back in the day. He used to just kill Cal Fight Queen all day and he wore like a tie and all that. <laughs> He just had this dry humor that was, it's like, it's a bit like It's Will. Um, he had this humor where his voice doesn't change tone in any way when he does like a joke or something, and it worked so well. As a fan, no way we'll ever see him again. I don't think he's even on Twitch anymore. Other than that, uh, oh, I can't spoil much, but V the Victim as well is somebody that I, he was uh, very talented. I think uh, I think he was in Japan, I want to say. I can't fully remember. I think he was like te teaching Japanese or something like that. I can't speak again, so he's not here to correct me. But um, he's someone I wouldn't mind seeing back. But at this point, again, there's so many content creators out there right now that I still watch. The And I, I apologize if anyone's watching this and they think that I might say their name because you've disappeared. It's really hard for me to see who's actually disappeared compared to who's actually still here because there are so many streamers now that I find it hard choosing who I actually want to watch. I can't really think of anybody off the top of my head, to be honest, at this moment in time. But I'd say V the Victim's one for sure. Uh, good streamer and then Pioneer is obviously one of my ones I used to like back in the day but there's so many streamers now I, it's going to make me very upset the day a streamer now kind of steps away from streaming who I'm really good friends with um, yeah because of whatever the like higher reasons or whatever they get busy or whatnot I, I mean I could say it's not exactly an answer but I think Exact is about to leave I think he's quitting the game in a year from now that would probably be my answer because again great to watch I don't think I could say Wooks either because Wooks is obviously part time and he will be back when a good update comes out. Mm -hmm. So that's where that stands, I think. Yeah, I think there's so many creators now that it's hard to see who's actually disappeared these days. I miss Say Allo. I miss his streams. He, uh. Oh, he's the Iron Man, wasn't he? Yep. I, I, I remember when I was going down my subscriptions and I was unsubscribing from people that were like inactive just so I could have more budget basically to suit to more people. And I remember seeing Sayalo's name and I was like, oh shit, I've unsubscribed to him from now. I'm very sorry to say that, but I was subbed to like 40 people who just didn't stream anymore yeah. <laughs> or were not RuneScape streamers. And I was like, right, get rid of all these and now I can sub to like 40 more RuneScape streamers who are active these days. Yeah. Now nah, he was amazing. And uh, he, this is a very unknown streamer, Iron Man Flynn. That dude was just so... Oh, he he's is the ultimate Iron Man? No, 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 no. There was um Dog Goat and um okay, Win, yeah, he's the guy. Or um Lowlander, Lowlander streams. Early hardcore Iron Man. I miss Lowlander streams. Oh my god, they were just uh -huh. they were all over the place. It was awesome. But uh, Iron Man Flynn as well. Just he was um an Iron Man pet hunter, and I just remember he was so oblivious. He was hunting wilderness pets and just so damn oblivious to like everything in the wilderness it was so funny and he would do this little magic trick i still to this day don't know how he did it but he would always wear the same shirt and what he would do is he had this little scene that he would do and i think it was like a pre-recording or something like that he would he would turn his chair around take off his shirt you could see his bare shoulders and then all of a sudden he would like kind of slouch down and turn around and his shirt was back on it was so weird i don't know how he did it but it was just like there's a little channel point redemption he would do. Anyway, I miss that guy. Hardly anybody knows, but if you guys do, those listening, I recognize him. the name. Iron Man Flynn. Why am I thinking he changed his Twitch name? I just got stuck in my head right now. Really <sighs> recognize the name, but I can't pull it if he's not the ultimate Iron Man. But I think I'm getting mixed up with Dog Out there. Yeah. There's also uh, Sig as well. Sig was great at the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of... I remember Thurko, who would stream pretty consistently, unfortunately, you know. But he's actually killing it. Wait, he's been selling Pokemon cards on eBay and stuff, and he's actually thriving big time. He's posted some progress pictures of that. It's awesome to see, so... Yeah, I've not really caught that. I wouldn't really be too interested in tracking it, but no, Thurko, again, is I've met him a few times. Really good person to chat to, good person, so I'm really, ha mm -hmm. really happy to hear his name well. I am still subscribed to Thurko. I'm only sub to him for one reason, though, and that's to get free song requests in Jace's chance. So <laughs> I have to use a Thirko ah, emo, and then I'll get a free song. Hell yeah. By the way, hey, Jace just absolutely loves that you're a main doing completionist stuff. He loves it. I mean, I I watch his streams, and he's doing completionist as well, but the way he does it is he, he's ranked two in the game, yep. and he's behind Link's Titan, and no one was going to beat Link's Titan, so technically he's the rank one. Yeah. You know, you could... He's like two, but behind Link's Titan, it doesn't matter. But again, with the fact that he's doing the collection log, I don't know, again, I don't think anyone will complete the game. The only way you can complete the game is by getting spooned something that's so astronomically rare that 
it's not going to happen. Basically, somehow pulling all the individual third days from Master Clues, it's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, but no, I think Jace will, because again, they're going to always bring out new stuff as well to go beat, like Guardians of the Rift. Raids 3, when Raids 3 comes out, I really hope it's streaming. I'm going to just green the log straight away, you know. The hype of Raids 3 will be there, the viewer count will be up. I'm just going to straight in, day one, boom, let's green the log in one massive bat. Unless I don't enjoy it, then I'm screwed. But bash the whole thing out in one go. Hopefully make some bank as well, because prices will be high. Oh, yeah. It's like if I, if I, if I smash Theater of Blood when it came out for a month, I reckon you'd make so much money you could oh, buy all yeah. the Theater of Blood. So maybe this will do the same. Oh, the Scythes were like four billion. <laughs> and I got yeah. one Theater of Blood pulled that is great. Yeah. But no, uh, I've really, it's again like, I didn't play RuneScape for a month while recovering and uh, I didn't have a hardcore at the time. I wasn't even playing RuneScape actively. The league was still active, but I was playing variety games because there's nothing I wanted to do on RuneScape. And again, my passion for this game is I refuse to, I don't want to log into RuneScape to find something to do to stream it in a way because I know I'm not enjoying the game and I don't want to play RuneScape and not enjoy it at the same time simultaneously. I really don't want that. And then it just sparked. I wanted to log in on my main and train Slayer. And then suddenly I'm like, hey, maybe I'll do the collection log stuff. And then I just got addicted to it. And I've been booming through it and there's so much for me still to do. And there's things like the Champions Challenge and basically all the pet hunts as well. So all the bosses, so much for me to do. So I look at it as like where my hardcore Iron Man is late game but i can't lose the status i can it's it's permanent i'm always progressing towards things so mm-hmm. it's for the longevity of streaming as well this is something i'm really happy that just sparked my interest because i don't think i'll burn out i could burn out from an individual thing but there's probably like 30 other things i can just go and do if i want to so i just wake up and do whatever i want to yeah it's a it's a good feeling not ha- i mean again like you say there's a benefit to being a hardcore the excitement and the rush and everything but knowing that there's nothing you can't lose your account is a really good feeling it's like okay it's all progression that's where i stand now yeah i can disconnect as much as i want i can die at bosses if i miss player mm-hmm. and i don't have to disappear or recreate an account so everything should i'd like to think that my quotation career has been very rocky for the past three maybe four years I always had a massive boom when Aussie went to the theatre because it was right with the first lockdowns of COVID-19. But I think my career has been pretty, quotation marks, pretty rocky for the past three years. And I think I've finally found something that will manage to keep it going in a very linear progression where basically if the career dies off, it's because people just lose interest in as a career. At that point, I'll make a new hardcore. We're all good. You know, I've got the back up there. Yep. Yeah, and there's always those snowflake accounts. Who knows? Maybe somebody will just come out with a crazy brilliant idea that nobody's thought of that everyone jumps on the bandwagon. And there's also the potential for new modes all the time. So, okay. I mean, it makes me wonder, like, people creating all these new game modes. Obviously, it's content creation and unique. It really it makes me wonder who's playing RuneScape <laughs> one tile at a time or, like, one chunk at a time without being a content creator. Like, I feel like it's the unique point of being a creator that that's why they're doing it. It may be interesting to know how many people are actually committing to those modes. I know, I know for a fact though, there's a lot of Mauritania only ultimates that were created uh, that don't make videos when Settled was doing his, of course. Mm-hmm. But if people are bored of the game and want something to do, it's obviously a bit hard to say, but just play the game as a main. <laughs> You've got access to everything in the game. I guess if there's absolutely nothing for you to do and you're not interested in like speed runs or complete combat task achievements or any of that stuff then fair enough i always say you should never force yourself to play a game you don't want to play yeah. it's mainly why i didn't play runescape during my inactivity back in like december after my hardcore died there was nothing i wanted to do on the game and now i want to do collection logs so as far as i'm aware i've wrote myself the next five years of content minimum no burnouts no nothing so i should be able to just have some good times Hell yeah. Okay, I have two uh, topics um, at the end of the cast, but those will be right after, I guess, we talk about this because um, I guess there are some specific questions about the TSW. So, George... I'll try and answer everything I can. Sorry? I'll try and answer everything I can about this. Try to bring awareness because people don't know. I didn't know it existed. And I look back at how I got it. And I I, I technically self, I, I self-inflicted onto myself at the same time as just not being given the advice. Had I known this existed, I would have never got it. And it's that education about how to get it that I think if everyone knew it, people wouldn't get it. Yeah, that I, I mean, it looks terrifying. And the fact that you didn't even know it was a thing is also terrifying. So... George, at, he at, he just asks if he doesn't mind, how did his TSW begin? Which steroid cream was he using? And where was his skin condition before? 
Cheers. Uh, so the steroid cream I was using, I was initially using hydrocortisone and uh, sorry, hydrocortisone and Umavate. Uh, hydrocortisone is a cream, Umavate is an ointment. You can buy them over the counter anywhere in the UK. I don't know about America or any of that. Um, I've used those my whole life and I don't think I've ever had TSW from them. So if I have a, if people here are actually using those creams, I would like to safely say if you use them in the moderation, which is twice a day, very thinly for a week, you should be fine. Take that with a grain of salt though to if it's worth the risk of getting TSW. And I'll be honest, nothing is worth that risk. I'm not a doctor, but my doctors gave me advice that gave me TSW. This is the only time I will say that a doctor's opinion might not be the best one. Normally, I would never go against what a doctor says or a dentist or anything. They've studied it their whole life. They know more than me. This is the only time I think. I actually honestly think I'm more educated than most doctors on TSW from how much research I did while I was recovering. There's nothing for me to do except read about things and answer questions. And there's a community out there that have gone through it and you can get the answers there. So, but I used those two. However, then I got a rash and I got a prescribed one called Betnovate. And the Betnovate is what ruined me because I had skin rashes that appeared. Normally I got them on my inner elbows. Uh, they can go, come and go as they please. Inner elbows, if they get bad, I used hydrocortisone twice a day thinly for a week. Never really got TSW. Then I got rashes on this my side and where else were they? I, I can't remember. I know that I had them the side and underneath like the pectoral muscles. I got prescribed Betnovate for that and I applied the Betnovate, which is a higher potent steroid. And my body immediately got addicted to that because I went through the course of, I think again, twice a day for a week. But because the surface areas I was covering had changed from my inner elbows, which is obviously minor surface area, to my sides and under the pectorals and still in the other elbows, the amount of steroid cream I now applied was like five times more than the hydrocortisone, just in different parts of the body because of the total surface area. And the Betnovate was way stronger. It's a much more potent steroid. So what happened is I went through the prescribed prescription there and it cured it. it it went away but then when you've got it it will come back and what you do is you start using the steroid cream again and when you're doing this what's basically happening is your body is addicted to the steroid on a very minor level it brings the rash back because it's like oh if i bring this rash back he'll apply steroid cream here and then you apply the steroid cream and it might go away again and you basically go through that process, but then eventually you don't have any steroid cream left and you've used loads of it now. And obviously the more you're doing, the more addicted your body is getting at this point. Uh, so that was the Betnovate. What really made everything go wrong was when I went to a dermatologist. And at this point, my body was, it was bad. And if you knew what TSW was as a dermatologist, which you should, you would have known straight away I had it. Yeah, I got prescribed prednisolone on 50 milligram dosage. Prednisolone is a steroid tablet and I was on 50 milligrams a day. The thing with a steroid tablet is it goes into the bloodstream or something. So now I have steroids applied everywhere over my body rather than the creams in certain isolated positions. I've got images of my skin extremely flared. TSW um, sort of, oh, what's the word like? You can recognize it to be TSW from the areas I applied the steroid cream. When I, I've also got pictures of when I took the prednisolone, how it cured everything and it went away. And then it all came back. The same flare that I had in these isolated areas everywhere because that's what the prednisolone Jesus. did to me. That completely, that's that was the game over. This was like middle of January when this happened. And this is where things got really brutal for me. I somehow went to a rave with all of this. Apparently I was scratching so much and didn't even know I was doing it or something. So Jesus. Betnovate is the cream I used. Uh, I would never touch, I will never touch a steroid cream ever again in my life. Eczema, I think is a chronic condition, but it can be caused by something which you can work out through like elimination diets and stuff. I will work out what causes my eczema and I will cure it completely naturally to the best of my ability. Or I will live with it because my eczema, compared to what the TSW was, the difference is TSW is a million times worse. Eczema is nothing compared. It was just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, when How did it begin? It would have begun in... 
August, about September, I think. September is when I got prescribed the Betnovate. So I'm going to say it began there. It got bad in November when I finished the Betnovate tube on the prescriptions of the doctors and they prescribed me more Betnovate. And I used that. Well, heart, I've got, I used a quarter of that one. I've still got the tube there. And then I went to a dermatologist who gave me the um, prednisolone and a Betnovate. And that's when in the middle of January, I realized I'm only getting, I have pictures on my phone. This is the weird thing. This is why I can truly prove it's a real thing. It's not recognized as an actual medical concern. I've got pictures on my phone of me using steroid creams and tablets month by month or week by week. My skin gets better and then it gets astronomically worse. And I've got pictures of my recovery where I use nothing, where my skin is destroyed and it gets better throughout it. So my skin was getting worse through using steroid creams. And I've got the pictures on my phone that prove that. So it's like if I was educated to what it was, I could have gone through TSW on a way more mild scale. It's the prednisolone that completely put me through a horrible journey. And it's terrifying because this was like half a year of steroids being quotation abused, let's say, because of what I was being prescribed. There are people that use steroids their entire life and then they have to get off it and their body must be so addicted and they go through something that I can't even imagine through what I went through, just astronomically worse, really bad. There's nowhere that educates you that this is TSW, you know, it doesn't say or whatever. It's like if, if I was, I would like it if I was to do whatever is, you know, when you buy like cigarettes I don't know if you smoke, I don't smoke, but nope. you, they have the pictures of like lungs on them and they look disgusting. Yeah. If they had like images of TSW on packets of steroid cream saying this is what can happen if you use this Jeez. or abuse this, let's say, yeah. it educates you and it allows you to know. Most people, I think, that get TSW will get it and then find out what it was afterwards and then realize how to avoid it. They can't do it anymore. They have to go back. For me, if I knew it existed, I would never touch steroid creams in my life or tablets ever in my life. I would have just declined them all uh, on the spot. But obviously, I didn't have the education. I had to find out the hard way. Damn. And it's just really unknown, apparently. Like, a lot of people just don't know about it. Why is that the I didn't case? Know about it. Is it very oh, rare to happen? Know. Or is it just... Not I well think studied. it's rare. Well, it can happen to anybody um, because it comes down to just strong steroids. And again, I think I think as a, a person, I, I think my brain, I have a very, very, very addictive personality. So maybe I'm more prone to getting it. It's just, again, the thing that upsets me slightly is the fact that there's no education to it. You don't know it exists until you get it. I didn't know it was TSW until I'd done the research. So you're being prescribed by a doctor who might know what it is all these steroids but they don't tell you what can happen and then you get there and what happens is basically my skin's destroyed i get prescribed more steroids feeding the addiction jesus and then it just gets worse and worse and i realized that and i realized it was tsw so i was like right how do i deal with this i can go on immunosuppressants and start these cycles for the rest of my life to maintain it or do something like do present or something or I can go through something called no moisture therapy which is what most people do to get out of it which is a permanent recovery and I chose that one and it is hell on earth, but it's permanent. And as of right now, I'm like 95% recovered permanently. Like I, I might have eczema for the rest of my life. I might have certain chronic things for the rest of my life, but I'm out of that TSW stage. I don't think my body's addicted to steroids anymore at this point. I just have skin rashes and still broken skin to heal. Damn. So you've been healing for months. How long until like you feel like you're totally back to like normal and your skin's fully healed? Do you have any time uh, frame of that? Fully healed, probably over a year, but I'd say 99% healed, possibly in a month. Um, That's good. I'm going to try and go to a rave on the 2nd of June, depending how I feel on the day. Um, mm -hmm. It's an outside one. So I'm going to test how my body reacts to sweat, which is two more weeks of recovery there. I don't know why my body reacts to sweat the way it does. It's not something that most TSW people have had. It's a unique irritation that I've got. So if I can do that and not be in too much discomfort, uh, I'm going to go on holiday. And before that as well, I'll be testing sunlight on myself. If I can do a rave, then I can do a stream because my streams are mainly the fact that I can't sweat. And if I can go to a rave and sweat, I can definitely stream. Like even now I've sat down with you for like four or five hours. I have my room air con down ridiculously. My back door is open and my body temperature has been fine. There was one point before where I was a bit uncomfortable, but it was very, very briefly. And I think it was right before I went to the toilet. So it kind of went away. But I just don't want to turn my stream on and be like, guys, I can stream again. And then I'm not recovered. Uh, there's a comment I read by a viewer, which is return not, it's like when return 
I think it's like when you want to or when you're ready. I can't remember. So at the moment, I'm could probably stream now, but it wouldn't be a guarantee. I might have to end. Yeah. I think in two weeks, if I can do this rave, I can stream. So my plan is to go on a holiday to get some of the sun, see what happens in the sunlight and holiday, which is really good for the skin. So it might be that final push to normality. Plus I'll sweat a bit, which would be good to test. And then when I come back on, like I said, I'd like to think I can be streaming again. 10th of June, 99% recovered. Absolutely no health problems at all. Might not be able to go to the gym yet, but I think I can stream before the gym. I think in order, it should be technically streaming, then probably gym, then raves. But I'm going to do the rave and test it because it's outside. Yeah. Well, I... Sheesh. I wish you all the best. I know you're planning on coming back to streaming June 10th, I think you said. And yeah, hopefully if everything goes not- well, yeah. It's not set in stone. I'm not building an event saying, hey, guys, I'm live June 10th. Everyone be there. It's going to be a pie. There's no publicity stunt in this recovery. It is I've been ill as shit. Yeah. I physically cannot stream. Now I can stream again. Let's go, you know. But I'd like to put down June 10th as the rough day because if I go to the rave on the 2nd, it'll be the 3rd the next day. Let's say we go on holiday on the 4th. I get back on the 8th. I am prepare myself to stream on the 10th or the 11th or something around then. It's just a rough day. It might not be June 10th on the dot. But if I can make that day, I'd like to. Very cool. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else to cover, I want to ask you for three shout-outs, but three people that haven't been talked about yet so it doesn't have to be the top three of course it could just be three people you think deserve a shout out people in the osr's community uh any reason for this or just three names just three names and why just i don't know a little little reason why maybe that like somebody that's i don't know maybe underappreciated potentially um is i know this is spontaneous it can be somebody that you've already somewhat mentioned, but I was thinking of like, well, no, you know, what? I'll let, I'll let you choose the names. If it's somebody that was already mentioned, that's fine. This is spontaneous for those listening. He has not been asked this until right now. Oh, I'll fire two and one here then. So I'll do a shout out to uh, Verf and Limpware. They're both working on chunk accounts. If there's any chunk account out there that I don't know about, I would love to know. I think I'm watching Edgeville Chunk as well, but I cannot remember his name and it's annoying me. Uh, but I love watching the chunk accounts. For those that don't know, Limpwa is doing a chunk account that's the most insane one ever. I'm not taking anything away from Verf. Verf can match his insanity. He basically just killed the Cal Fight Queen. And this is a spoiler. So if you don't want to spoil it, just mute. I'll do it in 15 seconds. <laughs> he basically kills the Cal Fight Queen with a rune two handed sword 2,408 times to complete the collection log to roll the next chunk. And I think that dedication is absolutely ridiculous. He achieved that. I remember saying on stream that I kind of didn't want to see him do it just in case it took too long, but he did get the items and he stuck to it. It's ridiculous. So that's a shout out there. Verf as well. Chunk accounts, I'm really enjoying them, but I think his series is fantastic and you can definitely binge watch it from episode one. Oh, really yeah. looking forward to where they are in a year from now. Probably my most anticipated series to see. Uh, I'm going to do a shout out to Tasty as well. I love Tasty. I'm a big fan. I think he's genuinely a fantastic entertainer. And if someone was to say, who would I want to see at the top of the RuneScape community? I think Tasty would be someone who would genuinely take care of everyone really well. He supports other streamers, smaller streamers. He's always in chats talking. Good sense of humor. So I want to do a shout out to him. Brilliant streamer as well. I really hope he has the most success in the world with his channel. Final shout out is... Can I think of someone randomly? I don't know. I'm going to do a final shout out to Soup. So I'm currently recording Galino Games Season 3. And I want to say that Soup is obviously someone who's been doing YouTube for over 10 years now. He's known for his quest guides. Most people will say Soup and they'll giggle about him. And he'll be there known for his trash quest guides. I really hope people can start looking past those quest guides he made like eight years ago (laughs) and look at the content he creates now. His content that he creates now is brilliant. He won a golden gnome last year for it, which is incredibly well-deserved. I'd love to see Framed win a gnome. I think Framed definitely deserves to win one. But Soup's patience, coordination, and pure production of the Galeno games behind the scenes is absolutely second to none none of you see it i do because i am there for the episodes until i get knocked out and it's absolutely brilliant he has time for everyone he caters to everyone and it is completely it's honestly like 
completely ridiculous um, how much time, effort, and all that he puts into the series. And I think the Golden Nomi one last year was so well deserved. I'm so happy to see it. I want to do a shout out to him. I also want to do a shout out to Mod Matt K quickly. Mod Matt K, sorry, ex Mod Matt K. I mention this a lot when it comes down to community managers. I don't think there is a community manager on the planet that could match, sorry, beat Mod Matt K's hospitality to viewers. They could match it at best. It was completely flawless. He took care of his creators so well. And it's one of those that when he leaves the company, you truly realize what you've actually lost with him. So I want to shout out to Mod Matt K as well. Very cool. Ex Mod Matt K. Yeah. Oh, just wonderful. Tasty. Yeah. He's uh he's already one of the one of the giants on the platform, it already seems. But yeah, he's just gonna continue to grow. And soup, yeah, his Gilinor games is just incredible. I never actually really watched his quest guides. I've just followed along with the memes that his quest guides are bad. I never actually watched any though. Yeah, I, I never watch quest guides. <laughs> I I use text yeah. guides normally, like Same. the HQ, because I would, I'd read the next step as I'm doing the step before, yeah. and I keep doing that to do the quest quick rather than pausing and playing a video over yeah. and over again. Same. Okay, my last question. It's pretty broad, but where do you see yourself in five years from now? Or where would you like to be in five years from now? Where do I like to be in five years? Exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, I live my life in a way where before I had my illness and my hardcore wasn't dead, I was in a stage where I, I find I found happiness in the present. You know, I, I don't I don't work towards anything specifically that makes me happy or happier than I already am. So I was at a point where I kind of like self, had some self therapy with myself really. And I asked myself the question, if I died right now, would I die happy? This is back before, not in game, this is in real life. I was like, yes, I would obviously minus the fact that obviously people grieve for me. I would have died completely happy at 27. I was so happy and content in the present. I wasn't working towards anything or anything. I do everything I want right now where I can, which again is blessed because the RuneScape community have kind of allowed me to on a financial sitch on side and whatnot. Um, obviously my hardcore died and that changed the position because i started playing variety games and it obviously changed that i wasn't too happy doing the variety games i prefer runescape now that i've refound my collection log in a month from now if i can get myself to streaming collection log going to the gym for my fitness going to restaurants every now and then and going to my techno raves if i fast forwarded my life five years and i was doing the exact same thing i'd be very happy with that i'd be 32 years old and i'd be very content doing this for the next five years that's beautiful that's fucking awesome i'm glad you've had that realization just to live in the present and just to realize how beautiful life can be just not trying to plan out so far ahead but just embracing what you have now it's just that i ask myself what makes me happy you know like some people for me like a way i kind of live my life is i live like around the five senses so obviously like touch taste and all that stuff mm -hmm. so when it comes to like sight i'm not one that minds about sightseeing much like if i was in the presence of some awesome mountains or something it's great to look at but that's one of my lowest priorities is probably traveling the world in all honesty i'd like to travel east at some point but i don't know when i've took a long break from streaming with this recovery it would be a couple of years yet so I just want to go to Australia before I'm 30 at this point for travel, but sight's not one that I mind. But when it comes down to like touch and all that stuff, like I love um, restaurants, taste. Uh, I, as long as I can do restaurants, techno raves and techno music would be my, my hearing. I've got all that in the present and I ask myself what makes me happy and what makes me happy is literally streaming RuneScape. That is my job that gives me the money to go to restaurants and to go to the techno raves. And as long as I just keep, and theme parks as well, I like those, but as long as I can do that and cycle it around, I'm happy in the present and I'm moving away from my materialism. There's always something that I look at. I'm like, yeah, I want that. And it'll make me a bit happier to get it. But overall, you could remove so much from my life and it really wouldn't bother me as long as I still have those things I mentioned before, which is unfortunate because obviously my TSW recovery removed all of those from my life at that point. And that's when I think going back to the start of the podcast, I have to look at what else do I have you know what do I have in my life and that's when you see other things like what I actually have and I don't take anything for life for granted beautifully said Bodie it was an absolute pleasure having you on I've uh thoroughly enjoyed just being in your presence uh, I, I know we're not in the same room but uh one day we'll have a studio and who knows maybe if the if everything goes well with the Sebae cast I'll fly you out or something like that I'll pay for it. You going to uh, any Twitch events or anything? TwitchCon Amsterdam, San Diego. I think I'm I'm debating going to TwitchCon San Diego. I think that would be a. I would not go to Amsterdam. I really want to go to a RuneFest. That's the thing I'm looking forward to most. TwitchCon's kind of I've never been to one, but they seem overwhelming, and it seems like 
I just don't know everybody there. Not even close, you know? So. I mean, TwitchCon, the RuneScape community kind of has their own little RuneFest at TwitchCon. Normally in the outside areas, it's mm. super cool. If you don't know everyone, you normally meet everyone. It's where I like to go to events. Like the way the way I kind of run my Twitter is I try to follow. I follow back as many content creators as I can, but I'm definitely not following them all. It's not because I'm too good for them or anything, but a lot of people I follow on Twitter is when I meet them in person. I can, I like to I, I use Twitter. I don't follow celebrities on any pr uh, platform. I follow my friends only that I meet. It allows me to keep myself updated with everything that's going on in my friends' lives. So Twitter is where I normally follow people. You go to something like TwitchCon, you will meet the RuneScape community and you'll meet everybody. It just depends whose names you recognize, really. Yeah. Now, I would really love to because seriously, I felt, I've felt sort of isolated, you know, and it feels like because of COVID and everything like that, it's just like, I need to go out and meet these people that I've just been watching for years. So it's, TwitchCon uh, is a brilliant one for that then, particularly if you partnered on Twitch, which I'm pretty sure you are. Yeah. Um, RuneFest, RuneFest, there was a rumor that it won't be coming back. Apparently that's been debunked really? now and it confirmed it will be returning. Probably not this year, but maybe we'll get a RuneFest in 23. RuneFest is definitely the event to go to though. Um, I mean, in all honesty, RuneFest, it's you meet everyone and all that, but I think TwitchCon might be the better event possibly. It's hard to say. I love RuneFest, but I'm in the UK, so it's so easy for me to yeah, go to. Yeah, doesn't feel as... I feel like... Yeah. TwitchCon maybe just feels a bit more relaxed because I sometimes do stage work at RuneFest. Mm. Um, or I, I don't know. They're both great events, but RuneFest, TwitchCon, any of them. If you go to TwitchCon San Diego, though, you'll meet me there, so I'm going. Hell yeah. Well, I'll consider it. Um, anyway, guys, I know you're all, you all are already following Bodhi on all his stuff, but I'll still have it down in the description, so follow him on Twitch, YouTube, and on Twitter. I'll have all those three linked. And um, if you guys want to support the podcast, there's a link down below for $2 a month as a pledge. You can support the Sebe cast and get your name on the title screen. But that's it for me. Bodie, thank you very, very much. It was an absolute pleasure having you on. Yeah, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I've never done a podcast. I don't really watch podcasts at all. Gone into this blind. Um, again, I can't stream, so this is the longest I've been talking for a while. But it's been really good because, again, I can gauge my health right now that I've been kind of fine just sat here for hours talking it really makes me feel like i can stream sooner rather than later like i'm getting back to that normality so thank you very much for having me i hope everyone's enjoyed the podcast as well so make sure you support the channel two dollars a month down below or just drop a like like is free comment is free everything helps thank you very much Vody. we'll catch you guys in you the welcome. next one take it easy bye i can't eat just a 76 did you just say 73, I'll risk it for you. <laughs> I quit at RuneScape. I quit at RuneScape. You little ginger prick. <laughs>